Welcome to DOTUS 2024. My name is Doug Casa. I am the CIO of the Defense Intelligence Agency and happy to host everyone this morning and this week in Omaha, Nebraska. So last year, just to start to give you a little bit of an intro, we started with walk-on music. Um, just because if you've been here in the past, we had instrumental classical music and a lot of people made fun of us for that. So we switched it up last year. Um, what you'll find is, is that my selection is relevant to hosting this in Omaha. So 311 is actually from Omaha, Nebraska. Started in 1985, one of the best 90s bands in my opinion. Um, but I think from here on out, as you hear the walk-on music, you'll find very little relevance to anything dealing with this conference. <laughs> but how many of you were at the, the uh, social last night, the registration mixer? Yeah, so quite a few people. Um, I was shocked at the number of individuals who came up to me and asked me, why are we hosting this in Oklahoma? Uh, just so you guys know, I, I don't want you to embarrass us because we have a number of generals coming, a number of congressional members. We're in Omaha, not Oklahoma. But the reason is, is because there is a ton of innovation that happens in Omaha. So many of you may not know, uh, the Reuben sandwich was invented in Omaha. So if you haven't been out to eat yet, I would highly recommend that. We did that last night. Uh, also, the frozen pizza, uh, TV dinners, all invented in Omaha, vice grips as well. And at that point, when I, when I was talking with many of you last night, you said, oh yeah, and the tater tots. Nope, the tater tots, that was last year in Portland. Tater tots has nothing to do with why you're here today. But when it comes to innovation, Omaha is actually known as the Silicon Prairie. So a ton of IT innovation, and not just within the DOD, also within the medical community. So telemedicine originated in Omaha, online banking, uh, online platforms for trading. The ATM was actually uh, developed within Omaha. And then as we get into online educational platforms, a lot of that actually originated right where you are today. But if you remember last year when I spoke, what I mentioned was is that the biggest innovations of our country's history, of the world's history, have come in a period of conflict and crises. And that's the case for Omaha as well. So during World War II, a lot of innovation came out of this location, specifically off at Air Force Base, which housed the B-29 bombers uh, and also ammunition factories and a number of other innovations that came out, which was really the, the start of modern computing, uh, which World War II was really the genesis of. But a lot of you may not also realize that uh, Omaha was also one of the pioneers of introducing women into the workforce, which is a little bit of a preview for one of the breakout sessions that we'll have today. We had that last year, and it was one of the, the more widely attended ones. But if you heard of Rosie the Riveter, that actually originated from here, um, off at Air Force Base, and then ultimately uh, our support during World War II, as men were drafted into the war, more women entered the workforce and took over in ammunitions production and factory work, and that's how Rosie the Riveter came to be. So a lot of history comes out of where we are hosting this conference today. This was the first conference, notice conference that I attended back in 2018, uh, and so now nearly seven years later, uh, I'm so happy to be back here because it's one of my favorite locations. But going back to the relevance of why we are here in Omaha, as I mentioned, crises and conflict really are the genesis for innovation. And if you think about where we have been, especially over the course of the past year, that continues to be the case. It is no surprise to any of us that since the beginning of time, countries use technology to advance and protect their ideals and values. And in fact, as Xi Jinping said, technology is the sharp weapon of the modern state. So while technology does present a lot of opportunities and innovation because it makes us more competitive than we otherwise would have been, it also presents its own risks, especially today. Whereas in the past, technology had long lead times for development. Today, technology is developed at a rapid pace. A lot of it is put out as a prototype, white papers that are released out into the public. And whereas in the previous past, technology had a single purpose, right? So think about maybe like the development of a, a knife, right? There's, you had a, a purpose of cutting. Today, technology can have one to many purposes. And especially as we see more autonomy, autonomous capabilities, especially within AI, that presents additional risk. Think about what that means to the stability of the world. And you've seen the impact of the internet on Arab Spring and how that led to a balance or a disbalance of power, uh, particularly in, in regions across the entire world. So with that, 
it really has changed the nature, uh, especially of my job as the chief information officer. And I think every CIO here and any technologist at this conference would tell you that their role has changed over the past decade. For one, as I mentioned, technology cycles have really cut back. So things are developed within hours and days as opposed to months and years. That is especially true within data. We are developing more systems today than ever before that are putting data out into the public. And the question and the struggle that we all have is differentiating what is real from what is fake. Just a bit of trivia, 90% of the engineers developing systems are alive today in history. 90% of engineers are out there. Uh, so we are at an, in a point of innovation within the world that we've never seen before. The second, in terms, of, in terms of what's changing in our lives, is the governance of data and technology. As I mentioned, things are going out there rapidly, and the intent of how those are used is changing. For us within DIA, that leads to a number of priorities, mainly our capability delivery pipeline of how do we make sure that we're not only building the right thing, but building it the right way. And then as we continue up the stack, networking is also a major role of DIA and how we get applications and data to users. For us, that's JWIX, the Joint Worldwide Intelligence Communication System. So we are the executive agent for that in the IC, but it is not DIA alone providing wire area networks. It's also making sure that we collaborate across the entire IC and DOD and with our federal partners to add resiliency uh, and how we provide connectivity. It's also DOTUS modernization. When I say DOTUS modernization, I'm not referring to this conference, but it is the desktop environment that we provide, our common operating environment. That is also a partnership with NGA that we had developed years ago and is growing because of the need for access to intelligence and data and the applications to make sense of that intelligence. And as we think about that and what it means to ensure the integrity of everything that we're doing, we also get into the, the structure of what we need to put in place, which is the security of that data. And that is where we have our zero trust strategy. And what has changed is where we have previously in the past viewed zero trust as a bound, or cybersecurity as a boundary defense. That is no longer the case. It is inherent in everything that we do through zero trust. And it's ensuring the right people and the right machines have access to the right information and no more than what they should have access to. And so integrating our data strategy with cybersecurity has been a big change over the past couple of years, especially today. I and mean, that is not something that we can do alone. That is, that is a strategy that we do across the entire IC and DOD. When I started in this community over 20 years, IT was very different. So I had worked uh, in NGA. In fact, some of the individuals I worked with are here today. It's, this is kind of a homecoming of sorts. But back then, if you were a technologist, you were the database guy, you were the visualization guy, you did everything from end to end. And there was no cybersecurity. You owned everything within your, your little system and no one touched it. Today, that's not true. Systems are more interconnected than ever before. And that's why the nature of what we do as CIOs and technologists is changing. I encourage you to view all of the breakout sessions, attend as many as you can. We handpick all of those in the context of our priorities that we have not just for DIA, but for all the DOD and IC elements that are here today. You'll see a number of panels with IC and DOD CIOs. You'll see panels with J2s and other intelligence professionals. You'll see panels with our foreign partners, especially the 5i partners. All of the breakout sessions that we curated today are in the context of those priorities. So we very much encourage you to attend. Before we get things kicked off, I want to make a few introductions. First, our MCs. Uh, we have Captain Amanda Whitley, and we have Chief uh, Kyle Peterson. So two of them volunteered. One, this is one of them, this is their dream come true. The other was voluntold, but graciously gave up their time. See if you can figure out which one is which as we go throughout the day. But with that, I want to introduce our chief of staff, Mr. John Kirchhofer, to the stage. John uh, has been our chief of staff for over three years now. He has spent a long career in the IC and DOD on the operations side, but also served as our chief financial officer, the chief of mission, mission services, um, and now, as I mentioned, the chief of staff in our agency. So again, welcome to the conference. Look forward to meeting many of you and exchanging new ideas. And I welcome Mr. Kutruffer to the stage. We commence to make you jump, jump. Come back to head and make you jump, jump. Our daddy needs to make you jump, jump. Rich Cross will make you jump, jump. Don't try to compare us to you. A bad little fat on the Mac and I'm bad. All right, good morning. 
So there really, really is relevance to, to the walk-on music. So that, that song, believe it or not, is 34 years old. Uh, I started in government 34 years ago. Uh, my first job was typing intelligence information reports on a typewriter, feeding them into an optical character reader, and then submitting them for record message traffic, which of course came in hard copy this, this tall at the beginning of every day. Uh, so when I think uh, over my career where we are today, and this, this cusp of innovation that we're on and how life-changing it's gonna be for everyone in the intelligence profession, uh, it's really rewarding and, and it was absolutely worth the journey. Um, welcome, it, it is really my honor uh, to welcome you to DOTUS Worldwide 2024. Uh, on behalf of US Air Force Lieutenant General Jeff Cruz, the Director of DIA, uh, and Christine Bourdain, our Deputy, uh, it really is my honor to welcome you here. You know, we've had the honor of hosting this event for over two decades, and each time we're astonished by the new ideas it yields. It really brings together the brightest minds of the Department of Defense, the intelligence community, and all of our partners. This is the first DOTUS conference run under Director Cruz. Even though we have a new director, many of our priorities remain the same. Over a decade ago, the White House issued guidance for the DOD to pivot to the Indo-Pacific. As a result, DIA has worked to refocus our efforts on the challenges of strategic competition. Simultaneously, we have surged to support Ukraine. DIA is as committed as ever to providing premier defense intelligence to warfighters, decision makers, and our allies. We balance those priorities with the increasingly contentious conflict in the Middle East. Our current threat landscape includes multiple active conflicts, long-term strategic priorities, and transnational threats. It's a complex environment, and the Department of Defense adapted to address it. The Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security recently designated DIA as the Defense Intelligence Enterprise Lead to develop a common intelligence picture. The, the ability to combine intelligence from across the IC, service intelligence centers, combatant commands, and combat support agencies. This effort will require an enterprise approach to be successful. It's a critical undertaking, but it's crucial to posture us for the threats that lie ahead. This inter-DOD coordination is representative of this year's DOTUS theme, integrated deterrence through IT superiority. Deterrence looks a lot different now than it did during the Cold War. In this era of strategic competition, to successfully deter our advers adversaries, we cannot act alone. We need the technical expertise and innovation we can only get from industry, academia, and our 5 Eye partners. That's where integration comes in. The truth is, the nation is stronger and better when we work side by side with all of our partners. We learned that firsthand during the War on Terror. International coalitions like those seen in Iraq and Syria proved the value of working in lockstep with our part partners. We saw that idea in action again when countries around the world sent aid to Ukraine. The international backlash against Russia's invasion was a powerful deterrent to a broader conflict. As much as successful integrated deterrence relies on our partnerships with other nations, it also requires us to develop effective partnerships with industry. The private sector moves at the speed of innovation. It has the flexibility to adapt in a way that government bureaucracy isn't always able to. As Director of National Intelligence Haynes highlights, to keep pace with threats and foreign intelligence trends, we need to strengthen collaboration with the private sector and academia. Collaboration between our sectors will improve information, increase our insights into these risks, and inform mitigation activities. True integration demands that we reach across agency walls, across country borders, and across professional sectors. Integrated deterrence wouldn't be possible without IT superiority. We need to be at the cutting edge of developments, moving at the speed of mission. That doesn't just mean acquiring emergency tech, emerging technologies, but also applying them in unique ways. Necessity may be the mother of invention, but innovation is the mother of success. One of DIA's key IT innovations is the Machine Assisted Analytic Rapid Repository System, which is on track for full operational capability in 2026. MARS allows analysts to reach 
to research and expand their knowledge of all source foundational military intelligence quickly, efficiently, and in compliance with policy. Using Mars, DIA corrected over 700 discrepancies in geographic data records. Mars streamlined analyst research, meaning the updates were completed 61% faster than possible with prior systems. IT superiority isn't limited to Mars, though. It covers everything from our networks to the programs we run, to the hardware we use, and people who make it work. It all starts with you. We often say this to our workforce, but today, the phrase is for all of us. We are one team, one fight. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Mr. Kirchhofer, for those remarks. As Mr. Casa mentioned earlier, I'm Captain Whiteley, and I have the honor of serving as MC for this year's conference. As a lifelong Nebraskan, our next speaker did not have to travel far for this year's event. The Honorable Deb Fisher is the senior United States Senator for Nebraska. Senator Fisher is a rancher who was first elected to the US Senate in November 2012. Today, she serves on six Senate committees, including the Armed Services Committee. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senator Fisher. That justice is the one thing you should always find. You gotta saddle up your boys, you gotta draw a hard line. When the gun smoke settles, we'll sing a victory tune, and we'll all be back at the local saloon. We'll raise up our glasses against evil forces, sing. Whiskey for my men, beer for my horses. Good morning, everyone. It is such an honor to be here with you today. I'm a cattle rancher, and so I love that song. And it, I figure it needs to uh, jazz you all up a little this morning as well. Welcome to Omaha. I uh, understand many of you had a good steak last night here in Omaha. If you didn't have one last night, please have one tonight. We are all here this week to discuss what I consider the most pressing issue facing America, our national security. This event, and especially its focus on deterrence through technological superiority, could not come at a more fitting time. America's defense spending, investment in new technology, and our ability to adapt quickly to changing threats has atrophied for decades. Take our aging nuclear arsenal, which I spend a lot of time thinking about in the Senate on the Armed Services Committee. At its peak, America's nuclear stockpile was 31,000 255 warheads strong, but that number has decreased almost tenfold without serious modernization efforts until now. In the meantime, China has achieved a strategic breakout. China already has the world's largest navy, and although our ships remain superior for the moment, China's efficiency rate of production and investment in new technologies will soon mean that we will lose our ability to deter aggressive action in the coming years. But no less serious than falling behind in our nuclear and naval forces is the cybersecurity threat. American security is indeed at an inflection point when it comes to cybersecurity. Bombs and bullets may receive more public attention, but cyber threats are equally dangerous, if not more so. Increasingly, cyber threats have kinetic as well as non-kinetic effects, and they can be more widespread and harder to detect than nuclear attacks. Cyber warfare now targets businesses and civilians along with our defense and intelligence agencies. 
In an age of connectivity, the cybersphere allows for unprecedented total war. A few years ago, our cybersecurity efforts focused on preventing foreign espionage and intellectual property theft, and that is still a critical concern. Just earlier this month, Reports emerged that the Chinese hacking group known as Salt Typhoon had penetrated the networks of several of our United States broadband companies. Public reporting indicates that they might have accessed information shared by the federal government, amounting to a national security breach. But today, the scope of cybersecurity threats has expanded even further beyond military targets and corporate espionage. It's expanded beyond what we could have imagined even a decade ago. Every aspect of our lives is online, and so every person is a potential target. It's no understatement to say that the cybersphere is the 21st century's new battlefield. Recently uncovered cyber threats to our critical infrastructure won't be a surprise to anyone here. And all of us know of the China-linked cyber actors known as Volt Typhoon. Volt Typhoon has infected America's electric grids, airports, healthcare networks, water supply systems, and oil and gas pipelines. The scope of these attacks is almost dystopian. FBI Director Christopher Wray has said, Volt Typhoon is the defining threat of our generation. China is infiltrating networks across the country, preparing to strike at any moment. If a conflict erupts between the United States and China, or if China invades Taiwan and wants to prevent us from interfering, its government could detonate cyber attacks that would cripple our domestic infrastructure and it would also suppress our military readiness. Congress isn't blind to these threats. We know that we must defend against these threats to our critical systems. So what does this mean? This means sustained investments in cybersecurity systems, as well as encouraging the federal government to put programs on contract faster and use more flexible acquisition pathways. It also means understanding these threats better. In this year's Senate NDAA, we require the DOD Cyber Crime Center to conduct more tabletop exercises with industry partners so that we can understand what cybersecurity vulnerabilities might exist and what additional resources are needed so that we can address those gaps. We are here today because we understand the gravity of China's threats as well as threats that are facing us from other adversaries. We understand that this country cannot afford to ignore them. Every company, federal agency, and scholar here today has a role, and also a solemn responsibility in defending against those threats. The American people, are placing their trust in all of us to defend our civilian, our commercial, and our military infrastructure and IT systems. This conference is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to collaborate and innovate. It's an opportunity to prepare our nation for a future that we know it faces. And there's no better place we could gather to achieve these goals. Nebraska is a hub of technological advancement and defense infrastructure. It is fitting 
that we convene here in Omaha to learn more about the threats that we face and how we are going to defend against them. Omaha is at the heart of Silicon Prairie. It's leading the Midwest in telecommunications and information technology advancement. Several of Nebraska's growing IT businesses are here today to contribute to the conference. Omaha's own Avitcher is in attendance, as well as Lincoln's PenLink and Data Security Incorporated. From a little further north in Norfolk, Nebraska, Logistics 365 and Metz Green Solutions Incorporated are here as well. Each of these businesses is contributing to Nebraska's technology boom and our nation's cybersecurity, and we are proud to be their home. Students from the University of Nebraska at Omaha are also here to share what they've learned as part of a multidisciplinary academic deterrence research lab. Academic partnership on defense issues is critical for the United States to get ahead. And students, like the ones at UNO, are the future of America's industry and government participation in prioritizing our national defense. Nebraska is not only a central location for technology startups and academic research, it's central. It is central to our national defense. Most notably, we are the home to Offutt Air Force Base, where STRATCOM headquarters are located. STRATCOM was first formed in 1992, following the Cold War. The Department of Defense recognized a need for one command to take charge of our nuclear posture and arsenal. As the ranking member on the Senate Armed Services Committee Subcommittee on Strategic Forces, I oversee STRATCOM and I advocate for the funding and support it needs from the federal government. Our nation's nuclear forces, they underpin every aspect of American power and American security. And STRATCOM is critical to that mission. STRATCOM, perhaps more than any other combatant command, has a no-fail cybersecurity requirement. As we move away from legacy analog systems, we must ensure that cybersecurity requirements are baked into the NC3 architecture. We must ensure that we continuously update our hardware and software solutions to harden against those emerging cyber threats. The threats we see, they're growing from our adversaries, like China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. And as I've said before, cybersecurity breaches, they don't make much noise, like bombs and bullets. It is imperative that we draw much more attention to these dangers. We must show the public how serious these threats are and conferences like this one give us opportunities so that we can learn more. And it also gives us the opportunity to educate our communities. But even more crucially, we must respond to the threats that we see. Nuclear, cyber, economic, and much more. How can we effectively stand against such a constellation of risks? It's by creating a strong, unified response from different sectors of the United States. We have no choice but to leverage our positions in government, industry, and academia to deter those threats. Whether it's a small business, a research institution, 
or the United States Congress, we are all affected by the growing geopolitical instability. The good news is we have the opportunity this week to share insights and partner in innovation. When we partner together, when government clearly articulates requirements, and when industries, expertise, and innovation is properly leveraged, we can respond effectively. And that is how we will strengthen our deterrence. I hope each of you has a very productive few days here in Omaha, and I look forward to seeing the incredible results that come from this conference. Thank you. Of course. So first of all, thank you. I think everyone on the floor here can thank you for all your help with the strategy on contract and acquisition strategy. We really appreciate it. That helped us tremendously, both our vendors and us as consumers. You talked a little bit about tabletop exercises. Can you, can you let us know kind of an area or specific topic and some of the people that you might think might uh, be participants in this tabletop exercise? Did everyone hear the question about tabletop exercises and, and uh, what we see being able to take effect uh, with those exercises? I think it's, it's more of uh, looking at, at uh, collaboration and being able to recognize the importance of having government officials uh, work with industry, to work with academia in order to, in order to address those uh, issues. You know, when we consider the threats that we have and our peer adversaries that are, that are there, um, all we have to do is, is be able to look at uh, past actions. For example, with the Chinese, with uh, Volt Typhoon, when they were able to um, challenge the cyber defenses of, of the United States. Uh, when we see what Russia can do, not just uh, with, their, with their cyber attacks that we've learned from what they did in Ukraine, but their capabilities with uh, undersea cables, uh, for example, to be, able, to be able to collaborate, to be able to have our combatant commands work uh, together as well. I think that's one way that we can look at um, uh, specific uh, streamlining that could take place so that we can respond more efficiently. Any other questions? I can't see any of you. Yes, yes sir. Good morning, Senator. Uh, my question for you is what can Congress do to harden the United States uh, against Chinese soccer attacks? Mm. The question is, what can the United States do to harden uh, the United States against cyber attacks? We've, um, in the NDAA, but also in the appropriations, I'm on both committees, on appropriations committees, um, we've, under financial, serv under financial services uh, in appropriations this year, we have um, appropriated money, for example, to, to be able to look at pilot programs on how um, businesses can um, help, businesses can help their customers and also their employees to have more awareness about cybersecurity. So if you, if you can start it at that level, just the awareness level, I think, uh, is first of, first of all, extremely important. As I said earlier, then too, to be able to have, um, to be able to have our our own government move a little more efficiently 
uh, with combatant commands, with cyber, with STRATCOM, being able to um, speak a little more quickly and in a, in a more streamlined manner when something happens, that is extremely important as well. And um, although I can't talk about it in, in this setting, there's a number of ways um, that we can continue uh, to gain our knowledge about what the Chinese are doing and also be able to respond. Another question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, what can the uh, federal government do to help raise awareness um, against these threats? As I said, we have um, a pilot program out there to help with uh, government, um, to help businesses raise awareness within their own businesses. Something that I have a mission on, and I know there's folks in the crowd here who've heard me bring it up a lot at Armed Services Committee and in classified briefings, I just would really like to um, see where possible that we can uh, unclassify some of the materials that I get to see every single week. I think we, um, without, without compromising methods or personnel, um, we, we need to be able to tell the American people the threats that this country faces. They, I believe that when the American people have a more thorough and correct understanding of the threats that our peer adversaries uh, are, are capable of, we would see tremendous support for our military. We would see tremendous support, I believe, for the modernization programs that I continue to push when it comes to our nuclear modernization, and not just the weapons, but the platforms. And to, and to be able to uh, have the support and recognize that it is the core duty of a government when we talk about national security. So that's my personal mission, which I plan to continue pushing. It's not on. Ma'am, thank you for coming to join us. Okay, so I don't need to yell. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you for coming to DOTUS, appreciate it. Uh, from your perch, uh, you touched on this a bit, but from your perch, what do you see as the differences or the similarities between the cyber attacks of China, Russia, and other hostile actors? As I said, I think that when you, you, you can look at um, North Korea, for example. Um, they're, they, they seem to center around cryptocurrency heists. When you, when you look at Iran, um, they seem to be focused on election interference. Uh, you, look, you look at Russia, and as I, as I touched on uh, briefly, at the beginning, you know, they, we've, we've learned a lot from uh, their attacks in Ukraine, but they, they are also able to target uh, critical infrastructure. And it's critical infrastructure that I believe is very vulnerable. And in, whether it's those undersea cables, whether it's um, industrial control systems, in the United States, um, that, that is, um, I believe, where their, their focus is. With the Chinese, um, you know, they have capabilities where they're able to burrow into our infrastructure, which then, which then would make a strike easier, um, easier for them in the case of a larger conflict. Thank That's you. how I see those four being different. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. An honor to visit with you today.
Thank you, Senator Fisher, for those remarks. Our next speaker is General Anthony Cotton. General Cotton currently serves as the commander of the United States Strategic Command located just down the road at Offutt Air Force Base. General Cotton is responsible for one of 11 unified commands, overseeing strategic deterrence, nuclear operations, global strike, missile defense, joint electromagnetic spectrum operations, analysis and targeting, and missile threat assessment. Please give a warm welcome to General Cotton. Man, ain't nothing like that kind of walkout music, 8 o'clock in the morning, right? Half y'all don't even know who that is. McFadden and Whitehead. Ain't no stopping us now. Demetri Henry knew what song that was. Hey, first of all, um, I was able to see Senator Fisher as she uh, left, but uh, what an incredible advocate uh, for my mission portfolio, but for the Department of Defense as a whole. So um, I'm glad that she was able to uh, have an opportunity to speak to this forum this morning. So good morning. Welcome to Omaha. It's great to have DOTUS back in Omaha for the first time since 2018. This city is truly one of America's hidden gems, and I hope you'll have some time while you're here to explore Old Market, the Riverfront Park, and some other great attractions nearby. You know why I say that? It's because I'm recruiting. <laughs> I'm always recruiting at Stratcom. You know, the average citizen and even many of us have become accustomed to our information technology systems always being there when we need them. But those who know better understand that networks built and managed by the people in this room are a critical part of our national security strategic enterprise. Our adversaries know we will always be able to maintain communications and command and control in any contingency, and that persu persuades them to avoid taking action against us. We must maintain that edge. Before we get to the specific role of information technology and strategic deterrence, I thought I'd briefly discuss today's strategic situation, and I think I heard the Senator talk a little bit briefly about that. Our strategy and a few steps that we're taking to implement that strategy and why you play an important role in its implementation. We are in a pivotal moment in history Secretary Austin said it best when he said, these next few years will set the terms of our competition with the People's Republic of China, and they will shape the future of security in Europe. And they will determine whether our children and grandchildren inherit an open world of rules and rights, or whether they face emboldened autocrats who seek to dominate by force and fear. For the first time in our history, we conf confront two nuclear peer near peer adversaries. Russia is bent on restoring its former policy of glory and rising China that seeks to replace a stable and open international system that has served the, well, well for, served the world well for over 80 years. Now I add to this an aggressive and nuclear armed North Korea, and of course Iran. China is rapidly expanding, expanding all aspects of military power, including land, sea, and air-based nuclear delivery systems. The PRC is likely to have 1,000 nuclear warheads by 2030 and is supporting Russia's war on Ukraine. Russia already has the largest and most diverse nuclear arsenal in the world and continues to expand and modernize that arsenal. Moscow has dramatically expanded the percentage of its GDP devoted to the military and is clearly poised for a long war in Ukraine. North Korea continues to expand its nuclear arsenal in violation of UN Security Council resolutions, as well as its active support for Russia in Ukraine. 
Most recently, we see that North Korean troops are being deployed to Russia for the further deployment to the Ukraine. And finally, Iran continues its aggression in the Middle East with support from Russia. In fact, Russia even recently warned Israel against attacking Iranian nuclear facilities. I can go on, but in brief, we live in challenging times, to say the least. And the work that you do has never, never been more important. Maintaining deterrence requires all hands on deck. In this new, most complicated environment, integrated deterrence is imperative. Define, the, the secretary defined integrated deterrence as using existing capabilities and building new ones and deploying them all in new and networked ways, all tailored to a region's security landscape to include growing in partnership with our friends. This involves more than just a military force. It employs all the levers of national power. Every single one of those levers, however, is reliant on the information technology infrastructure whose care is entrusted in many of you. Despite the security environment I described a few minutes ago, it's not all doom and gloom. In fact, our competitors emphasize their transactional relationships. The US and our allies are trailblazing upgrades and capitalizing on new technologies to maintain credible and effective deterrence. The US Nuclear Command Control and Communication System, known as NC3, is essential to the president's ability for command and control of the nation's nuclear forces. This system, like the platforms that make up the nuclear triad, remains assured, reliable, and resilient across the full spectrum of conflict. But to retain the competitive edge, we are exploring all possible technologies, techniques, and methods to assist with the modernization of our NC3 capabilities. STRATCOM and the entire enterprise are upgrading our legacy NC3 systems to modern IT infrastructure. These upgrades keep us in the fight today and ensure we maintain the advantage in the future to include EMP hardening of the IT infrastructure supporting our nuclear forces. Furthermore, we're investing in innovative IT solutions to develop the next generation of NC3 capabilities, as well as secure cloud computing for our mission critical applications. We are also de developing artificial intelligence or AI enabled human led decision support tools to ensure our leaders are able to respond to complex, time-sensitive scenarios. All of these actions underpin our strategy, support integrated deterrence, and ensure we maintain IT superiority. AI will not replace leadership. In fact, human relationships, growth, engagement, and connection will matter more than ever. The next key pillar in our strategy is the electromagnetic spectrum or EMS. I don't need to tell this audience that EMS is a critical maneuver space in modern warfare. STRATCOM's Joint Electromagnetic Spectrum Operations Center was established in 2023 and serves as an operational lead for the EMS enterprise for the department. We established an analytic division to focus on current and future threats to our NC3 capabilities and also established a future technology division to identify and integrate novel technologies into intelligence processes and workflows. Additionally, STRATCOM carved out resources to establish intelligence support to the Joint Electromagnetic Support Operations Team known as GEMSO. Along with DIA, this team co-led a defense intelligence enterprise-wide study to identify gaps and shortfalls in DIA's ability to support GEMSO intelligent requirements across the DOD. Finally, STRATCOM prioritizes planning for survivable and enduring intelligence operations prior to, during, and after any potential nuclear exchange to ensure I and the National Command Authority 
continue to receive critical strategic intelligence support through all phases of a strategic conflict. A significant part of this planning effort is to ensure reliable, resilient, and redundant IT capabilities. So that's a quick look at today's world and a little bit on what we're doing about it. Now let me turn to the role of information systems as well as what my command needs from the people in this room. As I said, our networks are a critical part of deterrence. STRATCOM requires IT networks that are always, always functional, resilient, and defended. Our adversaries must know that our nuclear command and control and other capabilities that provide decision advantage are at the ready 24-7, 365, and cannot be compromised or defeated. I cannot stress too strongly that the IT systems you design and maintain are as critical in the nuclear fight as they are in the conventional. They form the backbone of our command and communications infrastructure. In order to enable AI and machine learning efforts, data needs to be readily available at the speed of decisions. Those who own the data need to push beyond the banner of ownership and move towards data as communal assets for the whole of government. In future conflicts, no combatant command will act alone. It will be a collaborative effort in which data must flow freely and securely between IT systems. Without common trusted data, senior leaders may not have all the information required to make truly informed decisions. Even worse, data could be contradictory or disjointed. Reliable, secure, and resilient IT networks are essential for maintaining situational awareness and decision-making capabilities in both conventional and nuclear scenarios. Moreover, advanced IT enables real-time intelligence gathering, analysis, and dissemination, which are all crucial to strategic deterrence. The modernization of our IT capabilities is essential to maintaining our deterrence edge. Upgrading legacy NC3 systems with modern IT infrastructure is a top priority. To be effective, these systems must be hardened. They must be secure. And they must be redundant to fun function in both conventional conflict, con conflicts or nuclear ones. Robust cybersecurity measures are critical to protect NC3 systems from adversary attacks or manipulation. Maintaining technological superiority in IT systems create uncertainty in the calculus of our adversaries. That enhances deterrence. Advanced AI and robust data analytics capabilities provide decision advantage and improve our deterrence posture. IT and AI superiority allows for a more effective integration of conventional and nuclear capabilities, strengthening deterrence. IT superiority is crucial in this new paradigm, enabling us to deter aggression across physical and virtual realms. IT superiority provides combat credibility, the ability to fight and win through all domains, fundamental to deterrence. Advanced technolo technologies allow for better integration across domains, regions, and the spectrum of conflict. AI ML capabilities offer unique deterrence effects that complement traditional military power. It enables seamless coordination with our global networks of allies and partners. Interoperability and information sharing are vital to presenting a united front against potential adversaries. And our shared technological capabilities enhance our collective deterrent posture. To achieve and maintain this superiority, we need continuous investments in cutting edge technologies, and we must continue to collaborate with industry, academia, allies for innovation and technological advancement. 
You know, the linchpin of IT superiority is cybersecurity, which is foundational to all new investments and must be retrofitted into legacy systems. AIML is a force multiplier and an imperative to meeting these goals. Proliferation of commercial information devices, wearables, devices, medical uses, etc., will continue to expand at scale. Most Americans, including my own workforce, our workforce, now view these systems not as luxuries, but as necessities of modern life. And we have to find workable policies to deal with that reality. The character of integrated deterrence is changing due to technological advances in data, analytics, and AI ML. AI and autonomous systems provide strategic advances in military operations, but these advances or advantages must be balanced against risks and unattended consequences. By processing vast amounts of data, providing actionable insights and enabling better informed and more timely decisions, AI will enhance our decision-making capabilities, but we must never allow artificial intelligence to make those decisions for us. Advanced systems can inform us faster and more efficiently, but we must always maintain a human decision in the loop. To maximize the adoption of these capabilities and maintain our edge over our adversaries, we must become a data-centric organization. This will require moving quickly to achieve the seven goals identified by the Voltus framework set out in the 2020 DOD data strategy. To ensure data is visible, accept, accessible, understandable, linked, trustworthy, interoperable, and secure. We are already leveraging our university-affiliated research centers to make our data more accessible and help with decision-making. But at this point, we still have a long way to go. We still struggle to access and fully utilize as effectively as we could. All of our data sources is needed for maintaining decision advantage is still that one step away. In particular, we are hindered by disparate data formats and lengthy timelines to achieve authority to operate. If we don't have fully informed information, we're not making fully informed decisions. Aided by AI and ML, we must shift away from manual entry or hand jamming efforts to the maximum extent possible and utilize machine enabled analysis and visualization to enhance time critical decision making. We need to direct research efforts to understand risks of cascading effects of AI models, emergent and unexpected behaviors, and indirect integration of NI into AI into nuclear decision making processes. In a data centric organization where automated connections to real data sources enable greater efficiencies, data are informational, or excuse me, foundational for the AI application and research. For STRATCOM, we must maintain the advantage over our adversaries by en enabling faster and better decisions. Effective data management will help ensure we maintain decision advantage by enabling rapid and informed decision making across the enterprise. STRATCOM will transform to a data centric organization that leverages high quality data, the application of advanced analytics and AI and ML. Data centricity requires all warfighters to understand applications account for risk and detect unexpected behavior to utilize these emerging capabilities responsibly. The rapid pace of technological change presents challenges and opportunities for deterrence. Our adversaries are also advancing their AI and ML capabilities, requiring constant vigilance 
and adaptation. We're ahead of them and we simply must maintain and expand that lead. Balancing offensive and defensive cyber capabilities is crucial for effective deterrence in this digital age. As we move forward, STRATCOM is committed to taking charge of integrating IT superiority into our deterrent strategy. We need your continued support to innovate, to adapt, and collaborate to stay ahead of emerging threats through the modernization of current NC3 systems. Implement, implementation of our AI and ML to assist human decision making and securing all aspects of the NC3 IT environment. I also urge you to continue working to expand understanding of the importance of cyber IT, of data, of AI and ML skill set development within academia, industry, and the DOD. The bottom line is that we need to be prepared to fight in any domain at a time and place of our choosing. And we must ensure that our adversaries recognize this strength. We need only to retain, we need not only to retain our existing talent, but we also need to recruit new talent and then recruit more new talent and then recruit more new talent. All aspects of modern warfare are more complex than they were a few decades ago. Finding people capable of integrating AI ML into combat today requires unique specialization and currency. And this is vitally more complex than integrating a technological advancement of the past. We cannot compete with industry salaries to retain personnel, but the nature of our work and having the most advanced capabilities to carry out missions that only the US government can conduct is in itself a retention tool. Our strategic nuclear deterrent is required to be four things, safe, secure, effective, and credible. Well, as it turns out, the more I think about it, the more I realize that in order to maintain our IT superiority, in order to continue to maintain deterrence through IT superiority, our information systems must also be four things. They must be safe. They must be secure. They must be effective and yes, they must be credible. I know we can successfully meet the coming challenges as well, but it will not be easy. Our nation's historic strengths, innovation and flexibility will be critical to success. Within the Department of Defense, we need to transform into a data-centric and AI-enabled guarantor of strategic deterrence. Few people have the opportunity to engage in such consequential work work that could very easily determine the course of history. Your country is depending on you, and that's not something that anyone can say. We are, each of us, fortunate to have this chance. Thank you for your time, and I hope you have a great conference. Thank you, General Cotton, for that presentation. Next, we'll have a fireside chat with the Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence, Dr. Stacy Dixon, and the Joint Staff Director for Intelligence, Lieutenant General Dimitri Henry. Mr. Casa will be moderating the discussion, and I welcome everyone to the stage at this time. Yeah, I win every single game, I'm so powerful, 
Okay. Well, thank you for joining us in a fireside chat. We have the PDNI, Dr. Stacy Dixon, and the joint staff, J2, General Dimitri Henry, with us. And so last year we did a fireside chat, which was great. Uh, General Henry did not get a fireside chat last year, and he let us know that. So this year, he is with us on our fireside chat. Thank you. So, and we did, we did one with the CIO workforce internal with DIA a couple months back, which was really good. We talked about everything from mission needs to technology to workforce. So really appreciate you joining us today. So just by way of background, um, so Dr. Dixon, you started your career. Let me see if I have this right. I read, I read your bios, and, I, and, I, and we've worked with each other over the years, so I think you started in this community in 2003 with CIA, right? Correct. And then you spent some time on the Hill. Yes. And then you went to NGA as the research director, I think. Eventually. Eventually. Well, deputy, but... Okay, eventually. okay, okay. And then, and then IARPA. Correct. And then uh, PDD&I. Yes. And your first DOTUS was here in 2018, 2018 along with exactly. me, and you were with uh, IARPA, IARPA at the time. So welcome back. Thank you. Thank so. you. It is great to be back. Yeah, and General Henry, you uh, you've been you've been to a few dotuses now, right? Yeah. Um, and you started your career, I believe, in 1982, 81, 81, May of 81. So uh, not long after I was born. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but over 40 years now. So you enlisted in, in in May of 81, and you've had many assignments. Uh, but uh, most notably in recent years, you were. Uh, over in CENTCOM as the Director of Operations and uh, the J2. And uh, now you are currently the J2 and the Joint Staff. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you both for joining us. So wanted to start with, with a couple questions surrounding um, change in, in data and how we support our customers. So um, Dr. Dixon, there are a number of areas where the IC and DOD collaborate and develop new technologies to, to transform how we do business. Um, one of the big uh, drivers over the recent years is GMTI, so grooving mount, gro grooving, <laughs> yeah, ground moving target indicators, a little grooving hard to say. Too. Yeah, grooving too, that works. <laughs> uh, but we are moving from a construct of a, a limited number of airborne ISR platforms to space-based ISR construct. So can you tell us a little bit about how the IC and D DOD are working together to address the data challenges that come along with that? Sure, Doug. So first of all, the, I think the space-based space GM, GMTI is a really good example of a place where if the IC and the DOD don't work together, we're not going to be able to achieve what we know that we can with this capability. And so what I see happening behind the scenes is the right people talking. So you've got all the way from the engineers building the satellites all the way through the operators trying to have the conversation about what does the system need to look like? How do we best effectively deliver the information? Um, and we, we talk about the tasking and the collection, the processing, exploitation, dissemination, the TPED process. The thing that I like to start with, though, is what are we trying to achieve when we're building this thing? So it's got to be accurate. It has to be timely at the speed that the warfighter needs. It has to be able to get the data to the people that need it, where they need it, classification that they need it, when they need it. Um, I would add on that it needs to be resilient and able to withstand a bunch of adversarial attacks. It also has to be very much leveraging automation. With, with that amount of data, there's absolutely no way people in the loop are going to be able to do the thing. And so um, I see us having the conversations. I see us trying to understand the construct by which we currently task and collect and operate our, our systems. These days, I'm also hoping that we really are leveraging your community. And I'm not just saying this because I'm at DOTUS, but really the CIOs, the CDOs, uh, the CISOs, mm -hmm. and, and also their partners, the chief AI officers, like all together are going to help us build the kind of system that we need. And it really is about how we're moving the data. So for me, I see us having the right conversations. I see us trying to exercise it in the way that we all understand how changes to all of those parts of the TCPED process will impact our ability to provide what the warfighter needs. And you know, discussions continue. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and we don't agree on everything right now, but I mean, I think we're moving in the direction of we're going to be able to deliver the thing that is absolutely needed. Yeah. I, I think uh, many in this audience would appreciate your uh, mention of the CISOs as well and cybersecurity mm -hmm. being part of the data strategy for because much of the community, right, where data, the, the chief data officer has been, you know, one function within right. the community and then the CISO has been another. And now we're really starting to see those come aligned, especially with zero trust. I get to spend a lot of time with you all on these issues. Yeah. <laughs> So, so General Henry, uh, related question for you, uh, related to combined joint all domain command and control, so CJAD C2, uh, and how that supports coalition warfighting. What technologies, in your view, uh, especially in your current role, are needed to make that a reality? Well, I, I think, um, I mean, the, the two speakers previous, uh, Senator Fisher and General Cotton, uh, talked about uh, the need for data and the need to be able to uh, ensure that it's delivered in a way that's effective uh, on time and that uh, they can actually trust it. And, and Dr. Dixon was just uh, describing, um, you know, the, the constellation that's going up now and how we're going to use that in order to fight. Uh, from, a, from a joint staff perspective, uh, the governance of that is going to be very important. And, and Dr. Dixon and Director Haynes have recognized that and have allowed us to start working together with the engineers, with the, with the data scientists, and with uh, the intel community in order to ensure that the, the war fighting capability we put together has influence from the folks that are actually gonna use the, the capability. But as far as uh, what we need, I think the, the team that's here, the folks that are, are building the systems, the folks that are coming up with new ways of utilizing uh, the data that we do have, I think that's in place. What, what, we, what we really need, though, is for the joint force to understand what it is that's available and then start to experiment with it. And one of the uh, greatest things that I've seen over the last couple of years on the joint staff, and, and while uh, three years ago or more when I was down at CENTCOM, is this, our ability to do things like global uh, integrated uh, exercises where we actually start to test out some of this capability, uh, whether it's in the Indo-Pacific or whether it's here in a lab, uh, and have the joint force uh, participate in it. And for, for those of you who are building networks, for those of you who are trying to make sure that the data is uh, uh, utilized in a way and it's visible and available, uh, I think one of the best things you could do is actually bring in the folks that are actually going to have to exercise that, use it, and make decisions with it. And I think you get a better product uh, based on that. So, um, you know, I, I was thinking, Stacy and I were talking on the way here about our time in ODNI and the community. And I had started uh, with ODNI around the 2009 ish time frame, um, but was a contract support standing it up in 2005. So we're, it's hard to believe we're on the 20th anniversary of ODNI. I think it was April of 2005 Correct. when it was, was official. So, can you tell us where you've seen the biggest evolution? And, and I recall one of those being commercial imagery and how that integrated within what we did uh, functionally in the intelligence community, um, you know, in terms of the legal, the policy constraints, and just really the, the mindset and cultural shift around that of bringing in commercial imagery into the community. So obviously uh, increasing the amount of, of data on that side, but what are your thoughts on how we could better integrate that commercial and what we uniquely do within the IC? So first, thank you for mentioning the 20th anniversary. We are uh, very much looking forward to recognizing that milestone next year and, and really looking at all of the things that the ERTPA, the law itself, as well as just the changes to the community that came about as a result of it have had on the mission of the IC. Mm -hmm. um, you are absolutely right that we have done a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of change over the, the years in terms of how we're bringing in more commercially available information. And I'll, say, I'll also include publicly available information because I think both, both, of, both of those things are worthy of kind of mentioning. Um, what we're trying to do as a community to do it better though is uh, figuring out how do we not only leverage the fact that we've got, we've got a number of contracts out there that people have with this data, and there's a lot more use that could be taking place within our community if we were to do this from a more uh, concert, uh, holistic effort. So how do we better develop our contracts so that we can have more of the people that actually can benefit from the data use it? So that's one. Um, how do we also make sure that people understand the framework by which we are going to be leveraging this kind of information? This becomes important because from the, so the, the the policy perspective, looking at the oversight from Congress 
Uh, we used to get complaints that we didn't use open source information, publicly available information, and now that we're using it a lot, we're getting complaints that we're using it, Right. which is <laughs> ironic. Now, the complaints are different. The complaints today are really, how are you using it? Are you protecting civil liberties and privacy? Yes. Are you protecting American, American citizens? Yes. But we have to continue to reinforce that and also build it into our systems. How do you build in the compliance that's needed to make sure that we're doing it? How do we make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable? And so we've done a couple of things like not only publishing our open source intelligence uh, strategy mm -hmm. for the public to see, we also published a framework on how we're gonna be using commercially available information. Again, laying the groundwork for how it's gonna be used in our community so that we can hopefully increase people's uh, confidence and that we're using it correctly for our mission space. And so we'll continue to iterate on these types of things, but trying to figure out how to be as transparent as we can as mm -hmm. we do this, while also making sure that we're leveraging it appropriately. Yeah. Uh, from, the, from the other side though, it's like how do we ensure that we're using it appropriately within the community? How do we use it to full effect? And for many years, decades, we've really focused on, you know, how do we teach our analysts how to best use the classified information that we have? Teaching people and making sure that the tradecraft exists for open source information and commercially available information is extremely important. How do we factor it in such that the open source information, the commercially available information isn't a, a secondary to the classified information? In some cases, it is filling in gaps that we do not have from classified information. And we have to be able to appreciate that. So how do we change the mindset that we've developed over the years of classified first in making it whatever is the data that has the best information, that's the one you use first, and then you supplement it with whatever else you've got available. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of cultural change in there too. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point. So as, as, as you were talking about cultural change and how we view things differently, uh, I, I do remember when I first uh, entered the community, open source was not considered a real collection discipline. Um, in fact, I remember giving a briefing uh, talking about the collection disciplines. This was in, in training, a training course that I was given uh, on collection management. And I mentioned open source as one of the disciplines. And somebody corrected me and said that is not an official discipline. Mm. And so, you know, that's, that's obviously evolved over time. And now we look at open source as really to help us narrow down where we focus the other exquisite collection capabilities, um, as opposed to the past where we, we started with those and just kind of looked at open source as, as off onto the side. Um, but definitely a big cultural shift. Um, so Gen General Henry, in, in your view, um, you know, what have you seen over the course of your your career that had required the biggest kind of mindset shift in this community. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, open source was definitely one of those. Cell phones was another big one. And I think we're starting to see that now. I, I remember I used to work at CIA and they told us you cannot come through the gate with a cell phone, right? Because they have integrated cameras on them. Yeah. So you had to leave those at home. Well, obviously, you know, life moved on and technology moved on and now they're just integrated into everything we do. Um, but, you know, certainly we've seen seen those mindset cultural shifts a lot within our community. What are some things that come to mind for you? Well, for me, I think, I think you hit on it. Um, the governance piece is critical, and then not just the governance piece itself, but the understanding that we're using it in a way that is legal, protecting U.S. persons. Uh, and, and then I think we still uh, have a ways to go of actually utilizing it for the way we just described it. We described it as, hey, take it, use it, and then help narrow down for that exquisite collection to fill in the gaps. We're, I think we're still not there yet. I think, we're, I think the younger generation, I think is. I think they, they start there, and then they start looking at some of the classified holdings. And I think that's, a, that's a, probably a good way to be. Um, it's, uh, I, think, I think we're on the right track, and I think what uh, the DNI and uh, the folks that help with the governance of it and the oversight of it, I think the tools that they're giving us now are going to help us get there. Um, and it's just now a matter of just like anything else that we do. You, you mentioned you, you couldn't have cell phones coming, coming into the gate, and now you know, we have lock boxes, so on and so forth. Uh, but being able to understand, I think, what the vulnerabilities are uh, is important as well. And I think our people, once they understand what's at risk and how you can mitigate that by doing certain things, I think it'll be much more accepted. But the governance piece is a part that I think over the last 20 years or so definitely has allowed us to actually utilize that capability in a way that we hadn't been able to before. 
Yeah, I, I think you're right. As it, it is, is I kind of look ahead and how we're, we're operating, and um, my wife is a high school teacher, high school computer science teacher. So she is dealing with the growth of tools like ChatGPT and students you know, putting, putting uh, requests in and automatically generating code and not thinking critically. And a lot of the problems that, that we solve, especially within engineering, and Stacy, with your background, I, I, I know you'd appreciate this, a lot of it comes from the struggle of trying to figure things out, right? That's where a lot of innovation comes from. It's, it's, it's not necessarily you have a plan and then you incrementally move towards that plan, right? You'll run into issues along the way and you'll figure things out. And, and that's how most innovation comes about, through surprise. Uh, and I think governance is an important aspect of that because as we begin automating a lot of what we do, especially with large language models and where we're going with AI, um, the challenge that we have within the IC is it, it's, it's, a, it's a bit different, right? We have tradecraft that we have to buy, abide by, both analytic tradecraft and collection tradecraft to extent, although it's not as formal. Um, and when we treat things as black boxes and we don't understand the input that we're receiving and where that's going, that becomes a challenge. And that's where governance comes in. And I think culturally, that's probably where we're gonna struggle the most. Uh, you know, for any automation that we have, that means somebody put hundreds if not thousands of hours to build that, right? And so integrating that into our environment is certainly gonna be a, a mindset cultural shift of how do we govern that? So oh, yeah. yeah, great hey, point. Hey Doug, I'd, I'd like to say something about governance. And I, I said this, maybe at a DOTUS, I don't know, years ago or in some other venue, but everybody seems to want governance until you actually give it to them. <laughs> and yeah. and it, it's amazing because if, if, you, if the governance structure is set up in a way that allows for innovation, then you can move quickly because if I know my left and right lateral limits, then you didn't limit how far I could go, you just limited you know, what my boundaries are, and then I can unleash innovation in a way that allows the user of that, uh, of that whatever it is they're developing to actually do something that I never even thought of or conceived. Um, and, and I think one of the things that we tend to do uh, is not put a governance structure in, because I think our culture as Americans is, you know, leave me alone, let me alone, leave me be, and then something catastrophic happens and everyone says, hey, we, we really need to put some boundaries on this thing, whatever it is, and then you still unleash innovation. So I think we've gotten to a point where we are starting to get comfortable, I don't know if that's the right word, uh, of actually trying to determine how you would govern it and then allow the, the, the things to take place inside that structure. And for Dr. Dixon and, and uh, Director Haynes, They've been really good at making sure that if something isn't quite right, that you tweak it in a way that allows us to do what we need to do uh, because things happen uh, pretty quickly. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a great partnership watching uh, USDINS uh, working with uh, DNI as we struggle you know, in, in the current fights that we're in right now. Uh, but that is getting quicker and quicker because I think everyone has accepted the idea that if you have a good governance model, then you can shift and move and, and do it in a way that I think is constructive without being too dangerous with the, with the boundaries. So I think governance is really key to especially the AI that's, that's starting to come on board and not just large language models, but the, the one that I think we have not put a lot of emphasis on, I don't think anyone has really put a lot of emphasis on is a causal AI. We're pretty good at correlation. We're starting to get really good at generative, but I think the causal AI, what uh, General Cotton was referring to about helping the decision maker, I think once we go down that road, we definitely need to have some, some boundaries on it. But I think uh, it's gonna be key uh, going forward to really have an understanding of what it is we don't want to do and don't want to go down and then kind of let people experiment in there. Yeah, and I think that it's interesting that an AI national security memorandum mm -hmm. is sort of trying to help right. us with those sort of bounds and ensuring that across the entire government that we're thinking about how we're using it, how we're thinking about making sure that we're building it ethically, that we'll be using it responsibility, but also encouraging us to use it to the maximum extent right. that we can. And so it's recognizing the challenges, but the opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm absolutely with you, General Henry, on the governance piece. A lot of times we just sort of want to jump in and start using things, which you know can be very, it can feel very innovative. Right. 
But a lot of times, sometimes what you're developing is not something you can scale. Right. Right. It's something that you realize too late what the challenges are. So taking the time to actually create that framework, especially because it's gonna require so much data. And while we have a lot of data, it's daily data we've collected for all these different reasons. And so now it's a matter of like structuring it, getting right. some standards in there, some things that are gonna make it easier for us to use it in the long run. And so I'm excited about the possibilities. Um, well, also, you know, sort of mindful that there's a lot to be done to get lot. to that place, and we've got to be sure that we're doing it intentionally, not, not necessarily slowly, intentionally, um, and also making sure that we're validating along the way that, that what's coming out the other end, especially yeah, as we get to the causal, makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we talk about go governance and, and ethics as an example, as we bring in new data or new capabilities and, and maintaining the trust yes. uh, of the intelligence community and the DOD, what are, you hear, what are you hearing from those in the community in terms of either the organizational shifts we need to make or the policy shifts? You know, cyber is one that I hear all the time of we need to change you know, the, the risk management framework and the policies around cyber for how we bring new capabilities in uh, to our networks. What are, you, what are you both hearing and what are your thoughts on what might need to shift as we head into the future? I'll, I'll, I'll start on that one. I, I think we just need to shift. I, I think... You know, as I, as I sit um, uh, with the chairman and uh, we discuss a lot about risk and, um, you know, part of my remit and, uh, and the other uh, joint directors is to uh, help him balance risk, uh, help align strategic processes and help uh, develop the joint force capability development, and, which is kind of what we're talking about right now. Uh, but those first two, the balancing of risk, um, First, you have to, I think, understand what it is you're trying to accomplish. And I think a lot of times that's lost because we're thinking about now instead of the future, about where we need to be five years from now, 10 years from now. We're talking about right now. And we look at the risk as it pertains right now as opposed to in the future and how that risk would evolve over time and how what you could do with this capability in order over time to buy down that risk. Uh, and we tend to, um, you know, depend on a military arm of, of, of government in order to help buy down that risk. And um, I think it's, um, it, we just have to change the way we think about risk. Uh, but in the end, it's going to be a human being who makes that decision based on a whole lot of things. And intel is just one piece of that. But our portion of that needs to be um, certainly something that's trust that you can trust. Um, and if the decision maker can't trust what we're doing, whether our standards are actually being um, uh, utilized, whether the oversight's there, all of those things I think are gonna matter in the future. But I, I really think um, on the risk piece, it's really just, it's a mindset of what it is. Uh, if you're on a tactical edge, uh, you come up with this plan or you come up with what you need to be able to do and you say, if just let us do it, and then it comes all the way up and you know, I get to see some of that decision making. And it's just a, an amazing thing to, to understand uh, that that action that's gonna be taken at that city block at this time in this place has implications back, you know, certainly inside the Pentagon because we'd be the ones uh, taking the action on the military side uh, and then putting that in perspective. Now, how do you, how do, you do that when uh, you're at the, at the moment of inflection I have no idea, but I do know that when I deliver intel to the chairman, I need him to be able to trust that I've done the things the way they should have been done in order to provide the intelligence that we're providing. And um, again, I just think it's a mental model that needs to be changed in a way that allows us to, to look forward about that risk and see if it persists over time. And if we can handle that over time, I think then you would you'd probably be willing to do a little bit more up front. I do agree about the need to make sure that those that we hire and bring on board are more comfortable with taking risk, mm -hmm. taking managed risk. Mm -hmm. uh, we also just may need to make sure that we're bringing in people who have the right skills to be able to leverage all of this technology, who have experience doing that 
and experience leveraging the technology, experience working with the data that we have and sort of the missions that we have, and kind of bringing those two together. And so it's always bringing in sort of new people, right. but also training people on the latest and greatest as part of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, from a complaint perspective, what I hear a lot about is complaints about acquisition, complaints mm -hmm. about yeah. the fact that it is very hard to get to ATOs, the clients very hard to get to. Uh, our, our acquisition processes aren't moving fast enough, either for industry who wants to sell us things or for the government who wants to bring them in. And so we're going to have to continue to look at how do we enable processes that allow us to provide the security and the safety while also moving faster than we've shown that we can move on a regular basis without sort of carving out and creating these sort of special things right. that are allowed to move fast while everything else is moving at regular speed. We need everything to be able to move fast when possible. So how do we, how do, we do that more holistically around the entire community? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point on acquisition. When when I had started in the community, worked a lot on the acquisition side and our processes, as many of you know, were, were geared around buying satellite systems, right? Not around technology and the integration of that technology uh, into everything that we do today. Um, so certainly, you know, while price tag wise, it may not meet the threshold of a major system acquisition, tech, every time technology does hit those big things that we buy and build. Um, so how do we factor that in and adjust the acquisition process to account for it? Um, you mentioned workforce, and after this, you're meeting with students from University of Nebraska as well. Um, how do you, so, so we talked about how the workforce is changing. What are some of the expertise gaps that both of you see, uh, either, either on the, the support side or the mission side uh, of everything that we do? What, what are some, some of those notable gaps, and, and how have you seen your own careers evolve over time? You know, and the expertise that you, you, know, you may not have had in your careers that you have had to build and get experience in to, to really support the levels that you work at today. I think if, if I look back over the past couple years, what kinds of questions that were being asked by policymakers has driven our recognition that there's certain skill sets that we don't have enough of in government. So we're getting a lot of, comp a lot of questions about financial threats. Uh, how, do you, how do you make sure that we are being able to answer the questions that policymakers have regarding, you know, are sanctions going to be effective or not? It requires someone to actually understand these international finance mm -hmm. regulations and rules in other places. Uh, bringing in economists so they can help us sort of predict these types of things and recognizing that not necessarily the, the talent that we need won't necessarily want to come into government. And so how do you create those opportunities for us to ask questions of experts? And so it's a little bit of... Mm -hmm bringing in the new skills and expertise to help us drive these conversations within, as well as being able to link to those, whether it's, whether it's people in industry, whether it's people in academia or non-governmental organizations, wherever the talent is in these places. And because our, the community is so large, I've seen, for example, Treasury Department has some great relationships that they've built with the financial sector to be able to, to, to get the questions answered on their end. Uh, and we're doing things like that in other spaces, like biosecurity. That's another place that's taken on a huge uh, amount of importance, both from the, we've lived through a pandemic, we have to make sure that we have better prepared and equipped and not have to go through that again. Yeah. But also we know that adversaries are out there looking at bio as a possible vector uh, weapon. So how do you make sure that we're also protecting ourselves in that way? Yes, we can hire in a number of you know, PhDs that have epidemiology backgrounds and things like that, understand infectious diseases, but we also just want to be able to ask them questions where they are. So how do you build up those relationships along the way? And while we're successful, because it's a great mission, right, protecting the country from these sort of biosecurity threats really wants, helps people want to come and work with us. We also know that we need people out there who are sort of doing the work in other ways mm -hmm. that we can just tap into. And so those are probably two that I've been surprised about uh, areas that we've needed to grow in over the past couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Great points. I, I would um, just critical thinking skills. I mean, just, I mean, we, in, in the uniform uh, forces, uh, you know, over a million or so active duty, uh, close to two million with the, with the reserves. Uh, what I find is that um, having that ability to, you know, think critically about whatever it is, the problem that you're approaching, I think is, is going to become more uh, relevant going forward. It's always been relevant. I think it'll be more so. And you mentioned your wife's class, uh, computer science class, and they are, you know, kids are using um, coding and just get it to code for them. Uh, and then you, something comes out and you don't actually know why. Mm -hmm. And I think that curiosity and that ability to think about, you know, why or what uh, and why not, more importantly, uh, is, is going to be something that, and I, quite frankly, I don't know how you build it. Um, 
but I think we need to figure that out because AI is not going away. We're at the, you know, probably one or 2%, I think, of what, uh, in the end, it's going to be, um, the impact it's going to have. And it's having a huge impact right now. Uh, and I think we're just scratching the surface. But to be able to think critically about what you ought to be able to see and what you ought to uh, expect an outcome to be, uh, I think is going to be more critical as, uh, as we start dealing with adversaries who can utilize it in unethical ways uh, and in ways that we wouldn't imagine because of our own culture and, and the, the governance that we've put in it. Uh, and so being able to think critically about war fighting in general and then about just the different uh, phenomenologies that are out there, I think is going to be something that we need to really pay attention to as we grow the next generation. Uh, and your, your wife is, uh, you know, seeing that right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the, the, the thing that I tell students is they sort of, I think they come in expecting me to say like a particular skill set, like I want you to go right. major in this, right, right. you know, and I'm like, no, I need, we need every major. We need all majors. But what I try to encourage people to do is don't just stick within your singular major, Cro you know, cross train yourself in other places. If you're a technologist, go understand the analysts, go understand the writing and the communication. If you're in the, in the social sciences, international affairs, political science, make sure that you understand how things like AI and other emerging tech is going to allow you to do your work better, but also provide some challenges to the kind of work that you do. And so it's right. not really a matter of any one thing I need anyone to study. It's a matter of, all right, how do you make sure that you're sort of well-rounded, but also have your expertise, but understand how you're gonna partner best with others who have these different backgrounds. Yeah, that, I, I really like that point. And, and in fact, when um, I welcome all of our new hires coming into DIA CIO, uh, many ask that, that, that same question of, what should my career track look like? Mm -hmm. And you know, when I started, I started as a database administrator, and I'm saying this is part of my opening remarks in NGA and NEMA at the time. And I didn't understand the data. I understood the technology, but I didn't understand why I was doing it. And eventually, you know, I, I branched out, understood it more, and got on more of the collection management side of things, right? So I understood how technology applied to that, that certain function. Um, as, as we think about um, where the workforce needs to go in the future, um, definitely having a skill set across everything that we do allows for us to figure out how to integrate it and take it to the next step. As we think about the challenges we face, if we're only steeped in one discipline, we tend to just narrow the problem into that discipline and that yeah. discipline only. And so I think your point is excellent that we need a bunch of different skill sets, not just one, because the environment changes over time. Mm -hmm. To the point of leadership, so, um, and, and again, you're talking with students right after this, what advice would you have for the, the workforce as they develop in the future leaders? What, what have you learned as a leader in this community as you've kind of evolved from roles throughout time and, and where you sit today for both of you? What would have been some of your leadership best practices that you would share with, with folks? It, I, I'll start with the question at the beginning. What, what have I learned over you know, now uh, 43 years? Um, and and the, the one thing that I, I don't know when I learned it, I just noted it, it, it to be true. And that is the, the folks that are doing the mission actually can think and they can actually get the mission done if you give them the guidance that they need in order to allow them to actually utilize their skill sets. And I, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I, I think sometimes we don't want to tell the, the workforce something because we think it's too much, right? Like, like they don't really need to know the rest of the story. I think they do need to know the rest of the story because when they know the rest of the story, they can say, oh, if that is the case, then that's why this didn't happen that happened and this needs to happen. And then they can help you answer questions that you didn't even know were out there inside the organization because they have an understand, a better understanding of what it is that you're trying to have happen. And I've been in organizations where I've been a receiver of information from a leader uh, and you know, good leaders, but sometimes they withheld information because they, it's too much, right? I, they don't need to know that and I, uh, if you've ever worked with me, you know that I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking, what, more importantly, why I'm thinking like that. And, and I think that's just critical to leading a, an organization, especially a large organization where you have a disparate group of uh, individuals with different skill sets. If you have a, a very tight skill set, I think then, you know, you, you have less of a, 
less of a requirement to do that, but when you have a varied workforce, whether you have tech folks, you have folks that are analysts, folks that are doing other various things, I think because they, can, they need to be able to see themselves in whatever is happening at the time, whether it's a technological thing that's happening, someone who's not in that, they still need to understand why that's happening. Something as simple as, hey, we need to do a tech refresh. Well, to the people that are just utilizing the tech, they just don't want you to interrupt their work day, right? But if they understand what's gonna come after the tech refresh, and then they're more understanding of that, and then they can actually tell you, well, I have no issues with the way this is working now, and then you kind of explain that out to them, and I think that collaboration is what's gonna make you more relevant uh, going forward. And it's just gonna accelerate um, as we move forward. I mean, everything's changing, you know, it's, it's, you were, uh, Doug, or, um, John, you were talking about typing, you know, and, and doing that, and I was like, yeah, I remember doing that. I was doing it on a manual typewriter where you had to slap it and let it go back. <laughs> and I was thinking, I didn't have, there was no OCR at that time, but, um, but just looking forward, you know, at least I understood why I was doing something. And I think it made me a better productive uh, person or Marine at the time. So I, I, think, I think that's critical is, you know, the why part and making sure that it gets permeated throughout the organization. It's interesting. I was gonna actually use a different one, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna start at that, at that point because I also think it's the, the, the communication of when you know something and even when you don't know, mm -hmm. right. right? How important that is because of what I found with the workforce and I found in the climate surveys that we do, that people will create, and especially in our community, fill it in. <laughs> we will create the reason why if we're not told it. Right. And generally speaking, it's far worse than the real right. reason. Right. Yes. So it's better to actually be more transparent when you can. Now, there are times when you, when you can't. I remember leading through the pandemic, like there was, we didn't have answers for everything. And frankly, we just said that. Um, I don't know whether it was reassuring or not, but you know, at least people knew that we weren't hiding anything. In this situation, it's like when you can, you should provide more information because absolutely people will make it up. And I think the context really is helpful. I've seen that, especially as the variety of challenges and the things that just seem really, really, um, you know, the, 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 the timing of that kind of an right. upgrade or the timing of something that's gonna disrupt their work. Like they should know why it's happening and not just the fact of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, no, I was going to say that the thing I was going to say, though, was about relationships. Yeah. And over time, I think one, that's one of the things that I have. Um, it's reinforced year after year in each role that I'm in, the importance of not only developing, developing them, but maintaining them. I think as you get more senior in your career and you've been around, that you start seeing, you start having opportunities to work with people for the second right. time around. Right. And assuming that you didn't burn the bridge when you worked with them the first time around, <laughs> having them in place is really uh, useful. Yeah. Being able to start at a level of, all right, I don't have to sort of you know, start with the courtesies and getting to know you. We can jump right in and solve whatever the problem is. And that's been that's really true. helpful in this particular role. All right. I mean, for, for the military, I mean, I, we're up and out, so we get, we get to see that. But it is very comforting to walk into a room and, and you know, and there's a lot of uncertainty. You look across the table and you go, ah, oh, thank God, you know, she's there. Right. And you go, okay, it's going to be all right. At least it's going to be all right for us to. Um, <laughs> but, but it really, that, those relationships really do matter. And, uh, and I, that, is, that is something I think that sometimes can be looked at as transactional, but for me, it is a comforting thing to look across the room and see people that I know are professional, who know, know their trade, and who more importantly are doing it because they know it's the right thing to do. Uh, and, and so that is reassuring, yeah. uh, for sure. So, yeah, so we, you mentioned a comforting situation. Let's talk about uncomforting, for, if that's a word. I don't know if that's a word, <laughs> yeah. but let's say it is. Um, uncomfortable is probably the word that I'm looking for. Um, it, <laughs> Make up words. That's good. Yeah, that's that's good. Uh, so when, when folks ask me about you know, my career and I talk about it, I often refer to more uncomfortable situations, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's actually the, the worst experiences that I have that seem horrible at the time end up being the best experiences and the biggest growth opportunities. And those are the things that I talk about. You know, when I, when I speak to our incoming workforce, actually tell stories about those uncomfortable situations and how it ended up, you know, actually being positive for me and enhancing my career. Is there, are there situations in your career, is there one that you think about that you look back on and you say, that was, 
a really horrible experience, but at the end of the day, that actually worked out for me or for the organization. Question is, which, which of the many? I was going to say, <laughs> I can know five of them right now, but yeah. What's your top one? Uh, you have one? Okay. Uh, okay, so mine was, um, um, I was at um, the Marine Corps Command and Staff College. I was a major uh, years ago, and um, I was applying, I applied for the School of Advanced Warfighting. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, the, those folks were looked at as, you know, the quintessential warrior, you know, planner, and, you know, you saw them rise among, uh, in the ranks, and uh, they were doing good work. So I wanted to do that. You had to compete for it, and you had to be interviewed. So I go into this interview, and um, there's a um, couple of professors there, civilians, there's one army colonel who was on the staff of the Marine uh, War College at the time, command and staff college, and then one other uh, Marine lieutenant uh, colonel there, and a major sitting across. And they start asking me questions that I thought had nothing to do with advanced war fighting or anything. It had nothing to do with anything. Um, and and I literally, um, in the middle of the, in the, middle of the uh, interview, I just said, I'm done. And I got up and walked out. I said, I, I'm done. And I got up and walked out. And I was like, OK, this is probably it. I'm probably done, truly done. And, um, but what happened was I obviously did not get accepted to the program. <laughs> Imagine that. But, but what, I, what happened after that was about a month later, uh, I got an assignment that changed the course of my, uh, my career. I, I was sent down to what's now NSA San Antonio as a, as a commander of the Marines down there, and that put me on a trajectory to where I am now. And if I had become a, a, war, a School of Advanced Warfighting graduate, I probably would have retired as a colonel because uh, for those of you who know about uh, that program, most of the folks uh, in that program usually top out about uh, mm -hmm. colonel. Uh, it's a great program, but uh, yeah. anyway, that, I'll tell you the story if you want to hear it. <laughs> It's much more than what I just said. But it's a good story. I, I think the, what, the, the one that I want to highlight, and it, it's, it's sort of about, sort of, it is about communication and it's about understanding your audience. Mm -hmm. And I think I've sort of, I continue to unfortunately learn this lesson in different ways throughout the course of the career. So the, 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 big, the first time was when I went from the Hill to NGA. Mm -hmm. And I think I've talked about this before. It was really that first budget cycle. I came in as legislative affairs director. I knew the Hill, I knew what NGA needed to do and we were gonna go right and do that. And that's what I pitched. It was not so well received mm -hmm. because I had forgotten that so many other people had their own experiences with the Hill and the things that they knew to be true were inconsistent with what I was saying was true, mm -hmm. which was a little bit about the information and the materials that they were putting forward, whether they were used or not. So I learned the hard way that you really can't underestimate and just assume that because you're the expert coming into a room that you're going to be listened to, you still need to make the case of why you should be listened to, why, especially if you're trying to change something. I think today the lesson is a bit more about when your audience, it, again, knowing your audience, but this time it's, it's knowing how to best give them the information that they need. And I, I, see, uh, I see briefers coming in all the time um, with I think the surprise of how detailed some of the customers that they're briefing are and unable to then sort of make that change from the high level senior executive uh, level that they were coming in to no, no, we wanna be in the weeds and how do you manage that? And then getting frustrated right. that we wanna have this kind of information when it's really, it's sort of our nature. I'm an engin engineer, my boss, physicist and a lawyer. So you know, you've got these people who've got all sorts of backgrounds that are bringing in that want to understand what you're saying and know that frankly, when we then go out and have to talk about the thing, and if we're in a place where we can't bring our expert with us, we have to understand it at this level. And so how do you make sure that you are able to communicate to whatever the audience is, not only what you want them to hear, but what they want to hear and what they're gonna need if they have to go and talk to even people more senior than they are. And so it's a bit about just knowing the audience and always being extremely prepared uh, to be able to go through 
whatever is asked of you in those situations. Yeah. I, and Doug, I, I fail to say what I learned from that experience. I just said what the experience was. <laughs> Dr. Dixon explained, you know, what the learning was. So the learning for me was, you know, be who you are. You're not any, anything else. And then you have principles, understand what your principles are and, and live by those principles. And that's, it reinforced that. My, my mom taught me that but it really reinforced it that day and, and, and it helped me uh, along the way, so, yeah. Yeah, and Dr. Dixon, to your point of, you know, uh, your experience on the Hill, I always tell uh, folks when, when I'm asked that question, the jobs that I think I know a lot about or have the experience in that I go to are actually the, probably the, the least favored jobs in my view, that uh, favorable jobs that I've, I've had the experience, just because I had a certain picture of what I thought it would be and then it doesn't end up being that way. It's the jobs that I know nothing about and go in with an open mind, right, that actually end up being, being the best experiences. Yeah. So, and I think that's, that's what I heard you say as well, right, of knowing your audience, and part of knowing your audience is to come in objectively, True. right, and really understand it from their perspective. So, General Henry, you, you know, over 40 years in your career, retiring soon, right? June. As you look back on your career. <laughs> <laughs> What, what would you say you're most proud of? And I'll have the same question for you as well, of being PDDI or, or the history of your career and anything. What, what do you look back and say, I'm really proud that we accomplished that? Just uh, empowering the people that work for me. I, I, everywhere I go, I try to do that. And you know, some of them are in the audience um, out here today. And when I see them, just their accomplishments, to be able to, to know what they were aiming for, and then being able to help enable that, or at least encourage it. Uh, I think, to me, that's just, it's just so, it's just so good to see it. Uh, and I think most people see that, right? If, you, if you've served with someone or, or worked with someone, and you know what their ambition was, and you, you know, they ask you for advice, and you, know, you do whatever you do in order to help them, but to see them be successful is just incredible. And um, you know, a couple of couple of folks over the years that I've seen uh, grow up in the Marine Corps and, and inside government service, I, I get to see them, you know, become senior executives. I get to see them become three-star generals. In fact, uh, it's just uh, exhilarating. And uh, for me, it's all about empowering people. And uh, I wish I was able to do it earlier in my career. But you know, the more influence you get, the more you can empower folks. So, but it, it's been it's been an honor to do that. And as, as you, you look back, do you feel, again, whether in your current role or, or former, of there's unfinished business? Is there anything that's hanging out there that you just wish you could have got to, but the time just isn't there to accomplish it? You got eight months. Yeah, I got eight months. Still got, still got time. <laughs> um, you know, I, um, no, I'm, no, I'm pretty content. I think I gave it a, you know, I gave it 100% every day, so. Yeah. I am what I am. How about you, Dr. Dixon? Ooh. I'm going to do the, the two with the, so there's some really cool technology that I've been a part of or enabled in many ways, and I am going to always remember that really fondly, and the things that it was able to do for the community, like that will be something that I won't forget. Uh, but I'm with you on the people, because I think that is probably the thing that I will, uh, that will also go. Those, those conversations you had that, that changed the course of someone else's career, because you saw something in them and you encouraged them and they took a, they took a, they took a, made a decision, they took a role, they volunteered for a Tiger team, whatever the case is, they took on something that they would not have done absent that conversation and seeing what that was able to do for their career going forward. Those are absolutely the most rewarding, uh, sure. personally, of, of the things that I've had, that, that I've been part of in my career. Yeah, and, and same question that I had for General Henry, any, any unfinished business that you, you oh can, yeah, you can see that. Man, I wish I could get to that, but I'm still working on it. Yeah. Uh, you know, life's a little up in the air at the moment, so we'll kind of see how much time I have left to, to be able to do some great things. But um, I have some things that I'm we're trying to get done. We've got some policies we're trying to push across the line um, that I think will help our community greatly. We've got some governance 
that we're trying to put in place so that future people in the roles that we're in have a bit easier ability to oversee some of the things that we're responsible for. Yeah. And so uh, we're going to work as hard as we can and as smart as we can in the time that's, that we have to actually get those things done. All right. Hey, I, I got something for Dr. Dixon now. Uh -oh. oh, you're going to ask questions so, too. Okay. No, I mean, she, <laughs> she, may be able, she may be able to help us think through it, but the defense intelligence enterprise, mm -hmm. you know, we've been working on this enterprise, trying to build it out for a long time. And I contend that the E in enterprise is still a small E. It's not a capital E. Mm -hmm. And the things that we need to do in order to make it an, uh, the capital E uh, our partner integration, uh, we still need the governance that I think is lacking. And although the D is for defense, it's, we have a, the intel in there as well. So anything, uh, Dr. Dixon, that uh, you can do to help us uh, capitalize on the strength of the enterprise and actually make it so that uh, it is something that is robust, uh, includes our allies and partners uh, in a way that allows us to fight and win you know, in the future. because. If we don't get it right, then we will be hamstrung uh, going forward. And right now, it is not right. Yeah. We say we have a defense intel enterprise. We do, uh, but it is not able to function to its maximum capacity uh, because of uh, just some of the impediments that are there, the governance piece, the technology piece, uh, integration, and of course, uh, bringing our partners in in a way that's yeah allows them to maximize their capability in this fight as well. So I, I guess I do have some unfinished business, but it's much more broader than me. Yeah, yeah. and I, I would agree completely that, that that's the place where we know that whatever a future fight we might find ourselves in is gonna require us to be working together mm -hmm. far more seamlessly than we are right now. Right. With, with systems that talk with information that we can pass more easily. And you know, that's gonna actually end up relying a lot on the folks here in this audience, mm -hmm. to the, the teams that you lead, the teams that CIOs and, and CISOs that are out there, uh, and CDOs that are out there, to be able to help us know what investments we need to make on the technology. Because if you can connect people, yes. that barrier to communication goes away. Uh, and we've, we've had different systems and, and I, I think, Building a single thing is always hard. Building things that are interoperable is not as hard, and we must make sure that that is a part of everything that we do going forward. Right, and that, that's a great point. And you know, as an engineer, you'd appreciate the definition of a system as interrelated components working together towards a common objective, whether that's an organization, a, a community like this, or an IT system. Um, yeah, it's the interfaces that make everything come together, and they have yeah. to be designed that way. They do. Well, thank you both very much for, for taking the time to, to not only be on this panel, but to be here and, and answer questions. And, and again, for spending you know, time meeting folks and, and really helping to understand all the capabilities that are out there. And, and for your leadership, both of you and the respective communities that you help lead. Very much appreciate it and thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, Dan. All right, thank you. Okay. Oh. Thank you. All right. Oh. All right. Oh. Take that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dixon, Lieutenant General Henry, and Mr. Casa for that insightful discussion. At this time, we will take a short break before our next round of speakers at 1100. As a reminder, the exhibit hall is open, and we will see you back here at 1100 sharp. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Chief Petty Officer Kyle Peterson, uh, and it's my pleasure to be serving as one of the MCs this year. Our next speaker is no stranger to the city of Omaha. Congressman Don Bacon has represented Nebraska's 2nd District in the United States House of Representatives since 2016, and currently serves on the House Armed Service Committee. Earlier this year, Congressman Bacon was named the chairman of the Hask Cyber Information and Technology and Innovation Subcommittee following his chairmanship uh, of the committee's Military Quality of Life panel. Prior to being elected to the Congress, Representative Bacon served in the United States Air Force for nearly 30 years, culminating in the rank of Brigadier General, where he specialized in electronic warfare, intelligence, and airborne reconnaissance. Please welcome Representative Bacon. Yes. 
show the love always hot underneath the covers Still talk to you, my daddy and say Said you ain't seen nothing till you're down on the muffin And you sure to be a change in your ways I met a cheerleader was a real young Well, hello everybody, and if, if you're going to walk out, might as well walk out to Aerosmith, don't you think? I, I, did fi- I was a commander five times, and they would say, what do you want to play for your, you know, when you take command? And back in the saddle. <laughs> Aerosmith. And I said, that's unique. Nobody does that. I go, well, that, that's how I like to do it. I want to thank uh, Chief Petty Officer Peterson for the welcome. And uh, Doug Costa, the CIO, thank you for welcoming me here today. And uh, we also have uh, General Henry, uh, the J2. So welcome to everybody here. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Omaha real fast. You may have heard it from Senator Fisher and a few others. But Forbes rates us the number one place to live. And we have the fastest growing economy in the United States right now at 9% GDP growth. And so if you're like me, I did 30, nearly 30 years in the Air Force. I picked this place, so I hope I see all the uniforms out here. We got a house for you. We'll bring you out and put you right here at home, okay? You got it? So uh, but welcome here. Hopefully, you, if you get a chance, go down to the old market. It's, we got about 100 bars and restaurants down there. We've got the best, museum, or the best zoo uh, in the world. And if you've you got a car, go to the Sack Museum. It's on the west side of town. But there's tons of good stuff to do. I've lived 16 places in, in the Air Force, had 16 assignments, I should say. I joined the Air Force in 1985. Uh, anybody here went to Lowry Air Force Base? Got a couple of Lowry back. There we go. So the, the, the older, uh, oh, I have to say the younger folks. No, I don't know. But I went to Lowry. And... My wife and I were newly married, and they go, where do you want to be assigned? And I said, and they, they said by the way, if you're top one or two graduate in your class, you'll likely get your assignment, right? And so uh, I said, well, I want to go anywhere overseas. I want to see the world. I'm a farm boy from Illinois, right? I was corn and soybeans, beef cattle, and, uh, and I didn't travel a whole lot. I got to travel a little bit. And uh, so I really worked hard at, at Lowry, and I ended up being the number one graduate. And I got my wife there. I said, Angie, we're going to get Korea or Japan, Germany. Because I said anywhere overseas, and they said they'd accommodate if you're number one or two. And I opened it up off at Air Force Base. <laughs> and my wife goes, are they called the corn huskers? Yeah. Are, you were a corn farmer, right? I go, yeah. <laughs> so, but we loved it. And so today I got three kids living here on my four. I got eight grandkids. My mother-in-law moved in here. My father-in-law moved in here. Uh, sister-in-law, my nephew moved in. He runs all the five guys. So we're just taking, taking the place over. Uh, my last assignment was in the A2, and I had a JWix, a sipper, and a nipper all on the desk. I just had to make sure I was on the right one, you know, doing the right, right stuff at the right, the right computer at the right time. But I appreciate what you all do, is the bottom line. So I have a, really two messages for you up front, then I want to talk about the world a little bit and how I see it being on the Armed Services Committee. But I want to thank you, for, and t- Taylor, the first part of my message for you uh, in the DOTUS community here. First of all, if you, if you haven't heard it, enough here today and while you're here, I'm going to tell you again. What you do is vitally important. I'm a, jo- I'm a John Boyd guy, trained in that, steeped in that, you know, with the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act. We can't do that without the, the top secret communications that you provide. Our commanders got to get the information fast. They got to decide and they have to execute. Without you, it does not happen. So I hope you know what you do is vitally important. To win our wars, you have to be told, you, we, we need you to be successful. And uh, so I want to praise you right up front. The second thing I want to communicate is I ask you not to be overconfident. I, I, was, I studied war history. I've studied it since I was 10 years old. My grandmother gave me a World War II book. I read it about 20 times. I got hooked. I was reading war history for, for my, all my teenage years and in college, and I obviously love doing it in the Air Force. I think the, his, the history of war will tell us that our opponents are better than what we think in getting into our networks. And there's so much history. I just thought I'd pull out three or four as a reminder that we need, need to be not overconfident with what you're doing. We need you to be overzealous and overvigilant at what you're doing. But just, I was, my, one of my favorite generals is General Grant. And in 1862, Colonel Grant, now Brigadier General Grant, had won the first battles for the North. Uh, otherwise, the North was losing other, other battles in other parts of the uh, country. But he, was, he won his first battles in Missouri, then Kentucky and, and Tennessee. So he's getting all this praise in the press. And it made one guy particularly angry. That was General Halleck, a two-star, his boss, right? And so he was jealous. Why is you know, this guy's working for me? I should be getting all the credit. 
right? I'm the guy that's running the Western Division out here. So, but General Halleck told General Grant, Brigadier General Grant, I want daily updates. It's, you know, so they had the telegraph. I want daily updates, what you're doing, what your manpower, what's your plans. And General Grant was a very, uh, you know, he followed orders. But he was sending daily updates to General Halleck, but there was a Confederate sympathizer working the telegraph. And he was intentionally ensuring that General Halleck got none of these updates. And General Halleck, what did he think? He thinks uh, General, General Grant's being you know, insubordinate. And he's, so he sends a note to General McClellan, way out, way out east, saying, I think General Grant's drinking again, and I want to fire him. And General, Grant, and General McClellan's like, fire him, right? So we, we came within, a, okay, so, but he decided not to fire him. He decided to make him his deputy and put a General Smith in charge of the actual unit down there. But, you know, General Grant didn't want to be a deputy. He, did not, you know, he didn't do anything as a deputy. Any deputies in here? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't want to. I was a deputy, but you know, I, I, my job was to help kick people's butt and, and let the, uh, the, the main guy run, run the, think big. My, guy, my, my job was to make sure things were running on time in the office there as a deputy, but uh, Joe Grant did not like being a deputy. And he, he had no control tr forces, and that was what he was meant to do. He was getting ready to resign, move back to Illinois, and Gerald Sherman came in and talked him out of it. And, uh, but think about how the war would have changed. But the, my point is here, we had a, a Southern sympathizer in the command chain of communications, and nobody knew it for years, right? Think about, Germany said their coding, their enigma was impenetrable. In 1944, we were reading the mail before Hitler was reading his mail. Japan had no idea we were reading their, their codes, and it helped lead us to victory in the Battle of Midway. There is unclassified stuff that there shows that at times we were reading the Soviet codes and they didn't know it until they figured it out. Then they killed somebody, whoever, whoever showed the vulnerability. Then we had a guy named by John Walker. Anybody remember John Walker? He was a Navy guy who gave up our codes in the Navy and allowed the Soviets for years to track our command and control with the Navy. And I'm just, I just wanted, I, I, when I talk to some of our folks that go down, it's impossible. I don't, I don't think nothing's impossible when it comes to communications and getting into our communications, cyber, people with thumb drives, and you know, I just go on and on. So if I could, a tailored message to you all today in DOTUS is what you do is vitally important. Without you, we cannot win our nation's wars. And please don't be overconfident. We need you to be overzealous and overvigilant. Because the bad guys are smart. They are very smart. And they can put a lot more manpower on these things than we can. China, China's got, you know, 1.4 billion people. By the way, a declining population. It, so their, their demographics are putting them in a, a, a they're going to have some huge challenges in the future competing with us uh, if you look at it. So it's not, they're not 10 foot tall. But bottom line is they can put a lot of manpower attacking our networks, and they are. And, so, and Russia's working that hard too. And I, as you know, Iran... Recently, it was going after President Trump's communication. So China was doing this too recently, the former president. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough world out there. Now I'd like to back up, and I want to go to the 10,000-foot level and just talk about what I see coming out of the Armed Services Committee uh, or the Armed, Armed, Services, Armed Services Committee and just talk about what the, what the world's looking like in my perspective. Because we're all here. We're part of the warfighting team. I think the world is on fire. It is the most dangerous environment we've had in decades. Russia's invasion of Ukraine was brazen. It was barbaric. Putting their thumb right in our, right in our eye saying, we're gonna invade this, our neighbor, and we don't, we don't fear you, America. That's how I look at it. You got an unholy alliance right now between Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. And I don't think they're a formal alliance. They are in some cases, you know, bilaterally, but they're all working together. You got China buying Iranian fuel, which helps prop up their economy. China's buying Russian energy, helping Russia with their financial uh, needs. You got Iran selling drones to Russia. By the way, Israel just hit that plant. Good job, Israel. Uh, you have uh, North Korea sending, uh, I've seen different numbers, maybe 3,000 troops to help 
uh, now I guess they're in the Kursk area now as of this morning. And you got the, they're providing 155 millimeter or 157 millimeter shells, whatever the, the, the main artillery shells that Russia uses. They're providing drones as well to Russia. The, these, these folks are, are working together. And they're, what's their goal? They want to have a new world order with not, with, without America being the lead. They don't, they, their world order does not envision democracy, does not envision free market system, does not envision dignity of the, of the human being, rule of law. Their vision is where they, rule, where they can dominate their neighbors. And, and in China's case, wants to be the world superpower in 10, 20 years, where, where right makes might. This is their, that's their vision. Or, or, excuse me, let me take that back. Where might makes right. Where, where power at the end of the gun is ultimately what's going to be decided. And it's going to be decided in their favor. This is what we're facing right now in America. And I traveled recently to Ukraine uh, just last month. This is a war of attrition. It's gridlock. I think this was precipitated by Afghanistan, in my view, which I served in Afghanistan and I lost five friends there, and I, to, the, to this day, I'm chagrined with how we pulled out. But what I really fear what happened when we pulled out of Iran, or excuse me, out of Afghanistan, was that the world saw weakness, and I think it, it incentivized or encouraged Putin to do what he did later with Ukraine. I think it's, uh, it lowered the deterrence effect that Iran has had looking at us. And I think this is why this world is a more dangerous place. I think it started with Afghanistan, in my view. But traveling to Ukraine, it's a war of attrition. We need to be giving them the most, the, you know, the more attackums, more precision, more. And we need to take the ROEs off, off of Ukraine so they can attack the airfields that are attacking their cities. Because if it goes much longer, this war of attrition, there's always so much Ukraine can do. We've got to help Ukraine prevail now. In my, this is my opinion. If Ukraine falls, our national security interests are injured. They're hurt. You're going to have Russia more so on the border of NATO. I think Moldova will be taken next. I think the Baltics will be threatened. You'll see what's going to happen with Georgia. I mean, I, we have to prevail here. Ukraine's doing the bleeding, but we've got to help them win with the weapons and technology. Let's, and let's stop putting our force and put them to fight with one arm you know, behind their back. Because that's the way it appears to me right now, what we're doing. I was just there, as I was mentioned, and it's mind-boggling the technology changes that are going on there. And we need to be very cognizant of what's going on. They have a thousand small drones flying at any given time. A thousand. They have kamikaze drones. They got drones that carry two bombs on them. They have drones that ram other drones. They have drones that are doing reconnaissance and intelligence. They have drones that are delivering food to the troops in the front lines. Pretty impressive. And what bothers me is when you talk to Ukrainian frontline folks, they say our drones aren't competitive. And that's, that's an embarrassment. I, so we got to look inwardly. What are, we, we, we need to take stock of that and ensure that our industry is pushing the envelope here. Because why should Ukraine and Russia both be relying on Chinese drones, right? We should be there helping with our drones and help, China, help Ukraine prevail. I was up there with the sea drones. Ukraine today has sea supremacy. And they did it without a single ship in the Black Sea. 19 Russian ships have been sunk. And a lot of them through sea drones. Not, and some of them were through ballistic missiles. But uh, uh, we need to be watching that technology and realize that every 30 days, there's new iterations on these weapons. Because if, if you don't keep up, you get beat. And that's, that's what's going on there. What's going on in, with Iran, that Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, all focused on Israel. It is my opinion, those... The enemies of Israel are our adversaries as well. They would just assume due to us what they tried to do to Israel. And it's of my view, too, that we need to be helping out Israel win quickly and get this thing over with. But what Iran has done, 110 ballistic missiles in one attack, 180 in another attack. Now, I worked there, I worked when I was part of 3rd Air Force in 2009, 10, and 11, helped put in the aero defense system with the radar and our infrared satellite system. Isn't it amazing that we have a 99% PK on 110 ballistic missiles and 180 ballistic missiles? I'm so uh, encouraged by the success of our ballistic missile defense stuff that we helped Israel uh, put in. And then we got China. China 
is eyeballing Taiwan, watching how we handle Israel, watching how we handle Iran, watching how we handle Ukraine. Again, I'm saying the world is on fire and we need to be at our best. What is our role? I think it's important that we have a strategy and a vision of what America should look like. America is the indispensable power for freedom. Nobody can replace us, but we need good allies. We, got to, we can't do it by ourselves. So my vision is, as a country that is the leader for freedom, democracy, free markets, rule of law, defending these values, but also working and building up our allies. NATO is vitally important. Canada, Australia, Japan, hopefully India down the road. But it's going to take a coalition of freedom-loving nations to stand up against these four countries that are lining up against us. So what's the challenges that are making it hard for us to do this? I'm going to, down, I'm going to go from 10,000 feet to maybe 20,000 feet. I think the, US, the current budget that we have is inadequate to do what we need to do. We're spending 3.1% of our GDP on defense. It's the second lowest going back to World War II. It was only lower under Bill Clinton. And I submit to you today that 3.1% GDP does not allow us to do the Sentinel missile, the B-21, the new boomer submarines, the stealth technologies that we need, the size Navy that we need, and the quality of life that we need for our military. If we want to do the appropriate pay, fix the dorms, and do all these weapon systems, 3.1% does not cut it. And I will tell you, when I sit in these committees, and I hear from the executive branch, but I also hear it from our own side on the legislative branch. We have a budget, they say, that is made to counter China. And I just think it's smoke and mirrors. We've got to be candid. 3.1% does not do it. And we should be saying as military services or as the, or as the leaders of the joint, joint chiefs, with the budget you're given as Congress at 3.1, this is what we can do, but this is what we're not doing. And I don't hear that. I always hear this is adequate, or this is going to be fine. And I'm just I just think we've got to have transparency here if we want to counter China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and take care of our troops. We have a huge cyber threat, which comes back to what you got, what you all work on. We're being attacked every day. I, I do the military cyber, but I work closely with the Homeland Security Cyber uh, Subcommittee. It is my bill that put the Homeland Security and the CISA in charge of everything non-defense to help all of our private industry, our, our, our infrastructure, to defend ourselves from these attacks. And we're being attacked every day. I got my son's like the number two guy at ConAgra for doing cyber there. They're being attacked every day. But there is no doubt that the Russians and Chinese, Iran, Iranians, North Koreans, to a lesser extent, on day one of a war, want to take down our energy grid. They want to take down our Wall Street, uh, you know, communicate, our, all, you know, all our banking and financial and just create chaos in our country. And that threat is real. Uh, I think I feel better about it from the military side, what we can do, but uh, on the private sector side and our infrastructure side, uh, we, we, it is my firm belief, and I know General Hawk, he was a colonel when I was a one star. I think we have the best cyber offense in the world, but we have the most digital communications too that we rely on, makes us most vulnerable. And uh, so we, are, we have the work cut out for us there. By the way, my, a year ago, 14 months ago, my, my private email was hacked by China. And it was interesting. I got a call from the FBI. They go, hey, Don, we want to see you uh, at 4 o'clock. I go, do I need my lawyers? <laughs> and they said, no, you're, you're fine. I said, yeah, I've heard that before from others. <laughs> but anyway, they were, they were calling to tell me, hey, you were hacked, along with the Secretary of Commerce, the Secretary of State, and the U.S. Ambassador of China, the four of us. Pretty crazy. And I was like, why, why me? And the FBI director, or it was... The attorney general said, Don, they don't like you. <laughs> I, I have a tendency to talk about Uyghurs and Tibetans and things like that. So, but the, the cyber threat's real, and that's why I say, again, don't be overconfident. We need you to be overzealous and overvigilant. We got huge concerns with our defense industrial base. We've learned with Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan right now that we can't produce weapons fast enough. So we, we need to have a plan to ramp up our defense industrial base, but also work with our allies, like the Czech Republic, which is we're very good at some of these munitions we need, and others out there. This should not be a US alone thing, but we gotta be working with our allies and know that just in time, inventory for war, it don't work. We need, we need, we need supplies, we need backup supplies. 
The all-volunteer force is under strain. You know, we've particularly been struggling with the Army and the Navy side of this. Uh, but we got to ask ourselves, why is this going on? I just saw an article today that a lot of veterans or people currently serving are telling their children that are nearing of age of 18 that they don't want them to join. It's like a first. Many of our new recruits are those who served. And so we've got to look at our, ourselves and ask, why are we seeing a reluctance? And I think there's three or four different reasons. I think Afghanistan was a part of it, and I think we're coming out of that. But for a couple of years, people who served multiple times in Afghanistan and then saw what we did really affected their morale. Like we saw a huge increase in mental health uh, issues and in this area because people lost their friends there, they served there, and then we just pulled the plug the way we did, and it, and it, it created, a, created a two or three year ripple effect in our military. I also think it's very important that we communicate to our, our military and to the American people that our military is there is to kick anybody's ass, to serve the greatest country in the world, and no, and no ins or buts about it. And we've got to be clear about what that's our mission. And I think we don't do that clearly enough right now. There's an impression when you walk around the Midwest that there's too much social engineering going on. And I'm not, I think it's over-exaggerated, but that perception's out there. and we, we need to correct it. I think the quality of life is a problem. When you have people on food stamps and SNAP serving the military, it's not right. We should, that, that's why I propose a, pay, pay, a targeted pay raise for junior enlisted. We have dorms that are getting failing grades. Right? It's, it's, that's, if I was a wing commander, well, I was at Ramstein and Offutt, if I would have had a dorm with a failing grade, I would have got fired. Joel Brady would have fired me on the spot, the four star. And he walked through my dorms about once or twice a month. And, but there's so, and we have, okay, the number one demographic for unemployment today are our spouses and our military spouses. So, you know, they're being underpaid. We're not, we're not able to get the spouses employment. People are waiting two months for health care. Now, I, was, I sat on this panel and I was the chairman of it uh, for the quality of life panel and we came up with 31 recommendations to improve the quality of life. About a $5 billion price tag over time, but that's what we need if we want to recruit and retain America's best. And, but we have a problem right now with our all volunteer force so we gotta acknowledge it. We have an aging infrastructure. I found out that the military services were redirecting about 10 to 15% of the money for dorms and barracks to weapon systems. You do that over 10 years, you have an aging infrastructure now. And we have a bill at about $140 billion to fix aging infrastructure. And that's what happens when you redirect money over time. And, and it was something Congress was not aware of, and, which I think was wrong. It was a mistake in leadership, I view. You got, this is where we need these honest discussions, where they tell Congress, hey, with the budget you're giving us, this is what we can do, this is what we're not doing. But we were not having these discussions the way we should have. I think we're vulnerable to hypersonic attack. We have hypersonic weapons that the Chinese Russians do that can hit us in 15 minutes. And even if they're not nuclear tipped, imagine a weapon hitting the Pentagon at Mach 7 that's accurate. And so what I have learned is we don't have a good detection and tracking system on hyper hypersonics. I think we've got to invest in that. We need to know when Russia fires one or China fires one, where it's going and what, where, it, where it's at, so we know how to respond. Which takes me to more to our, our nuclear readiness. I, I, we, we got a plan to spend for all three of the triad, but I'm, I think we need to take this threat real that we can be hit in 15 minutes. And if we want to have deterrence, we need to communicate to the Russian Chinese no matter what you do, we can absolutely survive you trying to t decapitate us and we can strike back. And I think we got to raise our game here. And this is my view. I'm a, I'm a, I feel like I'm John the Baptist on this. Seth Moulton's with me on this. But I think we need to go back to a 24-7 EC-130 or you know, an airborne command post that's always up in the air that can always respond. I was a, a one star on that mission, but we, were, we had them on ground alert with a 15-minute reaction time. We need to have some capability where we, we know there's always a survivable command outside of the bases that could be targeted. So I want to take us to the 30,000 foot level. I've laid out the threats, I laid out the problems, and I think it's, and it's in my view, 3.1% GDP doesn't do it, but what is preventing us from solving these issues? Because we're Americans, we have a can-do spirit. We've overcome worse. But right now there's two things that are really constraining us right now. One of it is we have a $35 trillion debt 
and this year was $2.1 trillion deficit. And the interest payments are exceeding our military budget for the first time ever. That should alarm us. When you look at, uh, when you look at our debt to GDP ratio, it's a red flag. But we have to have an honest discussion. And, and right now in this hyper-partisan environment, nobody wants us to put their nose out there or step out into it. 72% of our spending today is mandatory spending. 28% is discretionary. Every year that mandatory spending goes up as a share. That makes it harder to spend more on defense. Half of our discretionary budget goes to defense. But with each year with, with the mandatory spending creeping up, it's harder and harder to fund the military to the level that we need to do. And we said to be candid with each other, why is this? Well, it used to be 15 workers for every retiree in 1950. We're soon to be two workers for every retiree. And with the withholdings that we take out, it's not enough. But we gotta have an honest discussion. It's gonna have to take Republicans and Democrats working together to do win-wins, lose, I mean, wins, losses together. Both sides are gonna win some and lose some to solve this problem. That's the only way that we're gonna be able to do it. If we don't solve this problem, we're not gonna be able to get the military that we need to, to be the world's leader for freedom. And I already touched on it. What's underlining all of this is the hyperpartisanship that our country has right now. There's no reason why we should hate Americans more than we hate the Taliban or that we hate Putin or that we hate the mullahs in Iran. They're the real enemies. It's not the guy across the street that has a different yard sign. And unfortunately, but with the social media today and the various segmented cable, the, the hate is being directed towards fellow Americans, but you can't work with fellow Americans that you hate. And we must remind ourselves that we still live in the greatest country in the world with the greatest economy, the greatest freedoms, with the, with the opportunity to climb the ladder, no matter what fa kind of family you were raised in, hard work and character allows you to achieve your dreams. The American dream's still there. Our quality of life is still there, but most Americans don't realize it because they're living in a world where there's too much anger and hate towards fellow Americans. So I want to close with a positive thought. Only 5% of mankind have ever lived in freedom. When you look, go back to the original history of the original known history, only one in 20 people have ever lived have had freedoms like we've had. We are blessed. Freedom is rare, it's precious. I think it's also, you gotta protect it, right? It's, uh, there's, it's always being under attack. We can't forget that, we, that we're part of that 5%. And that 1% of our nation day is serving in uniform to ensure that we remain at that 5%. So those who are serving today in uniform, I say thank you. Uh, you got the torch. Uh, I handed it off 10 years ago. And I know we got a lot of veterans in here. You're part of the 6% of our population who served and have left our great country to the 1% who are serving today and have kept us in that 5% of mankind that have had freedom. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to say thank you again for ensuring that our commanders get the most current information as fast as possible and that you're able to communicate back to our troops and forces their decisions. What you do helps us win our nation's wars. Let's protect this great network, protect these, this capability from China, Russia, and all these folks who want to undermine it. And that's, and that's our mission here. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Omaha again. Thank you for being, uh, visiting this place. We'd love to have you here every year. And so God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Give you a salute. Thank you, Representative Bacon, for those uh, passionate remarks. Um, next, we'll be hearing from our intelligence integration panel, featuring several of our combatant commands J2s and J6s, moderated by Lieutenant General Henry. At this time, please give a warm welcome to all of our panelists. There must be some kind of way out of here. Say the joker to the thief. There's too much confusion. I can't get no relief. 
business man there to drink my wine. Plowman, dig my earth. Yes, sir. None will ever own the mine. Nobody of it is worth. Hey. No. Thank you. Mike. Please stop. All right. Uh, well, I get to, um, to moderate a, an august panel here today. Um, those seats, very, by the way, are very uncomfortable. Um, I don't know if you noticed when I was standing here before how uncomfortable I looked. It's because the seat is very uncomfortable. I can't even imagine what it's like sitting back there. It's got to be even, even different. Uh, but, but again, um, thanks to uh, Mr. Casa and uh, the whole DIA team for uh, hosting this and giving us an opportunity uh, to talk about some uh, particular topics on war fighting and how uh, the, the folks that actually utilize what you provide uh, put those to use and, and hopefully hear from them on some of the things that they need from you and from industry and our partners uh, that are in the audience. Uh, but before we do that, um, right now on, on the stage are panelists uh, that represent the various commands and parts and, and different parts of the world. And so I'm going to ask each one of them to give you a quick overview of the AOR and kind of end with, the, with just one, because there'll be other times where you can tell them what else you need. But one thing that um, you have as a technical challenge inside your organization. So we'll start on this end with Mo. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Brigadier General Mo Calabresi, Director of Intelligence at U.S. Northern Command and the North American Aerospace Defense Command. So I actually have two hats, NORAD and NORTHCOM. So I have two AORs. Uh, on the NORAD side, it's a binational command, the only one in the world between us and Canada to defend North America. So it goes out, obviously, North America and air defense identification zones about 150 miles off the coasts in the Canadian archipelago. And then in U.S. NORTHCOM, uh, imagine, again, homeland defense, number one, and that would include all of North America. Well, us in North America, Mexico, and Canada in our bilateral relationships. And definitely the technical challenge we have is, you know, if you want to do integrated deterrence, the key to integration is communication across partners, allies, and our combatant commands. So that's the number one technical challenge. And I'll pass it on. Good morning, everybody. I'm Liz Dor Maurice. I'm the J6 for U.S. Strategic Command and also the CIO for U.S. Strategic Command. So you heard General Cotton a little bit earlier today. Um, you know that uh, U.S. Strategic Command is a global command. We're responsible for strategic deterrence and, and many other missions uh, that must be performed just, just perfectly, that's all. So, so one of the things that, that we are responsible for is making sure that we have, we call it light switch capability. And that means that all of our systems need to function just as reliably as the light switch does. So as we're looking at integrated deterrence, our challenge is to make sure that we have nuclear command control communications kind of capabilities that are reliable on your very worst day and are able to function reliably and um, precisely for all all uh, contingencies. So that's the biggest challenge we have at Stratcom. And kind of like you, we've got to be able to do that also with our allies and partners as well. All right, Mel. Thank you, uh, Mel Stone. I'm the J2 for U.S. Cyber Command, uh, which also has a global uh, AOR, as you know. So. Uh, we are charged with defending the nation in cyberspace as part of a whole of government effort with securing and defending DOD networks, with providing military options in cyberspace for the whole joint force and all the combatant commanders, and of course, working with uh, partners and allies in that space, which we would include uh, industry in that conversation. Biggest challenge, of course, uh, as this audience knows, just the scope and scale of adversary activity in cyberspace. Every one of our adversaries has prioritized uh, cyber as a warfighting domain, and that just gives us uh, a large uh, surface area uh, of attack to be concerned with. But thankfully, we have uh, a lot of great folks working that mission, and we are hiring. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm Ann Wiersgall. I'm the United States Southern Command J6. Uh, most people think about United States Southern Command as guns, drugs, and thugs. Um, but it's, it's more than that, more than just that. Um, we have some unique challenges right to our southern uh, borders with mass migration, 
uh, with a prevalent and pervasive threat by our pacing threat uh, in terms of illegal underwater fishing, uh, strip mining, clear cut deforestation, and then uh, from an economic perspective, bringing in exquisite technologies and then the people to uh, install those exquisite technologies and then data flow uh, out back to China. I would say uh, from a, a threat perspective and from a challenge perspective in the, in the IT world, it's, it's interoperability and it's modernization. And our modernization has to outpace our pacing threat, but not outpace our partners. Uh, so I would just give that uh, for consideration as we talk about the integration and how IT enables integrated deterrence. Good morning, I'm Brian Sideri. I'm the Director of Intelligence for United States Space Command. Uh, we, our AOR goes 100 kilometers and out. And so we, my boss, uh, General Stephen Whiting, has a responsibility both to protect and defend in the domain, but also to ensure the joint force is protected and defended from space-enabled attacks from our adversaries. When I think about what we need to do, it's speed, accuracy, and resiliency because the joint force relies on the services that uh, United States Space Command delivers. You've seen it in the news, missile warning, Congressman Bacon spoke about it, precision, navigation and timing, global SATCOM, um, but that's all underpinned on the speed accuracy, uh, reliability, but also the soft underbelly that our adversaries look at for asymmetric attacks. Um, so again, happy to be here and I look forward to questions that General Henry will tee up. Good morning, I'm Rick Chancellor, I'm <coughs> J2 here at uh, STRATCOM. And uh, our chief uh, uh, requirement here is to integrate uh, nuclear deterrence uh, across all the domains, across the, all the adversaries, to understand, to make sure that we have a safe, secure, and reliable IT and information flow that we're gives us the credible level of intelligence to provide to the commander and in so doing then support the uh, the president uh, at this time. Hi, I'm John Phillips. I'm the director of C4 Cyber at U.S. European Command. Uh, as I look at, at Europe, it is not your father's NATO. Um, NATO is drastically changed, uh, enhanced directly uh, through the Russian aggression inside Ukraine. And so if you just go back to 36 years ago, uh, where NATO was just 16 countries, to today it's 32. Uh, and the NATO border with the Warsaw Pact was just a couple hundred kilometers uh, in what was East Germany to West Germany, and then a little bit with Italy against then Yugoslavia. The, the map of Europe has drastically changed, and we've expanded NATO to bring in very collaborative partners and allies. And the United States has very limited footprint uh, on the continent of Europe today due to the increased capability of NATO. As we bring in those 32 countries, of which my boss, General Cavoli, is Commander UCOM, but he's also Supreme Allied Commander Europe. And he focuses us on convergence and being just a part of NATO and not being the predominant member going forward. Hello, I'm Colonel Chris Robinson. I'm with the uh, U.S. Transportation Command as a military deputy J6. Um, our role is to um, execute global mobility operations um, to project and sustain the joint force. So we get the force to the fight, we sustain the force in the fight, and then we bring them back home or we help them pivot in, uh, to another area uh, uh, as appropriate. Um, we do that through three components and the sub-unified command, Joint Enabling Capabilities Command, um, your, your tactical comms, C2, um, experts and planners and uh, uh, public affairs support. We also have Air Mobility Command um, for our air mobility, our, our air operations. We have uh, the Military Sea Lift Command and we also have the, uh, from the Navy side, and we also have the Army uh, Military Surface and Deployment and Distri Distribution Command. Um, our commander also has a role of leading the broader joint deployment and distribution enterprise. So when you think of that, that's not just the DOD, that's partnering with the Maritime Administration, the, the Department of Transportation, um, and the, our fellow combatant commands and across the department. Um, they also lead the uh, Joint Petroleum Enterprise. Um, so all of that to say, uh, the, we have three components and it's a unified command. The one I didn't mention is essentially that fourth component. And that's really our commercial partners. 
our transportation service providers who deliver the, move the proponents of the resources around the globe um, on, our, on our behalf and in, in collaboration with our activities to support operations, uh, C2, and, um, and getting after things. So um, the challenge being uh, with that commercial side is when you think of that, the critical infrastructure, um, and also how do we partner and collaborate to ensure that the, the threats and the, that our adversaries pose to our commercial partners that we can help them fight through that, mitigate that, but also continue to execute our missions as appropriate. So looking forward to the panel. All right. Thank you. Hey, so uh, before we get into uh, some questions for the panels, um, I chose Jimi Hendrix um, as my walk-on song because Jimi Hendrix, in my mind, represents everything about innovation uh, that uh, you, can, you can imagine, actually. You, you talk about a, a, a person who uh, came from an area where... Um, his home life uh, certainly wasn't uh, about uh, rock and roll or about playing a guitar, uh, and he was left-handed. And most uh, guitarists, as you know, aren't left-handed. Uh, and some uh, folks don't even uh, know that there's a difference between guitars and, and the hand you play. But he was very innovative, uh, and he took what he had and did what he needed to do in order to uh, be innovative. And to this day, uh, is considered one of the greatest, um, you know, um, guitarist of all time. And I think that is because of his innovation. And so having said that, for the J2s on the panel, and actually the J6s will have a similar question, but right now for the J2s, uh, back to integrated deterrence. What adaptations and changes has your office or command made to improve and institute the concept of integrated deterrence? And uh, Mo, you look like you're ready to go, so I'm not going to call on you. <laughs> Good. I'll, I'll go back over to see it. Oh, so me. Uh, I'll confirm the seats are uncomfortable. <laughs> um, <clears throat> for integrated deterrence, I think the first fundamental question we worked through is we redid our campaign plan, right? The Department of Defense campaigns, right? To campaign to defer, set the conditions if, if deterrence fails, right? So you set the conditions for the joint force to, to prevail. First one is you have to go back and deter what? And so as you're looking back, what, what is the behavior you want to change? And so one, as General Henry, as you said, it's not the thing, the guitar. It was the thought I could do it differently. And so you have to go back, but you also have to assess. We're real good at doing activities, but are there the right activities to get the outcome you need to change a perception? And it doesn't, not perception in, in the literal sense, but to start getting people to think different of why you're doing it so that our adversaries wake up and it's not, not today. But how do I go back and assess it? So how do I go back and assess at the speed, right? So how do I get that information loop or intelligence loop back so that you can get the analyst outside of doing manual, right? Doing the hard work and letting the data come back at the speed we need so they make the informed decisions and then brief the boss. And so we've really reinstituted that, kind of how we went back. You and I had a discussion about reimagining warning. We did the same thing. What are the end states we want to get to? How do we walk it back? So it was the thought and putting no new processes in and then assessing every month or month and a half, are we meeting those operations, activities, investment to set the conditions? Okay. And then I'll go out to the globals, uh, starting with Rich at Stratcom. So some of the integrated uh, uh, initiatives that we've taken here, working with the uh, National Defense Strategy, is looking at Nuclear Command and Control and Communications, or NC3 systems. I, I said IT earlier. It's much larger than IT. It's the, it's the whole information flow. It's moving the intelligence, making sure that we have a resilient architecture that facilitates our abilities to accomplish, to accomplish our mission. Uh, supporting the intelligence requirements for the joint electromagnetic spectrum operations that General Cotton mentioned earlier. Uh, that is, that is a, a tall order by any means, and we're working closely with, uh, with our, uh, our GIMSO uh, Enterprise Center uh, to make sure that we can identify what is needed. We're working closely with DIA as well to look for the analytic sweet spot there where we can bring in the requirements, the training, and understand what is needed for, uh, for that mission space. On the NC3, 
We're working with our J6. Uh, for example, we've created an analytic division uh, that focuses on NC3, that focuses on the intelligence requirements for that. Uh, so those are two quick hitters of what we've done to demonstrate our initiative in going after some of these complex tasks. Okay, and uh, Mel, over to you. Yeah, thanks, sir. I, I think, like Sid, we've we put a lot of time and effort into how we are uh, assessing, because I think that's, um, you, you can't have deterrence unless you understand how the adversary is viewing what you're doing. Uh, and the way we look at deterrence in, in cyberspace is in a few ways. One, uh, cost and position, of course, which is probably the most familiar. And I don't mean that just in terms of cyber operations, but also our contribution to whole of government efforts, which might result in a sanction, a disclosure, or something else. Um, and then in, also we look at uh, integrated deterrence uh, in terms of resiliency and defense actions. Uh, we have to have uh, prioritized our, our, our Department of Defense networks and making them very difficult targets. Uh, the folks in the IT industry in this room are, are part of that conversation. Uh, IT has to be uh, cyber secure, uh, of course, um, but not as an afterthought. And so when capabilities are provided to the command, we're looking at um, the cybersecurity to be baked in and not bolted on. Okay, and over to Mo for the last of the geographic. All right, so for uh, my boss, General Guillot, uh, the one thing he always needs is domain awareness uh, from undersea all the way to space because Homeland Defense is the number one priority in the national defense uh, strategy. And uh, everything happening in the world this, this day and age can come back and touch us in the homeland. And so this is where I come back to what we really have focused on in the J2 is how do we, one, educate everybody in every other combatant command that any actions they take or may not take in their part of the world can actually affect us back here in the homeland, whether that's through surrogates or others already inside the homeland uh, that can create havoc or chaos here. Um, so that's one aspect. And then the second is really focusing on Mel's last point on resiliency. Defense critical infrastructure is a key point for uh, our boss, uh, but homeland defense is a team sport. You know, we don't own it necessarily as U.S. Northern Command, uh, but we have to partner with the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and others to be able to do this. And especially, again, as North America, we defend with our Canadian partners uh, and building those relationships to understand that, you know, our adversaries don't look at Canada and the U.S. as different, all right? They look at us as one team, one NATO team. Mm -hmm. And so, again, really my focus, you know, in the time I've been in the J2 is like, hey, let's educate everybody. That Homeland Defense is number one, and everything that happens around the world affects us. And let's strengthen those partnerships, both internal to the Homeland as well as external with the partners. All right. Hey, let's go. Um, I'm going to go over to the J6s of the world, uh, but I'm going to stay on the topic of deterrence and take a little bit of different turn on it. Um, this, this one is the theme of this year's DOTUS Worldwide Conference is integrated deterrence. Talk about the role that information technology plays in providing integrated deterrence, and what uh, do we need to continue providing that deterrence from a J6 perspective? And let's start with uh, Southcom. All right, thanks, sir. So when I think about integrated deterrence, we, we talk about you know a whole of DOD, a whole of US government, and then integrated deterrence with our allies and our partners. Information sharing and intelligence sharing is key to that. So our strategic advantage, our competitive advantage over our pacing threat is our information environment. Whether that's a network-centric information environment or a data-centric information environment, our strategic advantage is the ability to share information and intelligence faster than our adversary can. So how do we uh, see first, act first, understand first, engage decisively, and then re-engage at will? And our network enables us to do that through the commodity that we deploy, which is information technology, which is just the tool. It's, but it's the applications that we use to share that, to capitalize on that strategic advantage. So what we have to do moving forward is, one, maintain that strategic advantage of the employment of the information environment, uh, and then also exquisitely employ the tools that we have as we modernize at the pace and capability of our partners. Conversely, our information environment is also our critical vulnerability. So as General Stone was uh, mentioning, cybersecurity must be baked in. 
And as we bake that in, we have to bake it in in partnership with allies and partners globally so that we can achieve integrated deterrence from a global perspective. Okay, let's go to Transcom. Thanks, sir. Um, I've been in the command for a little over a year, but um, what I've found from our, my teammates who've been in the command much longer than me is that our command and our commanders have prioritized um, our IT and our, our cyber footprint um, as, as a, really treated as a, an, a foundational capability for us to execute command and control, um, drive decision advantage uh, and decision making, and, and really just get after executing our operations and leveraging everything that's available to us. Um, a lot of that's come by prioritizing cyber resilience and digital modernization. Um, when we talk about that cyber resilience, we've, we've invested in our cybersecurity uh, service provider uh, to be able to ac actually understand what's going on in our networks, uh, but also to, to create those bridges and relationships across uh, not just the DOD, but with our commercial service providers. Uh, and the digital modernization piece is really um, up in our game and, and investing in those capabilities that, that give us the, the uh, th that lead us to uh, more modern cloud-based uh, constructs as opposed to some of the things that we've, we've done traditionally from an on-premise um, and the, along those lines. Uh, All right. And zero trust, sir, um, I'll offer is uh, a really a core principle that we we focus on implementing within U.S. Transportation Command because that's really going to give us that that ability to be resilient, to reconstitute, and to to, to really not focus on the, the 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 more traditional aspects of defending as opposed to just being uh, aware of where our assets need to go and data. Um, we really need to focus on our data too. Um, we treat that as a strategic asset, and we need to protect it and make sure it gets to the places we need it to go appropriately. All right, let's uh, stray with uh, STRATCOM and Liz. Yes, sir, so from an integrated deterrence perspective, I think it's uh, not that we're not all a little bit different, but from a strategic command perspective, we depend upon a series of about 103 different systems, national systems that, that STRATCOM doesn't own. So from an integrated deterrence perspective, it's important for us to make sure that all those 103 systems are modernized, are integrated, and can provide the information that we need to perform all of the functions for that STRATCOM depends upon everything from decision making to force direction to situation monitoring. There's, there's tieovers between all of us from a strategic command perspective. So uh, what we really depend upon is making sure we've got those systems and networks integrated, but as we're proceeding more toward upgrading those systems and networks, we realize it's really all about the data. And do we know where our data is? Can we leverage that data 24-7, 365 on a very bad day? So from a STRATCOM perspective, we're really looking at where the data is, are we going to be able to access it, how much of that should be in a cloud, and how will we go forward in, in a, a period of, as you mentioned, zero trust. Certainly we want to get to zero trust as well, uh, but we have to do that in conjunction with all of the services, making sure that that cybersecurity is is either baked in or our systems are retrofit to make sure we can get to that perspective. So um, integrated deterrence is, is for a STRATCOM perspective, is, is certainly with our partners and allies, but really uh, for us, a lot of it is across the department and with the presidential um, uh, experts as well to make sure we're integrated uh, as we take our orders directly from the president. Okay, and before I close out this one with uh, Major General Phillips, um, one of the things that struck me is 103 different systems that you don't actually own, but you actually have to utilize in order to, to, uh, to get your mission accomplished. And I was, as you were saying that, I was thinking about John and his team there at UCOM and thinking about all the partners that they have and the different types of uh, things that they have to deal with. So John, no pressure, but uh, I expect you will have something to say about that as well. So uh, apparently microphone problem, it's, it's led down. Um, <laughs> But integrated deterrence is basically the premise of NATO. And so when the Washington Treaty was signed over 75 years ago, it established NATO as a collective defense organization. Defense. And so General Cavoli is converging the new NATO, as he calls it, uh, going forward and not focusing directly on Article 5, but all those actions pre-Article 5 that would deter the, the, any adversary uh, in Europe from taking action to provide a safe and secure European continent. To do that, it goes to information exchange requirements. 
If I look at the collaborative nature of NATO, uh, the U.S. now has once had two corps and four divisions in Europe uh, when I first raised my right hand uh, to just two forward postured brigade and a ro rotational brigade that we have right now. How we do that is better partners inside the 31 other members of NATO. And establishing those information exchange requirements where the information is available to everyone. Now, truth and lending, 88% of NATO intelligence is U.S. provided. And so it has to be at a releasability that it's available to all those NATO countries. Yet we still have inside the European theater of operation about 16 different MPEs of which only one is at the NATO secret releaseability. There are some bilats and trilats that we have out there, and we have to wane those down to where all information is available to the NATO collective. Because as General Cavoli visions NATO going forward, it is not US-led. It is, it is NATO-led. And through the three joint forces commands, depending on whether the conflict or crisis is in northern, central, or southern Europe, those JFCs would then command towed forces from the United States. And keep in mind now, just as General Cavoli is dual-hatted as both, Army Europe is dual-hatted as the LANDCOM for NATO. USAFE is dual-hatted as the AIRCOM for NATO. And the U.S. Navy Europe is dual-hatted as the MAR component uh, for NATO. Of our five components, all of them uh, both service U.S. Africa Command and U.S. European Command. So they have two bosses themselves. And then in General Williams' case for Army Europe, for example, he has three bosses, both to the JFC, uh, to UCOM, and to Army, and to U.S. Africa Command. Getting convergence and getting that information out in a shareable domain and then protecting the adversaries that have it is critical. And we have to have it. And we have demonstrated almost to the level of CJAD C2 now as we execute operations. We have a federated mission network not utilizing cross domain solutions, which inhibits information flow in a real time environment where Latvia can observe a particular target relay that information to a fire direction center uh, inside Army Europe, and then, then prosecution of that target can be relayed to an artillery battery inside Poland. That network exists today. That network must continue to develop and share information and all countries with inside NATO, not only being consumers of intelligence, but also providers of intelligence to improve that network going forward. All right. Hey, I'm, I think I'm going to stay on partnerships, um, but I'm going to go back to the J2s and uh, start uh, thinking about partnerships. The specific uh, point, though, is for you to describe a role that partnerships play in advancing your missions. Sounds, sounds trivial, uh, but as John was just talking, I think he just kind of described partnerships, uh, but specifically to the twos. And we'll start with, uh, I think, mail at Cyber Command. Thanks, sir. Um, partnerships. So uh, absolutely vital to Cyber Command operations, and we look at them in, in several different ways. Uh, partnerships with industry for, for capability uh, development and providing capability. Uh, partnerships with our academic uh, networks uh, for kind of new and innovative thinking. Uh, and then, of course, our international partnerships. Um, and, and I think that's a little cyclical to, to what General Phillips was talking about with um, mission partner environments in UCOM. Uh, so one important thing to highlight about our international partners is uh, our ability to share intelligence with them, no matter what combatant command we, we work in, uh, hinges on that partner's ability to protect that information. And so reliable uh, systems, uh, cyber secure partners, uh, we spend a lot of time focusing on, on how we can help strengthen our partners uh, so that they can be harder targets, but also so that we can enable that information sharing. So it just gives you a sense of how we're looking at partners. Uh, Interagency partners, of course, in the command and cyberspace uh, are absolutely crucial, whether that's uh, with the FBI, Department of Homeland Security with CISA uh, and others, uh, but partnerships is, is, 
is frankly uh, the way of life in Cyber Command. Okay. And I, Mel, I started with you because I wanted you to bring out the interagency piece and industry piece uh, because uh, most of the time when we're wearing this uniform, we think of our partners, we think of our five our partners or some of, if you're in NATO, uh, certainly uh, those partners. But uh, there is a broad coalition of folks, certainly in the cyber domain, uh, that are gaining and understanding and better because of what the work that you and your team does. Uh, let's go to uh, Mo at Northcom. Uh, so from the Northcom perspective, uh, really, if you think about us, three broad missions. We have Homeland Defense, we have Defense Support of Civil Authorities, um, and then we have Theater Security Cooperation. Right? So if you talk about partners in Homeland Defense, sort of what Mel said, the interagency becomes uh, key to knowing uh, what to defend. If you're talking about Defense Support of Civil Authorities or DISCA, this is your hurricane response, fire response, uh, being able to partner with uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, uh, becomes key in understanding uh, where we can uh, apply resources uh, if required. Um, and then, of course, theater security cooperation on the NORTHCOM side, you know, Mexico, Bahamas, and Canada, you know, it's working bilaterally with them, again, toward those homeland defense issues. Um, on the NORAD side, it's fairly obvious, you know, the Canadian partnerships are key. What a lot of people may not understand is we actually have two chains of command. Uh, my boss, General Guillo, works not just for the Secretary of Defense of the United States, he also works for General Carignan, the uh, Chief of Defense Staff of Canada. And so my boss's boss, on one hat, is Canadian and American, uh, not just American. So that makes it uh, partnerships are day in, day out for that. And then with industry, um, as I talked about before, integrated deterrence you can't have without communications. So if you're sitting out there today and you're like, well, what, how does this apply to me? My guess is when it comes to communication, you're part of the you know, data transport or data veracity and velocity, or are you part of that data resiliency? Uh, because either way, you're playing into homeland defense. We need that domain awareness, and we need to make sure that it stays resilient uh, so that we can have what we would call deterrence by denial, that no matter how we get hit in a conflict in the homeland, we can still survive that hit and be able to respond appropriately. Okay, let's um, go to STRATCOM, Rich. Yes, sir. So uh, partnerships are key to how we do business at STRATCOM. Uh, we rely heavily on our interagency and IC partners, whether that's uh, NSA, NGA, others within the Defense Intelligence Enterprise or other agencies in the uh, intelligence community. We need uh, technical uh, capabilities that, that uh, perhaps uh, Department of Energy or other uh, defense uh, threat agencies bring to bear for us. We rely critically on, on uh, our, our partners as well, Five Eyes, uh, and, and not just Five Eyes, but looking across the various theaters where we might need to employ or contemplate the employment of uh, weapons. To me, if, uh, if, we're, if we're thinking of a partner in, a, in an after the fact role, versus an integrated role, we sort of missed the point. And I think, I think there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, in fact, one of my uh, colleagues in another uh, in a 5i nation pointed that out and, and I thought it was a brilliant insight on that. So we then bring in that capability, whether it's uh, those, those uh, various agencies or various partners or academia or industry to bring together a, a resilient and reliable, in this case, subject of today, uh, integrated deterrent feature. So the data security that uh, you mentioned earlier, got to have it. So we can't, we can't go without that, but we need to be able to move data seamlessly across and still make sure that we have provided the, uh, the safety and security of our NC3 systems, our GEMSO uh, uh, information, our database repositories. We need to, to uh, reinvigorate those, as a matter of fact, and work closely. In fact, I think we have Ms. Uh, Kathy Buchholz out here uh, representing Mars, and there she is waving right there. She's a rock star as far as I'm concerned. So uh, we'll thank her for coming out here and we'll meet with her later. Okay, and we'll end with space. Yeah, thanks, sir. So as I sit here and look at the clock, it's all about the timing. And so we work with the interagency because everything in society, right, in the globe works on time. And so it's working with commerce, it's working with energy, it's working with treasury. So we work tightly with interagency through DOD, DOD, CIO, 
right, because you had the GPS council. I think we also, it would be behoove just not the five eyes from an intelligence perspective, but also from an operational perspective. So we do coalition space operations with the five eye, but also uh, my boss was over last week in Europe, France and Germany joined as well uh, because they're space faring nations and, and it's driving coherence and, but more importantly, convergence. But I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about academia. The, the great ideas come from academia, right? Um, the other one is commercial. Commercial powers the space community, right? Uh, you see that um, in writings from China. You see it in writings from Russia. Uh, the commercial market drives space. And it's not just the thing, the satellite or the bus. It's the payload or the service that's it's providing to the greater good. Uh, and as we work through that, just in the commercial market, it's a global commercial market, but that really powers the global south, right? And so it's not just a warfighting function, it's also a way of life function from smart farming, right? Precision, if we want to employ weapons or drive your car using ways, but it's all based on timing. So everything we do at US Spacecom is through allies and partners, and it's not just their traditional sense. Okay. We're going to stay on partnerships and go back to the uh, J6s, and uh, it's a different spin on partnerships, but partnerships nonetheless. So the what steps are you taking to engage and integrate partners, both traditional and non-traditional, and what technical barriers exist to increase partnership connectivity? And I think, um, John, because I en ended with you, I think I'll begin with you here because you talked a lot about partnerships, but I'll start with you, John, on, on, uh, out at UCOM. So as I look at partnerships, there's the 31 other members of NATO, but then there's the rest of the European Alliance. Um, and probably most people think I spend most of my time on, on providing network service, uh, or cybersecurity, the majority of our focus inside UCOM J6 is to enhance our partners' capabilities going forward. We conduct CCIBs, or Command and Control Integration Boards, uh, with various countries. Uh, we're just, we just wrapped up the very last one with Sweden because once they're a member of NATO, the intent is NATO takes over that mission, but we prep them for that. And we look at a span of things that are capabilities, their ability to integrate cybersecurity, crypto modernization, Link 16 for what they add to the air picture, and getting that to a modern capability set. Because, again, I talked about how large the span of NATO is against Russia. Before, it was a couple hundred kilometers of East Germany. Now it goes all the way from the Arctic Circle to the northern border uh, of Poland at Ukraine and then picks up again with Romania through the Black Sea and Turkey uh, into the Caucasus. Huge, massive terrain footprint and it's now the exposure with, with Russia. And we need the capability of those partners to be an integrated deterrent capability. So we spend those times going forward. I leave this conference tomorrow. Uh, I fly to Latvia, uh, and I have an engagement there to improve their interoperability capability forward. And then I stri fly straight from Latvia to Romania, uh, and you're all thinking, oh, great locations he's going to, but have you ever been in uh, the Carpathians in November? Probably not a pleasant time to visit Romania. Pretty cold. All our focus is to bring them up in a capability. Uh, we do it at cyber engagements, uh, and we get them from a nascent level up to where we give them a roadmap uh, to recruit, retain, and train individuals to be able to provide cybersecurity uh, at a capability level. And once they're at a certain level, we turn them over from a relationship from the J6 to the J3, and then the J3 integrates them in exercises to provide that built-up capacity and eventually that relationship gets turned over once they have a very capable force to Cybercom. And we have about five nations inside uh, NATO now that have direct relationships with Cybercom to improve their both offensive and defensive cyber capability. All right, and uh, Colonel Robinson, before I go to you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ad lib here because I've been thinking about this. As we work, uh, you know, at uh, 
at the joint staff, there's a lot of discussion about contested logistics. And uh, I was just thinking about uh, what Mel uh, is doing and working uh, with industry and the like, and it, it uh, dawned on me, obviously, that you guys uh, depend a lot on uh, the open systems uh, to get things moving or to augment you. So as you look at the partnerships, I suspect that uh, we'll hear a little bit about uh, some of the things that, uh, that you have to deal with that you know, we may not be thinking about. So um, Chris, other than that, I put you on the spot, but I think you can handle it. Yeah, sir, I'll emphasize really that fourth component, our commercial transportation service providers, uh, because that's really where we um, actively engage them to integrate them in, through um, formal agreements with um, partnering with the National Security Agency uh, Cybersecurity Collaboration Center for uh, the DOD Cyber Crime Center, as well as the um, Department of Homeland Security, CISA, um, to, to really give them access to those no-cost uh, cybersecurity resources that are out there. Um, we also work with, our, um, with the commercial partners to, to, to help them with their uh, compliance type uh, activities. So when you think of the, the national, um, the NIST standards, um, they'll do self-assessments. We'll help step them through those as they uh, do plan of actions and milestones to mitigate things. Uh, we produce newsletters that highlight um, threats um, that we're seeing within the Department of Defense um, and things that we're doing to mitigate that. And we also have contractual language in. So if there's a cyber incident that reports into our Cyber Operations Center within U.S. Transportation Command and we, we help, that gives us visibility. Uh, we don't have that visibility necessarily from um, access to their, their, uh, their systems, but that's one avenue that we help inform the command and the commanders about the things and the challenges we're seeing in the commercial sector. Okay. And uh, we'll, we'll stay with Stratcom and Liz and uh, see how you treat your partnerships. <laughs> partnerships, so there, there, there are just an exceeding number of partnerships. So let me just stay with the Transportation Command for a minute. We depend upon our partnerships, not only with Transcom, but other combatant commands because we must have those capabilities if Stratcom is to be able to execute our forces. So for exa example, uh, we've got uh, our bomber aircraft must be able to execute the orders of the president. They find it difficult to go someplace without gas. So Transcom, we we're continuously working with Transcom to make sure we've got the, the capabilities married up as we, as we deploy our forces. Uh, Space Command, same type of things. We've got to be able to make sure we have the capability that we need provided from space at the time and place that we need to have those capabilities. So huge partnerships uh, across all the combatant commands, Cybercom in particular, very close partnership with, with our Cybercom teammates. Um, other than that, uh, I will tell you, with the national, uh, the national leadership, we have strong partnerships across the intelligence community with all of the three-letter agencies to help us perform our mission. We work very closely with our J2 teammates to make sure that we're, we're very uh, well-informed. We, we um, tend to execute our mission based upon the threat. So every briefing that you would get from STRATCOM would start off with a threat brief and that would shape how we decide to execute that particular mission. We also have strong partnership with our component commands. We have air component, cyber component, maritime component. Those are key in providing the, the capabilities and the forces that General Cotton needs to be able to execute his mission. And finally, I'll tell you about a partnership that we have internal to U.S. Strategic Command. We have what we call uh, the Cyber Senior Leader Team, and that those are representatives that reach out across the department, across the government, but even within STRATCOM, that's the J2, the J3, the J6, our centers, our uh, Joint Electromagnetic Spectrum Center, our Nuclear Command Control Communications Enterprise Center, all working together as a cohesive team to make sure that we can uh, accomplish our mission. So STRATCOM is big on partnerships, everywhere, everything from at home to the combatant commands to our components. And the final partnership I'll just mention briefly is our, our partnership with our commercial partners, our partnership with academia. We depend a lot, we're hiring too. So a lot, a lot of partnerships with, with talent and making sure that we can uh, provide that talent to keep the strategic forces going, not only now, but into the future. Okay, and before I go to Anne-Marie at Southcom, um, I just wanted to point out that uh, the chairman challenged the, the joint staff. He said, hey, if we're really gonna uh, have partnerships, uh, we need to actually start here at the joint staff and start doing the things that we need to do in order to model uh, what that would look like. And so we've started uh, integrating some of our, not some of, at least one meeting a week uh, where we brief the, the chairman and the rest of the joint staff 
and, and our partners are right there with us uh, at the highest levels, and uh, it's, it's going well so far. Uh, but we have a lot of work to do, but I, it, it's very heartening to hear all of you talk about the partnerships that you have and, and even those that are challenged, uh, whether it's technology, and we'll talk about that here because that's going to be the next question uh, for industry and, uh, and the like. But uh, I'll, before that, I'll let uh, Anne-Marie close us out on this topic. Thanks, sir. So I'm going to talk about uh, Team America and Team Democracy, and I'll start with Team America first. So at United States Southern Command, we have a very unique relationship with the, with the interagency and, and how we organize. So as an example, we uh, execute combatant commander stand up most every morning uh, and sitting at the table every day is our civilian deputy to the commander, former ambassador uh, to a country in, uh, in, in South America, um, member of the Department of State on assignment to the, to the, um, to the DOD. Also sitting at the table is United States uh, USAID. Uh, so when we do our command brief, about the third slide in, uh, we talk about the interagency approach. There's about two dozen different organizations on that slide who all have representatives within our combatant command headquarters. So it, everything that we do within the Southcom AOR is an integrated approach with our, with our partners. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we talk a little bit about what we're doing with our partners. So cybersecurity, security operations centers, uh, DOD funded, as well as Department of State funded, uh, subject matter expertise en engagements uh, within our AOR by the Department of State, United States Cyber Command, uh, Department of Homeland Security. So Team America translates to Team Democracy. So what is Team Democracy doing? So we expand on that United States Team America approach with academia and industry. Now, if I look at the, the US Southcom AOR, I look at a map of Latin America and the Caribbean, I can take uh, little pinpoints like, hey, where have you been? And I can put industry, I can put company names on that map. And how are our industry partners and how are academia promoting democracy and democratic values with our partners, right? So how does information technology enable that? Well, it's the information environments. How are we sharing information? How are we sharing our values? How are we continuing to be the partner of choice? And IT professionals enable that, whether you're in the DOD or you're in the commercial sector, you're on Team America or your Team Democracy, you're enabling communication flow so that we can engage decisively with our partners and continue to be the partner of choice. All right, and uh, this was not planned, but uh, this is a good segue. Anne-Marie, thanks for doing that. We're gonna now open it up to the rest of the, to all of the panelists, same question, uh, and certainly to you in the audience, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll uh, have your pens out. Uh, but the, the question for all of you is, uh, we do have a lot of vendors uh, out in the audience, at least I hope they are today, um, and uh, other partners out there. How do you incentivize uh, and foster greater investment and partnerships with the private sector companies to meet your mission needs? And this is the lightning round. All right, so you're just going to hit it and go and just get through it because I want to end this with uh, you telling your top problem that you have from an IT perspective or a technology perspective. And that'll just be a one answer thing and then hit and move. But I'm going to start here, Mo, because you, you look at me like you, you're really ready to go. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. All right, so again, defense critical infrastructure. Number one IT problem is we don't know what's connected to what quite honestly, outside the defense perimeter. And I'm not sure that industry does either. Um, there are a lot of things that can affect us. And I tell you the number one, I'd really like to know how all the links and nodes are connected to make sure that we have that resiliency in case we're attacked in the homeland. Okay. Our number one IT problem is very similar to yours, although ours is really codifying what the, what the um, architecture is and being able to ensure that it's cyber secure and that no kidding, it's gonna function 24 seven, 365 under the worst possible crisis scenario. So what we really need from industry are interesting, so our, our out of the box thinking about how to do that in both a connected environment and a disconnected environment, leveraging cloud computing as best we can while we make sure that the, that the networks and architectures are secure. Okay. Uh, three things, I think first, um, you know, humility on the departments 
uh, side and recognizing that uh, the scope and scale of technological change in, in the domain, um, we have to rely on industry partners. So thanks for working for the good guys uh, in that regard. Uh, the second is cybersecurity for systems being provided across the department. We've talked about that. And the third is humility on your part. Um, so if there is an incident uh, or uh, you've been a victim of espionage or cyber attack, uh, following the appropriate uh, reporting procedures quickly uh, and timely enables us to get a sense for what an adversary is up to and feed that back into the rest of the IC and the rest of the department so we can take action. Thanks. So relationships are about risk. Our risk on the department side and then risk on the industry side as well. So we've got to be willing to accept some shared risk uh, so that we can maintain flexibility. Uh, so industry, we can give you requirements and not tell you how to do things. Uh, and then you can produce as industry partners a minimum viable capability that we can then iterate on uh, so that we maintain that flexibility. Now go one step further from a, from a higher level, we've got to rethink the FAR. We've got to put demand signal out to, to rethink the FAR so that we can be more agile, so that we can outpace the pacing threat, um, so that we can maintain interoperability with our partners, secure interoperability with our partners, so that we can share information and we can share, share intelligence uh, in a dynamic and agile and resilient way. All right, see it. I'm gonna flip the narrative, so it's the field of dreams. If you build it, will come. Show me the requirement the Department of Defense levied for a proliferated low Earth orbit constellation to provide reliable SATCOM and data services. There is not one, and we're using it every day across the globe. Show me the requirement that says, build me a reusable rocket, and you can land it and do it again. They thought it was crazy. Be the disruptor. If you're waiting for us to write the requirement down, to go do it, we're super busy. You heard uh, Congressman Bacon, you've heard everybody. How do we articulate the risk back when we have to sit down and write the problem while you're in the market? And so I would flip the narrative on you, be the disruptor. Don't come back and say, I have this great visualization tool, not interested, right? Not interested, it's about the data. You have to be the disruptor because that's what the commercial market does. That's what everybody here does. Be the disruptor to help lead us through it because we understand the problem, but don't have the time to write it in the 5,000 series acquisition rule to get back to you. So that's mine. All right. Let's go to Grant's call. I'd say um, understanding critical infrastructure, uh, the, the challenges out there, um, ECHO, uh, Northcom, um, helping our partners get, trans commercial partners get through and um, understand their terrain as well so that we can understand that. Um, managing um, and setting standards for our data um, and the, as growth, the volume of growth that we're, we're working through that and really modernizing our, our IT and uh, IT portfolio. Those are things we have to get after and those are things we're working at Transcom. Two things, um, one is setting the standard uh, and classification for uh, operations going forward. First is integrated air and missile defense uh, using Link 16. We can only operate at the lowest capability uh, of the lowest common denominator of the contributing country. There are some countries within NATO uh, that are only going to be on track to reaching crypto modernization as required uh, for modern Link 16 uh, for about three, four years from now because we're fielding the United States uh, requirements first, but we have to develop and increase the capacity of the defense industrial base to turn out those systems to bring in all of our partner nations that contribute greatly. Uh, the previous speaker talked about uh, the effect of a hypersonic hitting the Pentagon. Well, think about one hitting Warsaw that's only about a two and a half minute flight. Um, you have very little reaction time and we have to improve that capability. The second, looking at my J2 counterparts here, is writing for release. We have a tendency in the United States to overclassify information uh, and not intend or, or not develop to what the intended audience needs to be to receive that information. So we need to write to release for our most capable partners to be able to utilize that intelligence and be more capable going forward. Okay, and Rich, close us out. As we operate in this uh, strategic competition environment with two near 
appear adversaries who are determined to threaten our our data flow, our systems. Uh, we need to, as, as Liz mentioned earlier, and Mo, you may have talked about this as well, the interdependencies of our systems, to no kidding, find the, the sweet spot of how we go about it. And there's probably, in fact, I'm certain of this, there's more than one sweet spot, but how do we, how do we go after that? That is a critical challenge for us. All right, hey, and uh, before we close out, we got about five minutes uh, I did want to recap a little bit. I, you saw me up here writing, if you were if you even paying attention to what I was doing. I wasn't just uh, John Stewart in it up here. I was actually writing some stuff down. Uh, but here's some things that I captured from the, from the discussion. One uh, was uh, the, the word foundational. Uh, and uh, I know Ms. Buckholt is out there uh, looking at making sure that we have access to that foundational data, that uh, those things that are out there that are just everyday grind work. Uh, I think that's important. Interoperability was mentioned several times. Uh, we talked about services, Spacecom talked about services, PNT, delivery, SATCOM, so on and so forth. Uh, we talked about uh, from, the, from the sea to space. I think that may have been you, Mo. Uh, we talked about cost imposition, and I think that may have been Southcom. I don't know, who talked about cost imposition no. as far as risk goes? That was. Uh, mail. Um, but then I started writing some of the other bigger themes on here. Domain awareness, we've heard that several times, and that's where certainly industry and, uh, and you guys, uh, the IT community, as you start to try to make sure that we can integrate uh, and be interoperable, one of those things we, uh, that I'm charged with as a J2 uh, is uh, battle space awareness on behalf of the Joint Force. That's in my uh, Bailiwick to do on behalf of the joint force. So domain awareness is critical for everything that we do. And that all goes back to data and our ability to, to get at that data and utilize it in a way that the, the team here has been talking about. We talked about releasability, we talked about convergence, resiliency, interagency, seamless, visibility, commercial, flexibility, interdependence, and then uh, the piece that kept coming up in almost every one of the discussions is the defense industrial base and our ability uh, to be able to actually do things at scope and scale. And uh, if you're sitting up here on the panel, uh, certainly every one of us is affected by it, uh, whether it's in our reliance on the industrial base, uh, whether that is to produce more uh, for the future or whether that is to help us move uh, in a contested environment. Uh, the defense industrial base is everything to us. And right now, I think we're not in a, a place where we are actually putting it uh, at the forefront. And uh, both this, the senator and the congressman uh, both discussed that about the awareness that we don't have or that we uh, don't have enough of to understand the threat. And so I think the, the panelists, and thank you for doing this, I think you illuminated uh, not only uh, for your own domain or your own geographic uh, area, but I think you did illuminate the threat in a way that allows each one of us to think about uh, what we can do as, as IT professionals or as industry who is trying to enable us uh, to help get at some of the problems that you have. So I'll stop there to see if any of you have any follow-up you want to do. If I uh, pull one of your uh, key words out and you want to elaborate on that, we have two minutes. I don't know if we can, we can take probably one question maybe. So make it one that all the panelists can hopefully uh, give you a little bit. We have one minute and 50 seconds. We don't have to use all the time. Sir, okay. if, I, if I may, uh, one of our greatest uh, treasures in this whole discussion of uh, architecture and IT and data is our human resource, our, our analysts, our contractors, our planners, you name it, they're all critical to this thing. And from a selfish perspective, as General Cotton said earlier, Omaha is a, uh, is a hidden gem. Offit is a hidden gem. And it, it is truly an amazing place to be and the mission is critical. Okay. So I'll just get off the stage. That, that was info ops. That's very good. <laughs> well I, I, I agree, but um, hey, Thanks uh, for having the panelists come. I know you guys took, a, took time out of your schedule. 
but I appreciate it. Please give a round of applause for the panelists. All right. I don't think we have any walk off music, so we're just going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lieutenant General Henry, uh, and to all of our panelists uh, for that very insightful discussion. Uh, at this time, we're gonna take about an hour uh, for lunch uh, and networking. Uh, there's some really cool technology downstairs, so I uh, implore you to go see some of, uh, some of the vendor and some of our uh, industry partners' uh, technology they got for us. Um, please be back up here by 13.30 uh, for our afternoon panel, uh, afternoon panel. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Here to kick things off this afternoon is Intelligence Community Chief Information Officer, Dr. Adele Merritt. Dr. Merritt assumed her duties in 2022, and she is responsible for leading the ongoing modernization efforts to transform the IC information technology enterprise in other areas of the IC information environment. Please welcome Dr. Merritt. Put my hands the Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the kind introductions. It's an honor to speak once again at DOTUS Worldwide Conference and have the opportunity to visit Omaha. I want to thank Doug Casa and our hosts for everything they do to make this event possible. DOTUS is a great opportunity for government IT leaders to meet with colleagues and industry partners to share their vision for building and maintaining the world's best IT infrastructure. The theme for this conference is integrated deterrence through IT superiority. I like to think that we in the room, we are the IT superiority people. At a time when there's challenges like data abundance, artificial intelligence, cybercrime, worrying about post-quantum computing, these are on the front of our minds. You, in this room, are an essential part of the team that is hardening our infrastructure and preparing the workforce to confront the challenges of tomorrow. As daunting as it might seem, I believe there is no country in the world better positioned to succeed in this environment than the United States. Today, as in our past, our country has many strengths that will give us an edge a technologically advanced and IT-savvy workforce, stalwart allies, and leadership that has a vision for the future of where we need to go. History is a great teacher. During World War II, the United States and its allies cracked the Germans' formidable Enigma code. Doing so gave allied forces a decisive advantage that changed the course of history. It's an example of how our nation's strengths, ingenuity, collaboration, and innovation give us a strategic advantage during a time of international conflict. Many of you know the story of how we deciphered the Enigma messages. Brave Polish cryptanalysts started to develop methods for deciphering German encryption in the 1930s. They brought this knowledge to England, where codebreakers at Bletchley Park started to develop advanced methods to cracking the encryption. It was at Bletchley Park where the Americans first partnered with our British counterparts on breaking Enigma. Members of the American team had already built a machine that was capable of codes. The Americans took the new technology home, tasked a team in Dayton, Ohio, to build their own version of the British-built bomb. Soon, we had 120 American-made bombs that were deciphering thousands of German messages every day. Our technological advantage allowed us to anticipate enemy movement, safely ship supplies to Europe, and effectively end the war in the Atlantic. It also helped us plan and execute the most significant amphibious assault in the history of the world, D-Day. 80 years ago, messages decrypted by the bomb provided timely information about troop movements, defensive positions, new vulnerabilities, and possible counterattack for allied commanders. Decoding this information gave the Allies a tactical advantage on a day when time was precious. Allied success on D-Day required sacrifice, bravery, and ingenuity. Nothing was guaranteed. Our technological advantage gave us the upper hand, saved lives, 
and help us begin liberating continental Europe. I chose to talk about the bomb and D-Day today to remind us that information technology superiority is the key to maintaining strategic advantage over our allies. Over the next three days, as we share ideas about integrated deterrence through IT superiority, we can be inspired by the legacy of the people who developed the Enigma cracking bomb. And remember that no matter what technological challenge we face, we have done this before. We have an increasingly complex landscape. Everybody is vying for global dominance. Much like our partners in defense, law enforcement, and the private sector, intelligence community officers must provide their leaders with timely information about these threats. As you will see, as I said last year, in order to stay ahead of the threats and vulnerabilities, we need a plan, a great workforce, motivated partners, and a robust digital foundation. All of these essentials all of these items are essential for operational agility and efficiency. Advanced technologies process vast amounts of data that our mission users rely on to make informed decisions and reply swiftly to global events. Thanks to prior investments, a strong digital foundation exists, and we can provide fast and reliable access to valuable information, enhancing collaboration across agencies and improving overall mission effectiveness. Investing in the modernization of our digital infrastructure is vital if we want to stay ahead of an evolving environment. The landscape of cyber threats is constantly changing, and our IT infrastructure must be resilient to address these challenges. Investing in cutting-edge technologies and cybersecurity measures will create systems that are secure, reliable, and capable of protecting sensitive information from increasingly sophisticated adversaries. We must also make certain that we invest in new capabilities. We are not introducing risks to our systems. The IC must take an approach that leverages amazing technological innovations in a safe way. In May, DNI Haynes signed the vision for the IC's information environment, an information technology roadmap. The release of the roadmap was a culmination of a strategic process driven by the understanding of the evolving technological landscape and the need for the intelligence community to stay ahead of these challenges. Putting this roadmap together required extensive collaboration across the intelligence community and close consultation with experts in cloud computing, cybersecurity, data management, artificial intelligence, and other key areas. We had to consider not only the current capabilities and challenges, but also anticipate future developments, especially with the rapid advancements in AI and quantum computing. More than 100 technical experts across the IC developed recommendations contained in the document through 600 inputs that were refined, challenged, and validated. These leaders from various backgrounds shared the dependence on the IT infrastructure, contributed their ideas, insights for the roadmap. Over the past few years, we've talked about our digital C-suite, our CIOs, our CISOs, and our chief data officers, our CDOs. But as we look towards the future, our C-suite has grown into a digital village. The digital village casts a much wider net and includes chief artificial intelligence officers, civil liberties, privacy, and transparency officers who make sure that we execute our mission in alignment to our nation's values. It includes research, science and technology, and innovation teams that are now a part of our core infrastructure as we continue to rapidly bring in new and amazing technologies. Who else? The Office of General Counsel, Chief Financial Officers, Human Capital Officers, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Officers. The list goes on. All the voices matter. Listening to the digital village is vital to our success. Everyone needs IT, and everybody can contribute as we're working to make it better. In addition to working closely with the intelligence community's digital village to develop the roadmap, we also engaged our external partners to conduct an extensive industry scan. Research identified over 1,000 technological developments anticipated in two years, three years, five years, 10 years horizon. We layered the technology roadmaps and strategies of the 18 intelligence community elements, then selected and condensed based off of the national strategy. An outside panel of technical experts convened by the DNI affirmed that the roadmap was on target. We are grateful to the private-public partnerships 
the subject matter experts who dedicated their time and their experience to what became the roadmap's five focus areas and 19 key initiatives. This week, you'll hear from many of the members of our digital village, both on this stage and in the breakout sessions. Two panel discussions, one with the CIOs and one with the CISOs, will happen on this stage. The CIO panel will be moderated by Michael Castelli tomorrow, and then on Wednesday, Catherine Nurler will moderate the panel with the CISOs. Both discussions will give you greater insights into the concerns and the priorities of the intelligence community, CIOs, and CISOs, and the role they play in implementing the roadmap in the coming years. I want to highlight that you can read the roadmap on the open internet. This was done by design. We need to be talking with our partners at an unclassified level to let them know where we are going. There is no classified annex to the roadmap. It was not written on the high side and then parts downgraded to the low side. It was designed from the beginning to be available and accessible to the public. I am proud of the mission vignettes, the timelines, the milestones that are in this document. They provide details behind the vision to show you where we are going so that others can join us on this journey. As we look to the future, we need to be thoughtful about how we invest in our resources, ensuring that every dollar spent maximizes our ability to protect national security. The roadmap provides a clear direction for how we can build and maintain an information environment that is secure, innovative, and capable of adapting to unpredictable changes. The roadmap is a strategic tool that will help us make informed decisions, prioritize our efforts, and ultimately ensure that we maintain our edge in a rapidly changing world. One of the most striking realizations that we had when building the roadmap was how we are focused so often on the challenges ahead, but we are on the right path right now. The discovery gave us a renewed energy and confidence knowing that our previous efforts are bearing fruit and that we are well positioned to tackle the future challenges. Whether it's cloud integration, AI, cybersecurity, we are aligned with the emerging technologies of tomorrow. We continue to proactively lay the groundwork that will allow us to stay ahead of the curve. There are three additional findings that I wanna share with you today. First, we cannot do this alone. No single IC element can prevail against an adversary. Only, we will only prevail together and by bringing the base capabilities we have to all fights. We recognize that the CIOs, the CDOs, the CISOs must partner closely with the greater digital village to build the future capabilities we need to retain intelligence superiority. The unified vision of the roadmap embodies this perspective. Second, all 19 key initiatives are equally important. This is not an a la carte menu. There are some foundational things that have to be done and shored up before we can do some of the things downstream that we want to do. For example, it's no secret that AI technology will transform how we are doing the mission. The IC must make significant advancements and in investments in compute, storage, and transport. Adopting new paradigms for data which will achieve our vision for AI. Third, there is an inherent urgency in these recommendations. The roadmap is a strategic guide that lays down the foundation for tomorrow while addressing the needs of today. Consider the development of a robust system within the intelligence community. First, from the moment it's identified, the process of building this capability typically spans several years. This long timeline underscores the need to start planning and investing in these capabilities today, so they are ready when we need them most. As noted, the roadmap has five focus areas and 19 key initiatives. While I'm gonna to touch on each aspect of the focus areas, you'll have an opportunity to learn more about these during the conference. In addition to the two panel, conference, two panel discussions that will be on this stage, OICCIO is hosting six breakout sessions focused on different aspects of the roadmap. This slide here shows you the list of topics, room numbers, and times for each session. This gives you an opportunity to talk with those who were involved in the process of developing the roadmap. Taken as a whole, these two panel discussions and six breakout sessions will give you a deeper understanding of where the IC is going and what we need to do to get there. So let's dive into the roadmap. The roadmap starts with a digital foundation. In the IC, a big part of our digital foundation has been cloud computing. 
We have been on a cloud journey for the past 10 years. We had great success with the commercial cloud services contract, C2S, which started in 2013. We continued our classified cloud journey with the award of the commercial cloud enterprise contract, C2E, in 2020, increasing the number of cloud service providers to five. Now, the cloud service providers on the classified fabric have all reached ATO and IOC status. We know that the digital foundation must be able to provide data anytime, anywhere, under all conditions to everyone who needs it. A key initiative is to push towards a unified and interoperable information environment. By developing and implementing common standards and protocols, the roadmap aims to ensure various systems and technologies can work seamlessly together. The interoperability is crucial for effective data sharing and collaboration across agencies, supporting a more cohesive and coordinated approach to intelligence operations. And some intelligence officers are operating in denied, degraded, intermediate, low, or DDL environments. These contestant environments are often at the edge. We need to provide similar capabilities to those in the field that we have at our desks and headquarters. The second area is focused on cybersecurity. Robust cybersecurity requires large investments by the intelligence community. Much like it is for the rest of the world, we take responsibility of identifying threats to our infrastructure very seriously. We must stay ahead of our adversaries at all times. One aspect that you hear repeatedly is about zero trust. Zero trust is something that we are keenly focused on. It will help us safeguard our federated systems. Zero trust is not a technology that I can pop out of the box and install magically. It's a journey, and we are going to be on this journey for a while. We look forward to continuing our close partnership with the IC Elements, DOD, and our industry partners as we move forward on this journey. The Intelligence Community Zero Trust Steering Committee is helping us develop the Zero Trust strategy to guide us in securing systems from the inside out, allowing more secure data sharing across different security enclaves and ensuring interoperability amongst the elements. Zero Trust principles will be central to cybersecurity efforts with milestones set for reaching the various levels of Zero Trust maturity to strengthen the IC's defensive posture. Another significant initiative is the modernization of enterprise risk management, particularly with the adoption of continuous authority to operate, or CATOs, which treat IT security as an ongoing commitment rather than a one-time achievement, ensuring systems are regularly maintained and updated. The streamlining of IT develop delivery and modernized risk management frameworks and increasing automation, the IC can enhance both security and the speed of software development. Additionally, the roadmap addresses the importance of real-time threat detection, vulnerability scanning, cy cyber threat intelligence, and a security coordination across the intelligence community. The third focus area is about enabling modern partnerships and practices. Let me start with accessibility. Earlier this month, I spoke at the IC's accessibility, the IC-wide summit focused on IT accessibility. The audience included officers from the community who are charged with improving accessibility for everyone. These leaders and advocates are important voices in the digital village. Since becoming the ICCIO almost three years ago, I've learned a lot in my journey about how to be a stronger advocate for accessibility in IT. I have found that there's no such thing as being mostly accessible. It, is either, it either is or it is not. As part of the roadmap development process, we recognize that our tools must be accessible to those who need additional capabilities, such as screen readers or closed captioning. We need to make sure that as we bring people into the IC, they can interact with the technology we have. We also need to make sure that our communication and collaboration tools are modern, that they are keeping pace. Today, we must be able to collaborate with our partners in faster ways as things happen around the world. We need to create new alliances with those who might not have been part of the alliance we had yesterday, with allies who are part of a situation that we are dealing with at this moment. One key initiative is to enhance and extend collaboration across all security fabrics. The roadmap emphasizes the advancing interoperability amongst IC elements to support multi-intelligence or multi-inch approach. 
This includes accelerating the use of ready-made solutions for collaboration with a wide variety of partners, including the private sector and international allies like our Five Eyes. By modernizing collaboration services and introducing virtual and immersive technologies, the IC can break down barriers that limit collaboration, allowing for seamless interaction amongst IC elements and partners. Fostering these partnerships, the intelligence community can quickly respond to emerging threats, leveraging a full spectrum of resources available both within and external to our traditional IC allies. The fourth area is data centricity. This focus area recognizes that CIOs and CDOs need to work closely to meet the challenges of our time. A lot of amazing analytics are coming down the pipeline, require there being a foundational aspect of data already accomplished. As leaders within our community, we must focus on ensuring data is consumable both by humans and machines. We must value our data as a strategic product and develop a decentralized data system, data ecosystem that integrates data across domains and disciplines. A key to improving data is data centricity. Making progress on data centricity is not possible without reaching out to the people who are outside our fence line and speaking with partners who also believe in prioritizing data as a strategic and operational asset. Doing so will ensure our infrastructure meets the operational and business mission needs by providing value to IC customers. The IC CIO is working closely with the IC CDO, Lori Wade, for and Lori was a leading contributor to this focus area. I am grateful for her partnership on this and many aspects. Last week, Lori and I signed the Intelligence Community Data Reference Architecture. This was a top priority for both of our offices. It was a goal within the IC data strategy. It also completed one of the target milestones in the force focus area of the roadmap. Tomorrow, Lori will be speaking about data centricity and the IC's data reference architecture on this stage in her plenary talk. The last focus area is about accelerating the mission. We are looking at what's coming down the pipe. In many cases, there are amazing innovations just over the horizon. In this focus area, we try to answer questions about what part of the infrastructure do we need for the world of tomorrow. As we develop and invest new tools and capabilities, we are also looking to make sure that we are developing and investing in the workforce of tomorrow. Our workforce is our greatest asset. Without people, it's just a pile of very expensive stuff. We need skilled people who can make the best use of the amazing technology we have. I'm always advocating for recruiting the next generation of IC professionals. Our community prides itself in being flexible, agile, and innovative in addressing any challenge. The recent announcement to remove the requirement for four-year degrees for certain federal cybersecurity jobs is a progressive step. The initiative recognizes that the fast-evolving field of cybersecurity, practical skills, hands-on experience, and adaptability are critical. Cyber threats are constantly evolving, and our approach to workforce development must evolve with them. We need to emphasize the value of on-the-job experience and hands-on learning to highlight the value of practical, real-world experience. Our workforce must have the necessary skills needed to effectively safeguard our digital assets, regardless of whether a person's experience is gained in the classroom or on the job. I am proud to say that we built the roadmap that guides the bold and transformational investments we need to be making now to be ready for the future, to stay ahead of and capitalize on rapidly emerging technologies. Today, I gave you a small taste of the roadmap. If you've not already done so, you can download a copy of the roadmap on the ODNI website. With the roadmap, we are not letting technological change happen to us. We are driving where we need to go. Technology does not roll out overnight. Sometimes it's a multi-year journey, so we must start now. The roadmap is an executive support decision document, not a te technical implementation document. It gives CIOs a way to discuss IT investment with our leadership, and it helps CIOs speak with one voice with partners within the intelligence community, DOD, and industry. We are going to update the roadmap annually. Updates will be, used, will be made in a similarly collaborative process to keep current and relevant to our mission. As we conduct our annual reviews, we need to hear from all of our partners. 
I have two suggestions to the members of our digital village who want to be part of this journey. First, to help us achieve this vision. First, help us achieve this vision. If there are better, more efficient, or scalable ways to get there, we want to know. Bring your ideas to the table. The six breakout sessions hosted by OICCIO are a terrific opportunity for you to hear from some of the people who are implementing the roadmap within the intelligence community. Second, partner with the intelligence community to help us solve some of the most pressing problems and build joint solutions to get us to where we need to go. Our partners bring incredible talent, innovation, and outside perspective that the IC, that the IC greatly values. Here within the intelligence community, each agency has its own mission and unique authorities, but there's a recognition that we are one team. If you want to help national security, please help us evolve and solve our tough challenges in ways that create a greater future for this country. As I mentioned in the opening, military, intelligence officers, and technologists have played a critical role in some of our nation's most pivotal moments. When an adversary threatened to conquer the free world more than 80 years ago, we confronted it with courage, diligence, and IT superiority. We need to celebrate and embrace that legacy. Today, as technology makes the world smaller and the threat landscape bigger, we are stepping up and finding solutions. As daunting as today's challenges may seem, and as unclear as the future may appear, this is not our first rodeo. The network infrastructure we build today will help us maintain an advantage over our adversaries, whatever they have planned, whenever they operate. We will make decisions together today that guarantee that we are ready when the future arrives. Thank you again. I hope you have a great time here in Omaha. Thank you, Dr. Merritt. Next up, we have our Five Eyes panel, with featuring, rep featuring representatives from our partner nations. The panel will be moderated by Defense Intelligence Agency Deputy Director for Commonwealth Integration, Major General Dominic Goulet. Please welcome the board, sorry, <laughs> please welcome the panel to the stage. A Monday warrior, mean, mean stride. Today's Tom Sawyer, mean, mean pride. Though his mind is not for rent, don't put him down his air again. His reserve of quiet defense, writing out the day's events. No. Rush, eh? <laughs> well, tough crowd, tough crowd. Um, so, good afternoon. It's a pleasure and privilege uh, to be here with you this afternoon for this week. Uh, as mentioned, Dom Goulet, I am the Deputy Director for Commonwealth Integration within the Defense Intelligence Agency. I am the fourth Deputy Director for Commonwealth Integration since 2015. Um, and for those who are not familiar with the role of the office, it is to support the Director in evolving and enabling partner integration across the agency's full spectrum activities. We've heard this morning and just after lunch many references to partners and allies, uh, which is absolutely fantastic to hear. Uh, I'm looking forward to the panel where we will actually hear from allies and Austin. <laughs> in terms of how we can best get after it so that we can fight tonight interoperable so we can support the warfighter and we can defend and win uh, the next wars decisively. I also would like to echo what Dr. Dixon and General Henry mentioned this morning in terms of how do we grow the small e in enterprise so that we have unfinished business uh, to quote them. Credible military power is critical to shaping adversarial perceptions and intent and deterring strategic comp competitors. Our collective military power achieved through integrated de deterrence with allies and partners 
across warfighting domains, theaters, and spectrum of competition allows us to prevent, and if needed, decisively win wars. The linchpin to integrated deterrence is information technology. Wielding a modernized, connected, secure, and resilient IT enterprise assures unparalleled overmatch in competition and conflict. So how do we achieve and maintain IT superiority? DIA CIO, for its part, has prioritized partner interoperability in its strategy and supporting initiatives, and I am pleased to say, continues to deliver critical capability to support our closest Commonwealth allies. A great example of DIA's efforts is the ongoing development of the Machine Assisted Analytical Rapid Repository, or MARS, program of record. Designed to replace the modernized integrated database, MARS development has, from day one, been undertaken in such a way to enable partner integration and, adopt and adoption, and ultimately continued interoperability in support to the warfighter. This will ensure that the US and its allies continues to best leverage foundational military intelligence required at the speed of mission. And we know why this matters. DI's efforts to prioritize the modernization of information networks and computing are critical as we scan today's security environment. We face a multitude of threat actors across the spectrum of competition that pose a serious threat to the rules-based global order. China is rapidly advancing its military modernization and developing capabilities critical for potential future military op operations against Taiwan. Russia, despite, the, despite its war of attrition in Ukraine, continues to advance its space and counter space strategy, emphasize its military posture presence in the Arctic, modernize its nuclear triad, and expand cooperation with partners. Iran continues to position itself as a dominant regional power, and North Korea wields the missiles and conventional capabilities to hold US forces and allies in Northeast Asia, in Northeast Asia at risk. All of this without mentioning terrorism, and global instability. As such, leaders at all levels should continuously be asking themselves key questions with the view of ensuring a strong, integrated deterrence with allies and partners. For example, how do we maintain our ability at speed of mission to fight tonight, successfully deploying and employing modern, connected, secure, and resilient networks that provide the data needed to continue to effectively support decision makers and warfighters? And how do we continue to enable our respective CIOs with the right resources, policies, and critical enablers necessary to establish, maintain, and safeguard our respective and collective IT superiority? So to help us get after some of these questions and to broaden our thinking on how we can continue to best integrate with allies and partners, I am pleased to introduce the following distinguished panelists. Brigadier Andrew McBaron serves as a Director General, Intelligence Data, and targeting for the Department of Defense, Australia. In this role, he manages the Australian Defense Targeting Enterprise, Geospatial Capability Program, and Foundational Military Intelligence, delivering intelligence capability outcomes to defense and whole of government. Brigadier General Eric Vandenberg is the Director General Intelligence Enterprise within the Canadian Forces Intelligence Command. He oversees the design, development, and implementation of defense intelligence capabilities within the De Canadian Department of National Defense and the Canadian Armed Forces and he is responsible for the oversight, ongoing sustainment, and continuous development of Canada's top secret defense intelligence networks. Captain Brendan Oakley is the Deputy Chief of Defense Intelligence for the New Zealand Defense Force, and in a subsidiary role, he has the responsibility for the progression of information and cyber domain capability projects. During his 30 years of service, he has held senior positions within the Navy and the wider Defense Force, including Director of Naval Engineering and Director of Strategic Joint Communications. Mr. Jack Maxton is the Chief Information Officer for UK Defense Intelligence. In this role, he leads a digital strategy across a, mul a multi-intelligence environment, including all source analysis, geospatial intelligence, cyber and electromagnetic effects, training and other specialist intelligence capability disciplines. He is responsible for the day-to-day -day delivery of defense intelligence specialist IT services and for delivering an ambitious program to transform UKDI through the adoption, adoption of new cloud and advanced analytics technologies at pace. And finally, Mr. Austin Martin currently serves as the Assistant Director for Five Eyes IT Integration within DIA's Chief Information Office. 
In this role, he is responsible for advising the CIO on the full spectrum of capability and services provided by DIA to the Five Eyes Defense and National Intelligence Enterprises. He previously served as a senior technical advisor for international systems, along with other foreign partner relations roles within DIA's chief information office. Thank you. Gentlemen, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> so this year's conference is centered around IT integration and its role within the realm of strategic deterrence in a competition space. Often we think of IT uh, and the challenges in terms of integrating across the five eyes, we think of the technical impediments. Uh, but often what we find are the policy impediments or challenges um, that we first need to overcome to get after the technical solutions. Um, so I'd like to hear um, from yourselves in terms of perhaps some examples of where perhaps we've gotten the policy right or we've been able to align the policy against our objectives and we're able to overcome some of these uh, technical impediments. Austin, I'll, I'll start with you, please. Yep, sure. Thanks, sir. So, um, you know, I think it's inherent that being a part of a government organization, there's, there's policy and, and within DIA specifically, we have you know, CIO and then DIA department, IC, and even um, US laws that are codified in the US code that give us some left and right boundaries of where we need to operate. Um, you know, I, I think I'd be preaching to the choir here if, um, you know, if I said that uh, policy sometimes doesn't keep pace with the technical innovation that we have. Um, but where we've really found success is um, approaching a problem outside of the policy. So the approach a problem that we're presented with for IT integration with a, a foreign partner or in a, in a foreign partner space and uh, gather all the relevant stakeholders and come up with a plan of action that takes into account all of the relevant laws, security uh, concerns, any of the, um, the physical or the cyber concerns and then the actual IT hardware and what we're deploying itself. Uh, and then approaching the policy to see if we need to change it or if, uh, if it doesn't need to be changed or if the policy doesn't exist, then advising the appropriate policymakers within either DIA or ODNI or, or your respective IC uh, to, uh, to either create the policy, vet it, and approve it so that we can move out. Thanks, Austin. Jack. Um, I think the place I would start is when you consider the, the standards that the, these policies drive, sometimes we just have to apply a bit of pragmatism and not take, not a, try and achieve a common standard or way of working, but sometimes we just need to take the highest standard. And you see that um, in, many of you will have been to RF Witten uh, in Cambridgeshire, which is the largest Five Eyes skiff in the world. Uh, we were able to achieve that by actually taking the highest and most stringent policy standards. Um, and don't I know it when I get searched going in there every morning. Um, but actually that's an example of where we've been pragmatically able to bring that together. And the result was achieved by the people wanting to make that happen. And I think that's the important thing as well. We need to not let this get in the way, not let computers says no get in the way of us being able to do some really good things together. Thanks, Jack. Brendan. Uh, kia ora, tēnā koutou Good afternoon. Um, as mentioned, Brendan Oakley from the New Zealand Defence Force. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank you very much for the invitation. I was very privileged to attend DOTUS last year in Portland uh, and looking forward to it here in Omaha over the next couple of days. Uh, to answer the question, uh, policy and technology go hand in hand for that enabling IT integration. I see policy as a great way of uh, ensuring we're delivering the right outcomes uh, for our people. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, the ability to provide, uh, I suppose, systems that are by design, secure, interoperable and scalable. But also too, those resources that we're investing, we know we're going to get the right outcome, which is, which is absolutely vital to our warfighters. For a small nation like New Zealand, it's absolutely vital uh, that our policy is aligned organisationally, nationally and with alliances such as Five Eyes to ensure we are interoperable and able to integrate our IT and our systems to get that information seamlessly uh, to our people. I was mentioned earlier today by the General with uh, a policy or a, a framework that's been adopted by partners, and that's the, the NATO Federated Machine Network, or FMN as, it, as, it, as it's called, and the success of that, uh, helping drive ahead our interoperability with our partners, and there's some great examples given earlier this morning. Noting technology is rapidly advancing, uh, our policies need to keep up as well. And I think it's recognised that having adequate policy enables IT integration and therefore interoperability. Uh, if we get this right, uh, the policy right, which enables the technology, uh, we vastly improve our collective capability 
and therefore it's a force multiplier. So policy can never be forgotten uh, and we need to aid it with our technological advancement. Thank you, Bren. Eric. Um, thank you, sir. So Brigadier General Eric Vandenberg, great to be back at DOTUS. This is my third DOTUS. Um, and you know, I've seen it sort of gets better and better uh, every year, the, uh, the level of discussion. Um, the moderators, our moderators, amazing. Um, <laughs> He paid me for that. Um, but just uh, Noted. Noted. picking up on what Brendan said, I think if we think about policy and we think about um, technology, there is a, a natural friction there. Um, and I think we generally default to the fact that we think that policy inhibits um, our technological advances. But I think we can flip it around as well. There's a lot of legacy systems that we have that actually prevent us from having the policy that we need. Um, so it is very much a balancing act of um, where do we put policy in place and at what time. And I think if we think about uh, the work that we've done with Mars, it's really forced us um, to acknowledge the fact that policy's not an afterthought. Okay, we've come up with a great technological solution, now let's figure out how we make the policy work. Um, they have to work you know, side by side. As we're making advances in technology, we have to be developing the policy at that point. Um, and I think if, as we look to the future, um, when we get to that zero trust environment um, and we have you know, ICAM and ABAC uh, in place, it's really going to allow sort of the policy um, to step out uh, working in that environment to really give us what we need to be interoperable. Um, so I think that uh, it's really, I think it's, there is a friction, there is a natural friction, which is generally seen as a negative thing, but really I think we can flip that around. It, it is positive in the sense that, you know, technology forces policy to keep up, and we will soon be in a place where policy is going to force technology to keep up. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, sir, thanks for the question. And I might riff off Eric's point just here about policy driving um, technology and, and integration. So um, I'll start with a macro position. The Australian government recently announced its national defence strategy. Front and centre of that, our preeminent strategic priority is deterrence. And, an, and a subtext of that is integration. So it's consistent with the theme of this conference. Um, that's both an imprimatur and an impetus for us to build partnerships that are interoperable mm. and to be seen to be interoperable. And so when we start to consider deterrence, deterrence can be achieved through multiple vectors, um, development of credible military forces, as we talked about, building visible partnerships and alliances, which by default are interoperable, and also demonstrating a keen understanding of our operating environment or the battle space in which we might fight. And an example of where we've been able to overcome some of these, these challenges and use policy to drive things forward was with the, um, an initiative that was announced by Secretary Austin and our Deputy Prime Minister last year, which is the Combined Intelligence Centre Australia, which is a, it's a co-effort by the Defence Intelligence Agency of the United States and the Defence Intelligence Organisation of Australia, where it's a, a joint facility in Canberra working to co-produce rich insights into our operating environment um, so we can understand but also be seen to be building that partnership. Now implicit in that um, achievement of that high level policy goal from both of our countries was the need to overcome a series of policy um, challenges that at a more sort of organisational level, which we were able to overcome because of a clear eyed focus on the mission, the desired outcome, um, and a willingness of, of high level stakeholders across our organisation to really buy in to what we were doing. And I'm pleased to say that it's operating now and I'm sure we'll go from success to success. Hey, thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, I think the, the policy technical um, chicken and egg um, issue, if you will, uh, is one that we've been tackling for quite some time. Um, and one of the things that we often refer to back at the agency, and I know we've discussed this, is the mindset, the culture. If we get that right, the technical and policy, what we perceive as impediments, we can at least align ourselves to get after them. Um, and I think that is the driving force. I think your, your reference to the KICA, yep. as we say in Australia, or the KICA in the US, and in Canada it's the KICA. -A. Um, <laughs> it just is. Um, I think those are great examples, um, as well as the, Jack, you mentioned the Witten as the largest Five Eyes uh, SCIF 
think of SR Joic, and I think of those opportunities we've had um, downrange on, during coalition operations where we've been in a SCIF environment, where we've been able to quickly get after those technical and policy uh, challenges because we knew we had to. It was um, at risk of mission. So great, uh, great, uh, great discussion, gentlemen, uh, to kick off our panel. The world of IT, of Five Eyes IT integration is incredibly complex to navigate, particularly when viewed through the lens of having to not only work through our own unique national technical and policy environments, but also having to work alongside four other equally unique national environments to achieve a common Five Eye mission. As people who live this reality on a daily basis, can each of you provide some advice to the IT professionals here and watching online on how each of them can best contribute to the mission of IT integration? Jack, we'll start with you. Uh, thank you. Um, so I joined the Ministry of Defence in February this year. So this is my first ever time I've been to DODIS and indeed to Nebraska. So thank you very much for the, the warm welcome. Um, I was amazed at the complexity of the landscape that uh, encompasses Five Eyes IT. I mean, it really is breathtaking. Um, it's far too much for one person to hold in their head at any one time. Um, it's probably far too much for 10 people to hold in their heads. Um, and so what I think that means is we need all of, I need, we need all of your help sitting in the audience to help us streamline and simplify that environment. So that means when we're thinking about making new investments in products that are going to support the productivity or productivity of our analysts or give them new insights, we need you to help us make sure those products are based on open standards that we can share. They're based on architectures, reference architectures, like the ones that Dr. Merritt spoke about um, just now. And we need your help to, to join up for us. You know, we're not in the world anymore, I don't think, of being able to buy exquisite whole stack solutions um, from industry. Um, but that means we also need to come and talk to you more. Um, if I was saying this in the UK, I would say that we need to come out of the shadows from uh, defense intelligence and talk to industry more and be clear about our challenge, challenges with you, and be clear about how you can support us in, uh, in joining them up. So if anyone's sitting in the audience thinking, gosh, I've got just the idea for that, please, please, please do come and talk to me because I'm sure me and the rest of the panel will be delighted to hear the, the ideas for that. Okay, thanks, Jack. Brandon. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, as mentioned in the previous question with the common frameworks, helps to create some consistency and I think that's what's required that consistency and that'll unravel some of the complexity and hopefully reduce uniqueness across our nations. Uh, hopefully we, well, we are starting to see some of that clarity across the five eyes and maybe it's hopefully helping you to understand our objectives for their interoperability integration and essentially our north star. With regards to advice to the IT professionals, uh, firstly a huge thank you for what you do uh, you enable our militaries to be interoperable and perform and be successful in operations. So the first thing is, is thank you. Uh, thinking of advice uh, was really to look at promote, help us uh, understand uh, your value proposition. Help us understand the value you bring. Concentrate what you are, what you are good at. Uh, to do that, you might have to understand the ecosystem that you're the full ecosystem that you're operating in. I would encourage you to explore and leverage off others to go further and faster. Uh, be curious how others work as well. There's a lot to be learnt from each other. Being discussed heavily this morning, never lose sight of relationships. Uh, relationships are so important and with industry, it's a trusted relationship. The why has been mentioned several times this morning as well. Uh, understanding the big picture, the objective, I, I mentioned the North Star, what are we trying to achieve? Uh, so understand those customer requirements and the, in, the in outcome required. I'm probably hammering it pretty hard today, but build IT solutions based on common standards to ensure that integration and interoperability. Now this probably piece I uh, was thinking, it's probably putting a bit of tension to the traditional business model. Uh, and that's enabling data portability across systems, across networks, across applications. Working closer with competitors uh, for that sort of military capability to get that mission success. We're gonna be working with a number of suppliers uh, and a number of industries to assist us with that. The more we understand each other and can work together, we can get much better as a collective. 
Now, I couldn't help myself when I made some notes giving you some advice, but I think it's also too, how do we, such as the Five Eyes, assist you? And with the need to reproduce, release technology, solutions in a rapidly evolving environment, we need to remove barriers uh, in a time when resource uh, and finance is, is constrained, we need to make things go faster, go quicker. And I know it was, discussed, it was discussed last year at Portland, I got approached by several people saying, I'd love to hear it mentioned with regards to some of the antiquated processes uh, and techniques that the militaries may have. If they can get from a point from step one to step 10, only using two steps, instead of going through the whole process, and it's still using best practice and transparent, we can produce a better product faster, and that gets to our warfighter faster, that gives them that sort of information, that sort of decision-making edge. So I think there are th things we can do as well. Lastly, uh, and being a uh, military professional myself, often we, off we seek 100% solutions the whole time when an 80% solution would be adequate. And again, putting the warfighter at the center, if that adequate solution get them at a quicker time to give them that decision advantage, to be more successful in operations, we must do that. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. Eric. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I agree with what Jack and uh, Brendan has, have said. Um, so if I was to distill it down maybe to two points, um, I would say the first one is focus on adaptability. So we live and we operate in, very, in a very dynamic uh, operating environment. Things are always changing. Um, we seem to be pivoting quite a lot. Um, we need to find solutions quickly. Um, and so I guess the first piece would be, be adaptable. Um, don't be wed to the work you're doing, because um, we might have to ask you to, you know, to shift focus you know, on a moment to something different that has a higher priority. So first one, adaptability. And then the second one um, would be prioritize collaboration and communication, especially when we start thinking about the Five Eyes community. Um, it's vital um, that we are able to communicate. Um, so just a second ago, Major General Goulet made a joke about three different ways to say Kika. Um, but there are different ways that we say things within the Five Eyes. Um, lieutenant, Lieutenant, for example. We come from different backgrounds. We've gone through different education. We work in different environments. We have different policies. So getting or taking the opportunity to talk with your colleagues in the various nations to understand where they're coming from, making sure that, you know, when you say something that they understand what you've meant. Um, so putting a slight twist on an old adage, we are five nations separated by a common language. Um, just keep that in mind, you know, as you're working, as you're driving towards interoperability in the five eyes. And I guess maybe I'd add a third. And the third would be patience. Um, so have patience with, with us, the uh, senior leadership, as we sort of try to translate um, government direction into military and defense priorities. Um, and have patience with the fact that there are policy impediments, as we just, we've just talked about. There are things that are going to get in our way. Um, but at the end of the day, with stronger policy, uh, with your patience, your adaptability, and your communication skills, you know, we will get to mission success at the end. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. And Andy. So thank you. Um, so I guess the first thing I would offer is that conferences like this are powerful in focusing our attention on the mission. But very often in the day-to-day -day hustle and bustle of what we are doing, we can lose sight of the mission as we focus inwards on what we are trying to do in our individual projects or, or initiatives. And I would offer that um, keeping our mind's eye on the mission um, of IT supporting the warfighter, enabling that decision-making needs to be front of mind at all times. Um, and, and then focusing on how to get to yes as quickly as we can to build up on, on Eric's point. Um, integration has been a theme and the word trust has come up a couple of times. Trust is key to integration, but key to trust is understanding. And I think we in government um, and industry partners need to get better at explaining requirements to each other and explaining really complex technical things to senior decision makers who may have strong policy backgrounds or operational backgrounds and don't understand the benefits of the technology that you're bringing to bear. 
And so helping them understand what that is so they can go through the risk reward calculus is a really critical skill and I think something we need to strive to do um, continually better at. Um, policy has come up a couple of times today and I, I was thinking um, as I was listening to the, the really interesting presentation by um, Mr. Kosser actually about the potted history of innovation here in Omaha that um, most innovation or most truly disruptive technologies um, well, there are actually very few disruptive, truly disruptive technologies. Most disruption and innovation happens when people find new ways to use existing technologies. But those existing technologies often have policies written for them that don't keep pace with that innovation. So we don't approach it with, with the same mindset. What does that mean for all of you though? I would encourage you, if you come up against policy barriers, um, that you don't just stop there. If you see a really powerful technology or an innovation, challenge the policy settings because they may not have kept pace. And to go to my comment about being able to explain things in an understandable manner, make sure you push that up. I've seen changes in policy settings in the five eyes in the last two years that would have been unthinkable um, two years ago because the right people with the right ability to influence and understanding what that audience, their target audience needs to pick up on a point of an earlier presenter, were able to do is get policy settings changed and let those technologies flourish. Now, I'm not trying to, to make light of how difficult that is, but I would say that's a, that's a really important thing. So don't self-limit based on current policy settings or what you think those policy settings are. Be willing to challenge it. Um, and then the final thing I would just offer to take up on Eric's point about patience, um, it's, it's, a critical, it's a critical juggling act, balancing time. Um, there's an impetus to go forward, and we've heard about our strategic circumstances. We've heard about patience pushing forward too quickly with new technologies that people aren't ready for can just be as deleterious as not actually challenging the status quo in the first place. So um, I, I'm, I apologise, I forget who made the comment before about understanding target audiences, um, but, but I would foot stomp that point. Understand the people you're trying to influence, understand what matters to them, and then put it in a way that they can understand so their risk reward calculus um, is an easy one to make. Thank you, Andy. Austin. Yep, thanks, sir. So um, benefit of going last is I could get out easy because I, uh, I checked my notes and uh, everybody made my points for me. But um, <laughs> I, I won't do that. I'll, I'll take this a, a slightly different direction. So I, I wanted to touch Eric's point because it was, it was one of the points I was going to make. You know, the, I, I've, I've been very fortunate to spend a significant, in fact, the majority of my career uh, working within the Five Eyes Defense Alliance. And uh, one thing that you quickly come to learn is that we're all from English speaking nations, but the more you be around and, and, and work within the, the Five Eyes construct, the more you see the air quotes come around that English because of the different slang and, 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 and uh, idioms and everything. Um, but I would say that uh, my, my advice to, uh, to the folks here about what they can do is, is, is approach with noble intent. So what, what what I've seen in, in, in my time quite often is that, um, you know, people will approach a problem and stop at the first no. Um, and, and a lot of the times what people might not realize is that, yes, they said no, but it's because of this policy or it's because of this organizational thing. And so to Andy, to your point, you know, knowing who you're talking to, knowing what your target audience is and how to influence that. Um, you know, not necessarily not accepting no for an answer, but just approaching and trying to understand the problem and understand where somebody's coming from. Um, far too often, I think we've left, uh, you know, we've left some problems on the cutting room floor mm -hmm. uh, because we think that it's an insurmountable problem when in fact we just didn't have the right stakeholders in the room. And then the moment we got the right stakeholders in the room, it was just like a domino effect. And you know, three, four months later, we've achieved this massive success that we didn't even know was possible. So that, that, would, be, that would be my advice since, uh, the rest of my notes were, uh, oh, were thanks, touching Austin. on. I'm not going to repeat them. Oh, thank you, gentlemen. Um, a, a couple of key takeaways for myself. Um, you know, Jack mentioned streamlining, simplifying it, right? Um, having, having the professionals help us understand what it is we are trying to get at um, from a leadership perspective. Trust um, being adaptable because we understand that techno technology is evolving at such a rate. Um, trying to stay focused on one piece of technology today and not evolve from that uh, is uh, a fool's errand. 
Um, I did like the, the piece, if I can riff off the piece of the leadership and the patience. Um, I think if, if you look at the generational gaps, perhaps, I think the patience piece as well is having that time to be able to speak to leadership decision makers in terms of what is it that you want to do in terms of achieving effect in support of decision making or war fighting. What are you trying to get after? Help us better understand, better develop that problem, uh, understanding the problem space and then the solution space that, uh, that comes with that. Um, and I think that's to echo what General Henry said this morning about the why and the intent, right? Leadership, I think, owes it to um, their, their members to, to explain the why and the intent so that you can then circle back with us and help us better understand what it is we are trying to frame. Um, especially if you look at, again, technology, not all of us um, are from, you know, this, this ocean, right? This, this kettle of fish. I have a human background, Eddie has a human background, and there's diversity here. We don't always have the same understanding. Um, growing up, we had one, you know, one phone in the home plugged to the wall, and I was my father's TV remote. Um, things have changed, <laughs> things have evolved. Um, I think you probably all went through the same thing. Um, and lastly, I like the focus on mission and my key takeaway is that we either speak English or American. Is that correct? No. <laughs> I'll be outside after if you. <laughs> Perfect. Um, appreciate that. So to riff off the leadership piece, um, the next question really is how, you know, to the extent that you can in this forum, understanding we are at the unclass level, can, we, can you give examples of when perhaps information technology has been that critical factor in deciding mission success or outcome or where leadership has privileged and supported, enabled, whether it was the six function, the CIOs, the IT um, uh, you know, piece to ensure mission success. It's often something that is perhaps at the leadership level, perhaps not thought of. It's something in the background, it's running well. We don't think about IT information technology until it goes sideways. Um, so perhaps an example or two where it's been brought to the fore um, and it's been leveraged um, by leadership properly. Brandon, we'll start with you. Uh, thank you, sir. Before I dive into a couple of examples, uh, you mentioned with regards to understanding what the CIOs and IT professionals uh, undertake. And I think that's really important. Uh, again, with the IT professionals, the CIOs, enabling all five domains across that information environment, again, discussed earlier this morning. Uh, the more we understand that, uh, the more we can change different ways of working uh, and also be successful in operations. Uh, a couple of examples that I can share uh, to a limited capacity. Uh, one was regards an urgent, urgent need for large data files to be transferred. It wasn't, the integration wasn't there, and that's the main reason we're here, here over the next few days for that data integration between uh, multiple nations. I suppose the example I have was a ability and permission space for an innovative solution to be developed using open source technology, training, and tools to enable this integration piece uh, for, for large data transfer. To, you know, to I suppose the necessity was it was time, time related to exploit that information at the speed of relevance. Uh, it was so successful that it was later harnessed, uh, hardened somewhat, and now it's used by other nations. I, I can't provide any more detail on that, but just the ability to use that open source rapidly to, to um, undertake a problem to be successful in operations. Another is the ability to utilize technology at the edge. It's so important. And it's been mentioned many times by the panel already today, the warfighter is at the centre, uh, particularly for search and rescue operations in an area like New Zealand, which has a large search and rescue area. Uh, the ability to take uh, large amounts of data and turn it into vital information to keep in, uh, queue and tip uh, an aircraft or a platform to certain areas, which can be a lifesaver. So. Thank you, Brandon. Eric. Thank you, sir. So I was talking with my director of uh, Intelligence Enterprise Services about a similar topic uh, the other day, and I'm like, where does, like, giving the example of technology and, you know, where, um, you know, we can highlight it, it, its importance. And he looked at me and he sort of said, you wouldn't ask me how to use this, like when, when the steering wheel of your car was really helpful in you driving to work. So like, don't ask me when technology sort of, you know, enabled your missing success, because the answer is always. Like everything we do is enabled by technology. Um, and normally, and when it's done properly, it's transparent to the user. 
It's seamlessly operating in the background. And so like what has enabled mission success? Well, it's policies such as IDAM, so identity management access. Um, and you know, and, and ABEC. It's these things in the background that allow us to do the work that we do. So if we think about PKI, so identity management. Um, so as a policy, it was originally set up so that we could, I, we could share digital identities for access management. Um, but it's now used for so much more, because once you have that technology, it now allows us to access internal services and external services. And so in the background to the average user, they just know they have to log into their PKI. They, don't, they wouldn't say, well, that was a great piece of technology that enabled me to have mission success. But without it, we wouldn't have interoperability, we wouldn't be able to access external services, and therefore we wouldn't have mission success at the speed that we need today. So really when we think about uh, that, it's really that piece that I would uh, um, wanna highlight because if we think about it, um, without getting into, you know, delving into like really classified examples of some really exquisite bespoke um, tool or service that was created, it's really all technology enables mission success. And so that's where I'll leave it as I uh, pass over to uh, Andy. Hey, thanks Eric, thanks sir. Um, I might take a slightly different tack on this. Um, a lot of the discussion today has been about war fighting and I mentioned just a moment ago and we've talked about strategic circumstances and what have you. But um, one of the other elements of national defence, certainly from, from an Australian standpoint, is dealing with natural disasters. Um, and, and the example that springs to mind are the bushfires of 2019-2020, uh, and I'm sure many of you would have seen that on the news media. Um, certainly living through it, it felt like the entire country was on fire, and Australia was certainly the hottest country in the world there for a little bit. Um, we're, we're used to it, but that was an unprecedented um, a catastrophe, catastrophe for our nation. Um, the Australian Defence Force, along with local, state, federal, first responders, fire departments and so forth, put in a mammoth effort to, to fight that, that um, natural disaster. But what wasn't apparent but was critical was the work done behind the scenes by, by Defence IT and IC um, IT professionals. And in many regards, they were the unsung heroes of what we did there. Um, that's not to diminish the people who are out in the front lines, but it is to say that, that the IT people behind the scenes who actually built a functioning COP at short notice and sustained that, tying together data feeds from the IC into uh, those local community agencies they'd never normally deal with, or vice versa, ingesting that information in to make a rich picture for the most senior levels of government to make decisions on, was a powerful example of, of IT really slewing onto a problem and getting it done. And um, you know, there was a whole range of policy settings that that challenged, but, but even more fundamentally, local, state, federal agencies using a whole suite of different um, IT systems, different ages, different form factors. Um, it was a mammoth effort behind the scenes. And um, you know, to, to your point or your question, sir, about the, um, the behind the scenes, I can't say that it made the definitive edge, but it certainly made life a lot easier um, in fighting that fire, so. Thank you, Andy. Austin. Yep. yep. So um, it's yeah, it, it, it's it's pretty difficult to to uh, name specifics, but going off of what um, what Eric said, you know, if you if you look at um, you know the history of of the Five Eyes Alliance all the way up to today, and then looking forward into the future, technology really is underpinning everything that we do. Um, the first thing that happens in a crisis usually is we try to get communication with our closest partners and it's usually the agencies represented here on this stage that we talk to. Um, you know, it, it, it underpins, it's, it's, it's step zero, it's not even step one and, and for the computer scientists in the room you'll, you'll like that, uh, that reference. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's tough to, to, to call out any specific thing, uh, at least from my experience in, in this forum, but, but that's, that's my, my input would be that, you know, it's, it's, it's the first thing that we do at the start of a crisis, it's the last thing that we stop at the end of a crisis. And it is the foundation upon which we build whatever response or we monitor whatever situation that occurs, regardless of where it is in the world. Thanks, Austin. Jack. Uh, so I'll offer two 
uh, little stories from my nine months in DI. The first one is about our most read product. So if you look on Twitter or X and go to at Defence HQ, Defence with a C, we spell it with a C, not an S, um, HQ, <laughs> you'll see um, our daily tweet about the war in Ukraine. So we publish uh, assessment um, that's had over a billion views from the public every day about the war in Ukraine. But the provenance chain behind that is obviously a lot more complicated, and I'm not able to go into that here. But actually being able to move our IT professionals from thinking about just this as a classified problem to one that actually where we need to engage uh, with the public and across government has been, um, has been really in transformational for us. We've had questions about what does your assessment probability yardstick actually mean and start to get people thinking about the work and the impact um, that we have. Uh, and the second one is um, I'd been this was over the summer. I, I sit on the eighth floor in the Ministry of Defence in Whitehall. So I was having my cup of tea in the morning. I was looking out uh, over the river and uh, into my office came a very cross analyst. Uh, and she said to me, I want to complain about the new intelligence exchange app that you implemented last week. So we put a new system in to, um, to, to share end product reporting, both from our Five Eyes partners and from the UK intelligence community. And she said, I want to complain. I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What's, what's happened? She said, I got too much intelligence over the weekend. <laughs> I've got a thousand reports to read and I don't know what to do. Um, and uh, I take that as a bit of a badge of pride, actually, that we've been able to produce <laughs> analysts too much intelligence. Um, but actually, we've, we've then been able to take strides to uh, allow us to machine consume, sift and filter that intelligence. And that's allowed us to produce new insight and new products um, much more quickly. And we couldn't have done that uh, both without um, our professionals across the UK intelligence community and UK MOD, but also with taking a tiny bit of risk. We implemented that without training people, hence I got a complaint. Um, but we implemented it because we thought it was the right thing to do. And we've seen the impact with senior decision makers um, from doing that. Thanks, Jack. And gentlemen, thank you for those comments and insights. Um, now over to the magic wand question, or if you were king for a day, um, what is the one thing you would do to enable IT integration across the five eyes? Eric, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think if I had a magic wand, the one thing I would do would be to create a unified, sovereign, agnostic, ag agnostic cloud environment. Um, so a cloud environment where all of the five eyes can develop, can operate, um, can do their compute, can store data. And on the topic of data, every piece of data in this cloud environment would be properly tagged so that it could be accessed by... <laughs> 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 See, Lori paid me for that one. Um, <laughs> um, and if I had this magic wand, not only would this cloud be a top secret cloud, but it would be classification agnostic as well. Because the data is all tagged, because all of my users all have the correct digital identities, I can store all the data in the cloud. Everyone can access what they're allowed to access, when they're allowed to access it. It would enable interoperability. It would enable the development of new tools. Um, and it would give us you know, a platform that would be that one thing that I could then give an answer to the last question and say, this was the piece of technology that enabled mission success. So if I had the magic wand, that would be it. A nation agnostic cloud environment that allowed us to share an interoperable and still would have sovereign cloud capability within this cloud. We, so we would all still be able to, to store our sovereign data as well as operate as a uh, true five eyes uh, in that environment. So there we go. Thanks, Eric. Andy. Uh, sir, I am maybe not as ambitious as Eric in that regard. <laughs> but um, I think if I, was, if I was to have the magic wand, I would have a design principle across the five countries that made um, Five Eyes Integration, a foundational design principle of everything that we do. Um, and if I was allowed to wave that wand a second time, I would also ask that uh, policy kept pace with technological advancement. But those are the two things that I would, I would hope for from that magic wand waving. Perfect. Thanks, Andy. 
Austin. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, if I had the the magic wand for a day, um, and I'm going to shamelessly score more points with Lori and Mac, and say that uh, <laughs> it would be um, it, it would be that the the fine grain tagging of data throughout the entirety of the, the Five Eyes Defense and National Intelligence Enterprise. I think that's where um, you know, we've made great strides um, in, in, you know, in recent time, and there's a lot more work to do. Um, but I see that, and then if I could go off of what Andy said and wave it a second time, uh, the second time would be um, related to what, uh, what Eric touched on was identity um, and, uh, and, and identity attribute services. Okay. Jack. So I wrote down almost word for word um, what Eric said. So, uh, <laughs> so I'd love that, but I'm not going to use my go up on that because Eric, we've already got that from Eric. Um, so if I wave my magic wand, what I would love us to do is to reduce almost to zero the unnecessary bureaucracy, process, um, things that are just holding us back, that are adding very little value either to our security or to our intelligence mission. But because they've been there for so long, we've just got really, really comfortable with them. So um, I'll probably stick with the, uh, the, the theme of consistency and communication. Uh, one source of the truth uh, with regards to how we build and integrate. <clears throat> Uh, we all know even as a small nation, we see programs of work and they drift off to internal needs, uh, bespoke requirements, and therefore we can lose that ability to integrate. So if I had the magic wand, it would be the ability to, leveraging off what's already been discussed by my four learned panel members, uh, to rationalise our infrastructure. Uh, so we think we reduced overheads, sustained overheads, and therefore put greater efforts and focus onto tradecraft and uh, dissents making excellence to, to enable our warfighters uh, and strategic headquarters uh, to get that advantage, uh, the decision advantage. Okay. Thank you. Uh, understanding that these gentlemen are, are living this on a daily basis and uh, we've worked together on, on many things, notably Mars. Um, I think what you're hearing is those key challenges or views that we often come across in terms of why don't we just do this um, from a Five Eyes perspective. Understanding there's many reasons and complexities uh, and layers that we need to navigate, um, but I think what you're hearing here is the, some of the solution space um, that we think we need to get after. So thank you very much for the insights uh, on that piece. Um, mindful of time, what I'd like to do here is a bit of a pivot, um, and I, I have not offered this question in advance to, uh, to the panel here. Um, but I think what I think is, is really useful is to hear from our partners, Austin as well. Um, you know, <laughs> specifically US leadership, those that are making those decisions in terms of what is it that you would like to share with that US audience in terms of approaching the Five Eyes, the partners, how to better integrate or perhaps how to better um, align what we're trying to get at. Um, so I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to Andy if you have any thoughts that you'd like to share with, with, the, uh, with the U.S. audience. Um, I guess understanding, understanding our requirements and what we can contribute into the partnership from the outset is a really powerful thing. Um, we will go to great lengths to... Um, integrate into the US system um, as well as the five eyes. But in doing so, we often incur um, risk by, through latency, because we will always be playing catch up as we understand what your requirements are. Um, if you understand our needs and requirements early, that will allow us to be the most productive partner we can for the US, but also for the wider five eyes. And so um, that would be the one thing I'd, I'd offer out as, a, um, as an initial thought. Okay, thanks Andy. Austin. So, yeah. M mindful that your career could be on the line here. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm the, the, the fifth wheel, I'm the American. So uh, I, I, think, I think what I would offer um, is something that was offered at, uh, at, the, at the panel last year that, um, that kind of resonated with me a little bit. And that's, um, you know, Approach every problem that we do that we have, you know that we're faced with with five eye partner interoperability in mind. Um, I think Doug said it a few years back that um, you know interoperability costs minimal at the start, 
and then it's exponentially large the further along in a product that you get. Um, so starting it at the beginning mm -hmm. is a cheap way to ensure that our closest partners and the people that we are going to be side by side with marching into whatever crisis, uh, you know, from competition to crisis to conflict, uh, to making sure that they're in lockstep with us and have the same access and can see everything that they need to see to help us be um, the, uh, the formidable force that, that we are as an alliance. Thank you, Austin. Jack. I think for me, it's about getting to the place of really rich and deep data interoperability amongst us. And so that means being really serious about data tagging, data standards, attribute-based access controls, zero trust architecture, all the things we've been talking about this morning, uh, this afternoon, sorry. Um, but also being clear from the US side where there are degrees of freedom and where there aren't, where there's a great product that you have that you just really love us to implement, um, please just tell us. Um, sometimes it's really handy to have that steer, um, particularly when we're making our own um, investment decisions. And also there is some benefits of being smaller, um, sometimes more agile, sometimes more able to take risk in different areas. And so we should think amongst the five of us how we're able to leverage both our national perspectives to be able to maximize the benefit of being able to do that. Thank you, Jack. Brandon. Uh, I, I'd just say, look, keep bringing us on the journey. The journey's been mentioned several times today too. Uh, look, I, in, a, in a previous role, and in, in CJC2 was mentioned uh, earlier today, uh, and they brought the, the Five Eyes in very early with CJC2 that helps us set that path, navigate that sort of program decision-making uh, finance allocation. So that's something I, I would stress. The other one is probably leveraging off some of the comments that have already been made. Tell us what you'd like us to do, uh, particularly as a smaller nation and uh, much smaller than the UK. Uh, that agility, we should be able to use that agility more. Uh, how can you harness some of the strengths we bring as, as, as a smaller nation? Um, that's, it, so we can bring that, that added value to, to, to the US. Thank you, Brandon. And Eric. Yeah, I think, um, so I think Canada's naturally a contribution warf warfare is the way we approach things. We'll always be part of a coalition. Um, we'll, you know, whether or not it's NATO or co coalition of the willing, or if, you know, it's in, uh, in NORAD. So I think what I would state would be, or what I would ask is, be honest with us about what your gaps are. If there are things where there are gaps in your capabilities, and that's gonna be a hard conversation obviously to have, but if we're gonna put a limited investment into something, I'd rather put an investment in something that is a gap for you, therefore we can contribute to the coalition, as opposed to duplicating something that you already do. Um, so let's make the Five Eyes function in a way that we can fill each other's gaps uh, to move forward um, and make the most out of the, uh, you know, the defense budgets that we have. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Um, mindful of time, we are close to five minutes. Um, I just want to offer perhaps some uh, closing remarks, if you will, or some key takeaways that I, at least I've noted or that I've come to experience as my time uh, as DDCI in the last six months with the agency. Uh, and then perhaps we'll have time for a question or two from the floor. Um, and, and I'll echo and riff off some of the points, gents, that you've raised. Uh, for the partners, I would offer that it is a way of life. Partner integration uh, is a way of life. Uh, it's, it's second nature, it's innate. Um, wh whereas sometimes with the US enterprise, given your, your scale and scope, um, it's not necessarily a way of life upfront. Um, that said, I just want to offer that as, as thought. Um, ask of the partners what you want from them. The partners will leverage the USIC and DOD as much as it can. Please ask the partners what they can contribute um, to your efforts and initiative. To the point of coalition warfare, it is a reality. Um, you can look at all recent conflict and dating back to First World War and perhaps even beyond, maybe not the War of 1812, um, but we, we, co coalition warfare is a reality. We will be downrange, side by side, shoulder to shoulder. How do we remain interoperable? How do we baseline the way we fight downrange the way, to the way we do business today? How do we, how do we achieve that? Um, reminder of how, how do we strive to become integrated upfront? It was mentioned earlier, uh, one of the panel members, I forget who exactly, but mentioned, integrate the partners upfront, not after the fact. Uh, I, I strongly advise um, for that kind of approach. Um, one of the things that was also raised was the right to release, right to release, right to release. I would, 
I would also offer, and this becomes a bit more challenging, the collect to release. If we can collect to release, the right to release becomes a lot easier uh, on, on behalf of everybody. Um, and finally, I think I just want to, to say that uh, before we end here, uh, I just want to thank, thank the panelists for uh, your insights, your commitment to the mission. Um, many of you have flown from a place far, far away. Um, and I do, I do appreciate your time and effort and your, your willingness to share with, um, with us today uh, in terms of what it is that we need to do as allies. Uh, I think we are the closest of friends um, and I think we need to continue to privilege that uh, and work towards that because as I mentioned, I think we will be uh, side by side uh, tonight or tomorrow during crisis or conflict. Um, and I'd also like to, all kidding aside, uh, I absolutely love my time at DIA, um, and it's a real privilege to be DDCI and serve within the agency, to serve within the USIC, uh, and, and to, be, uh, to be amongst you. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity, um, and it's fantastic um, through and through. So please join me in thanking our panelists. Many are still jet lagged. We were fearful that perhaps the comfort of the chairs might be, uh, might be detrimental. Um, we do have two, two minutes and 35 seconds. If anybody would have a question, uh, please feel free to, uh, to ask the question. So first of all, I just want to say, um, can we give a big hand of applause to our panelists here? These are our board. <laughs> best to the partnership as we go forward, whether that's space or policy help or analytical or sensor or whatever it might be, where do they think they can best help this partnership? John, Brandon. Sir, um, look, I probably mentioned the, the scale of uh, my Defence Force, New Zealand Defence Force. Uh, there's one area like we don't have a lot of depth in a lot of areas, but we have a lot of breadth. So one area I think we can assist with is cohesion across the five. Thank you, Brandon. Anybody else? Eric. Um, not a technological answer, but I think the one place where we've realized we need to step up or we can contribute is in the Arctic. Hmm. Um, and so I think as we sort of move out on that, I think there are benefits um, for a number of our nations and then lessons to be learned when we look at the uh, southern region. So I think there's an area where uh, Canada can definitely uh, contribute to the Five Eyes moving forward. Yeah, I think um, we have some very unique defence industry contributions we can make. Um, our geography, our place in the world, our um, available resource means that we have to look at asymmetric ways of doing things and that really drives some cutting edge tech innovation that might not be immediately apparent to the big systems where big industry deals. So I think we've got some real contributions we can make there. Uh, so I think we should continue the burden sharing we're already doing on uh, particularly in our geo-intelligence mission um, for the European theatre for the war in Ukraine and other places. Austin, you're good. Fantastic. Just remember, they are a force multiplier to everything you do in terms of placement and access, capabilities and authorities, uh, integrated deterrence. Uh, I think we are much stronger. And uh, thank you again, gentlemen. Uh, it's been a fantastic a panel. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Major General Goulet and our entire panel. Uh, it was a great uh, way to close out the first day of our speaking sessions. Uh, as a reminder, we have an exciting lineup of events in the exhibit hall, uh, as well as our first batch of breakout sessions.